Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Fume, a wonderful alternative to going cold turkey. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com, that's T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, and use the code SACRED, that's S-A-C-R-E-D, to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's tryfume.com with the checkout code SACRED to save an additional 10% off your order today. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode number 283. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my son, the lavender sweatshirt wearing Chris Reagan. Chris, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you today? I'm well. 283 episodes? Jesus. Yeah. Jesus Christ. He yeah. ain't here right now. Just uh, saying. Well, maybe this time. I don't know. Day, but. No, no. You know what I'm thinking? Because like I turned 30 and like on Monday, you know what I mean? So like now I'm just like hearing like, oh, 283 episodes. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> Pet time is like accelerating now and I'm feeling mm-hmm. it. It's I weird. was just thinking that your birthday was coming up. What is it? December the 4th. 4th, right. Mm hmm. Oh, we'll man. Oh, yeah. Today we're recording this on the last day of November. So <sighs> that's exciting. And you're turning 30. You were both born in 1993, right? Right. That's so incredible. Yeah. That's just so incredible to me. I don't know. I mean, it's just such an old person <laughs> thing where it's like, wow. I, I, it's weird to be friends with like peers. I don't really consider you guys younger than me. You might consider your, me older than you when you think of me, but I don't really consider you anything. I don't know. It's very IGN like where we kind of people in their 20s and people in their 40s. And it's just like, I don't know. But yeah, it's always strange to me knowing. So ha- knowing a peer, but being like, I have memories of actual events before you were born. And I feel like we all should have just came in together and left together. Just go out together. Mm. Like Thelma and Louise. (laughs) We still have time to at least do half of that. Yeah, that's true. We can go out together if you want. We should we should drive off a cliff like Thelma and Louise. Three three way hand holding, though. And I don't drive. So you guys, I'll Uh be in the backseat. Right. right. I don't think it matters in this situation. So you can (laughs) jump out in the last minute. Yeah, and roll out. (laughs) (laughs) Got him. (laughs) I was thinking about. The idea, though, the 283 episodes, I think that I've now done this show, m- more episodes of this show than Podcast Beyond, pretty sure, because I wasn't on Podcast Beyond in the beginning. I joined in the double digits, like late double digits. So and I le- I think we left three twenty four or something like that. So I think I might have actually done this. So now I'm Colin Moriarty of Sacred Symbols, previously of Podcast Beyond, where that's not the thing people might know me the most for, although that's probably wishful thinking. Dustin Furman. Executive producer, welcome to the show, my friend. Greetings. I, uh, Chris, I got to mention this. There's this, this clip you put on your Instagram reel. I saw last night. I was uh, I look, I'm looking at my phone in the bathroom as I do. And I saw this clip where there's this kid on a zip line. <laughs> I wish I wonder if I can find the clip and put it in the show. I, I have it saved. I can send it to you. There's OK. Uh, just there's no context. This kid is flying and he's like going left to right. You just hear him go, help. And he slams against the side of this thing. And dude, I was like belly laughing alone uh, dude, in the bathroom, you know, half I'll, derobed. I'll send it to you. It is. It, it. I saw it and I was like, I I have to share this with everybody that I know. And with, I don't I need any like context. It. Yeah, it's yep. it's really it's really it's just this poor child who's just on your YouTube. I don't or Instagram reel. Is that what? It yeah, yeah I'll, I'll send I think the it's video. gone now, though. Oh. Yeah, it's gone. Now. I'll send you the video directly, but it's <laughs> yeah, maybe we can have just call and watch it. You got to watch looking, it with sound, though, because I, I watch lo- it. I, I, these are the first stories I've watched in so long. And yeah, I don't see it in there. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not there no more. Hold on. Yeah, it, it well, might the, take me. It might take me some time to find it. Yeah, yeah, no, go, oh, go, go on, go on. But uh, oh you ever yeah, see I'm, the videos, though, Dustin, where maybe this is one of those videos where it's like you're dead, right? Oh, like, yeah. Like at the end of it, because you always see in the Twitter, I see all sorts of gruesome shit online. I'm not talking about mm-hmm. live leak stuff. That's totally different. And there's that a place for that, of course. But the the, you know, gratuitous violence. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone just straight up dying on video, like oh, yeah, smashing into a tree when they're skiing or something. And, and then it ends. And it's like, so that guy's dead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or when you see like a, a plane 
really flying low at like an air show and then it crashes like so that guy's di- that guy died right we we're just yeah, watching that video you're speaking sweeney's language right now because this is, this is the shit that he used to wake up to it's like hey look at this guy falling out of the sky and i'm like i don't want to see this I just yeah that's up. what i'm saying is like yeah. i want there to be a rule where i only want to see the video if the person survived right yeah if i want to go see daniel heads daniel um daniel pearl's beheading video on live leak that's a different thing i go and look for that but i sure. don't want to be seeing that kind of death and destruction on my regular feeds you know yeah right. i saw a video on twitter the other day that was said two helicopters colliding and the viewpoint of the person filming was inside of one of the helicopters. And you can see the one person like the moment he realizes there's a helicopter headed towards them. And uh, not a pretty sight. OK, Colin has the video now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, <laughs> That's good shit. Love I it. listened to it first when help. I first saw it, it. It was funny without the audio, but like the the, the quiet little help <laughs> right before as he's swinging around, dude. He the help and, and the loud yeah. slam just really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's fun. I like it. It's good shit. I feel like every other week I'm on I'm on the internet scrolling through the for you feed, and it's like someone hanging off a fucking merry mm. merry go round or or, or or Ferris wheel rather, and like you know, or like some tragic Jesus. What is going on now, here? Like in sad, complete fucking chicanery. Again, by the way, I, I want to recommend Texas Street Fights. If you got, if you want to see the great street fights, there's a guy in Austin, Texas, who I have no idea how he does it. I'm straight, it's straight up in 4K. It's like the most insane street fight videos you've ever seen. He's just in the right place at the right time all of the time. And for some reason, on, in Austin, on what is it, like Sixth Street or something, there's just always shit going on there shit going down go check it out texas street uh, he's ca- yep ca- call an important update i've been watching a few videos of a predator hunter i talked Who? to with this uh, uh with genius uh skeeter oh skeeter the, the, so he's the guy that like plays the character kind of he's like yeah, the handsome he, black gentleman and he wears like a suit right and uh, there's, yeah dude there's this one where he they lure the predator in and the the girl the the bait girl or whatever her name is she's like oh come over and play mortal Kombat with me oh and then what he does is he's, you know, they, they catch him. They do like 45 minutes back and forth where he's trying to talk out of it and stuff. He's like, well, how about this? Uh, if you can beat me in Mortal Kombat, I won't call the cops. <laughs> and so uh, there's this this guy. He's like fighting for his life, yes. trying to play Mortal Kombat. And he like he purposely loses the first round to give him hope. <laughs> Dude, that fucking rules. Love that. Yeah, it's a it was very, very good. I am. Um... That's yeah, insane. I like that guy. I, I like him because he is often self-deprecating too. like he films it very much like it's to catch a predator. It's actually quite professional. I like yeah. the more renegade dudes. My favorite were, were Colorado Pet Patrol and they got kicked off of YouTube. And I don't Damn. really know exactly what happened with them, but they were the fucking best because Gene and I agreed they were the funniest because they would make the guy call their wives or their mm-hmm. girlfriends. And it was so dude, it is so good. That's yeah. the shit right there there's another one where it's a girl doing it i can't remember her name she's got like a real new york accent she just goes at these dudes it's crazy if you go on on and gene and i talk about this as well if you go on rumble you can find some crazier ones where like the dudes like get roughed up a little bit there Mm -hmm. was one where there was one where uh which i don't really support but it happens like there was one where a guy fought another guy in like a walmart and there was one where these guys took the dude's keys and just threw them on a roof of like a huge of a big building so he couldn't leave Damn. That's great. Cre- 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 so like you shouldn't be maybe <laughs> talking to 10 year olds online and these things wouldn't happen to you, but right. Or who you think are 10 year olds or 12 year olds or whatever. But yeah, Colorado Pet Patrol was the best. They went away. And then there's the other guy. I fight for kids. Who's like the really um, heavy set guy. I don't know if you've seen him. I haven't seen and that one. He is a brilliant because what he does is and his name's Gordon Flowers. People might know him. Mm. Um he basically lulls them into false senses of security. So like his game is like, I understand I'm not really here for you. I know this is probably some trauma that's playing out through you. And he gets them to say fucking everything. This that is the dude. If you have the patience to be like, wow, these guys watch them destroy themselves on camera about all the shit they're looking at, all the people they're talking to, all the things they've done in their past, how long they've been doing it, because all he says, like, I'm not here to judge you. I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm trying to go after someone else. And and there's nails them at the end. It's good shit. Colin, your uh, your Pet Patrol boys, it sounds like they're going to be posting on Rumble. Uh, so I don't think they're closing up shop. Oh, good. Those guys are great. I mean, I, it's weird why they wouldn't be on. They don't. They're actually kind of nice. I remember actually when they used to start, 
their hands would be shaking and shit. They'd be like so scared. And you saw like over time mm-hmm. they became more confident, but I never saw them like put their hands on anywhere or get violent or anything like that. And I sure. think, I think these things can only happen in one party States. In other words, places where you only need the, the you know, one person's permission to film. So there's just certain places it can't happen. Um, but yeah, man, what's crazy to me about this stuff, and this is, I don't know, Lee, because this is not what this is about, obviously, although I highly recommend this stuff because it's mega entertaining, is how many times are these people going to get caught before they get it, that people are out there trying to bait them? How many times is this going to happen? There are people just like on, I mean, it first happened on the Catch a Predator, but I've seen people where they've gotten caught multiple times. Ugh. It's like, dude, are you serious? It's wild. You know? I, I, it's, well, you're talking about an extreme mental illness so it's one of those things where these people are sick so it makes sense that they would not get it uh if they haven't been i don't know this gets into a much deeper conversation about like can you uh, how do you rehabilitate a pedophile can you in some cases probably sometimes you can probably sometimes you can't you know man yeah so, yeah i i tough um welcome to sacred civil <laughs> <laughs> can you come here real quick <laughs> uh yeah well no i was I, i'm getting micah because i wanted her to do a voice impression for me uh oh, no. to end what i'm what i'm doing but um no I, it doesn't have anything to do with the show of course but it is <laughs> I, I, stand by i'm gonna need you to say something for me in just a moment um rehabilitating these guys right i think they should go to prison and what happens to them when they go to prison micah oh what they're gonna be developed the ball <laughs> <laughs> thank you my dear <laughs> that was worth it <laughs> very good she, oh, she always says that like like I, that's one of my favorite things that she says you know oh you're gonna be the bell of the ball you know like some fucking <laughs> and I'm like oh man that's where those guys need to go yeah yeah we'll taste her absolutely all right welcome to sacred symbols <laughs> A PlayStation podcast. This is uh, episode 283, like we said, and we're glad to hear, be here with you today. The show somehow started in the summer of, ni- of uh, 19, summer of 2018, and it's still going. <laughs> 1930. 1930. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You see? Go. Long going. Uh, we go up live each and every week. You can get us three days early and ad free over on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Last Stand Media. We're at an all time high right now. Let's see. 13,382 paid subscribers right now. We appreciate you guys. That's really amazing. And we couldn't do without you. So um, thank you for that. $5 a month is our most popular tier. That gets you early ad free access to every episode of this show and all of our other shows as well. So that's many shows a week, including Sacred Symbols Plus twice a week. We just did a cool conversation. Me, Gene Park and Sandeep Rai. We were talking about Sandeep might be one of the, if not the person who's been on the show outside of our family, like our family of LSM people the most. And he came on to talk about PlayStation Portal, and we had a really great conversation, hour plus conversation about that. I'm going to do something about GTA history with um, hopefully my friend 616, who's been on the show a couple times already, because uh, we, we did the, we, he and I did the GTA 3 wrap up because there's we're going to talk about Agent, the PS3 game Agent later that was never happened. I don't know if you guys saw it. There was a guy from Rockstar North that posted this amazing blog that Rockstar asked him to take down. But of course, the Internet is forever. And so. I went and read it and I was making notes for this show. And then I'm like, this is I have more than a page of notes typed. And I'm like, this is obviously not even really appropriate for this show. So we're going to do that soon. Dustin, you sat down with Jimmy Champagne to do a mm-hmm. horror episode. And Gene. Oh, and we Gene was Gene too, in there right? too. Yeah. Gene's starting to really bubble up, isn't he? I mean, yeah. he's all he's all up in all up in the LSM guts. <laughs> he's a <laughs> he's a bubbler. <laughs> he's doing great. He's very welcome with us. And then uh, let's see uh, the good Charlotte episode with Billy Martin. That's live. That's live now for everyone. And Alan Wake 2 happens soon. You'll do that next week. We're also going to have to do so. We have to wait for Avatar to come out. But once that comes out, the game, then we will be able to do the fantasy critic stuff that we need to do for the end of the year. That will be a Sacred Symbols Plus episode. We'll do all of our traditional stuff. I'm a little annoyed because there's a piece of art going around that, you know, tracks our scores. And there's like some chicanery. I've already used that word once today, but going on with that as well where one of my delayed games comes in as red and in, in like you know like it where and i'm like mm, you're no, making it, it look a, you're making it look a little worse than let's bring this, this up yeah go ahead because do you have do you have more than two delayed games um probably i don't know so that means that the third game would count as a zero but why would that but why why already counted that way we're not done and none of the other delayed games are red oh because no, two the, of them are two of them are are gray 
and one of them is red. Nah, I don't like that. So you're what's and it, the what's other one is crime is, boss. Yeah, it's rough. So you deserve that. So red. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to absorb a zero and a forty one. Dude, I'm about to eat one, two. Well, I'm about to one, two, three. I've got four delayed games on my list. So, so you're I'm gonna, gonna have to take two, two zeros. Yeah. yeah, that's worse for you than it is for me. Chris is gonna win. Yeah, uh, I think at this point, which is crazy because he had the. Well, if you don't include the delayed games, he had the worst average. He's at an eighty. I'm trying oh, no, to find no, no. it. Actually, Colin, you have the worst average currently. Where do you? Well, that would make sense. Crime boss totally tanked me. Um, uh, hold on, Chris. I'll send it to you in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is from our friend Hodge, who's been putting together this list. Oh this, yeah. Uh, this image, and I'm about to be fucked very soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because yeah like mean of the hollower is not coming D- no. stellar blade not coming no. See, that's why is that tbd we know that that's not coming this year i feel uh, like he's, do, I feel like he's of, trying to officially right now i feel like hodge is trying to flex the score a little bit to, it's not the outcome that's going to be different it's just to the 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 optics of it he has oh, not here's a few red ones for colin here's like all these things he now we'll do it a little bit different for dustin we'll do it a little bit different for i get it you stellar know? blade has not officially been delayed until uh news that happened that we're going to talk about actually still never they never came out and said it's delayed that's true whereas the your red here with pragmata has officially they said hey yeah chris is definitely going to win um yeah 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 like he's already won now that's the only question red. is will you come in second or me and i'm not entirely sure because if you're absorbing two zeros right. that's a pretty big body blow remember it doesn't that bring you back to school where you you know you Maybe you guys were too, you know, they would write the little scores in their in their little books, the teachers, and then you'd get mm. a zero and but you'd have to absorb that into your score right. and it would fuck everything up. Yeah, that's you. Yeah, I really will come down to is my average that's higher than yours good enough to combat your 41 of crime boss, which is. That's just know. brutal. I mean, I could have I could have chosen hundreds of games that would have been higher scored than that but i i really we didn't really know much about it and i got the vibe when remember we have to remember when we chose these not that i'm trying to defend it really i don't really care that much but it seemed like one of those games that was going to be popular because it had all these zany people in it you know right Um, right yeah and so i was like oh people are gonna love this thing but i didn't i still haven't played it so i don't know (laughs) and then extra primal that was well you could also see the order that we pick things in and crime boss and extra primal were technically my reservation games too it's just that other things got fucked up you should put this on the screen the entire time we're saying this by the way Dustin. yeah yeah yeah. let's see <clears throat> all right let's see what do we have here oh well let's lift you up a little bit dustin whoa we lift him up to the lord matt vigo wrote in said hey boys got to give our boy dustin his due i feel like you really leveled up in a major way in 2023 you hosted some of the best sacred symbols plus episodes of the year mm-hmm. the psvr blowout the kingdom hearts retrospective with brad and now of course <laughs> the billy martin interview were all fantastic yeah, fuck me and fuck me in my Ken Levine interview, right? You started punching up, which has become another much must show in the Last Stand family. I think you've also out debated Colin a few times this year, in particular with digital media concerns. My question is, what's next for Dustin in 2024? Do we have to worry about him becoming too powerful and eclipsing us all? Dustin, how do you feel? Why is why is raising me up a slight against you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, let's, let's just get this. Really what's going know. on I here? I have no answer for that. I have no <laughs> answer okay. for it. All right, all right. Fair enough. Fair enough. We can leave that. <laughs> Fuck me and my Ken Levine interview. <laughs> <laughs> so volatile for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck me and my making of Twisted Metal with David Jaffe. I don't. You know. Fuck me. Thank you, Matt, for writing in. Now, Dustin, how are you feeling? You're feeling powerful. You're feeling too powerful. Are you feeling? Like you're going to eclipse me? Are you going to eclipse the company? Are you going to what are you going to mm. move on? Are you going to quit? Are you going to do your own thing? Are you going to ascend? Uh, I don't have any plans to quit as of right now. I don't I don't I'm pretty happy with what I'm doing. I there are always things that I would like to do more of. I've always thought I would like to do my own YouTube channel. I tried streaming and I didn't really find it to be that fulfilling after a bit. So problem is, it's just that. It's not a problem. It's just the reality is that LSM takes up so much of my. Not it's not that I have no time. It's just a lot of that creative energy or work energy goes into LSM that it's like, I don't want to I don't want to edit a video for myself or something. And that's okay. And that's okay because I'm able to. It's not one of those things where I don't have an outlet to be creative. I do here. So it doesn't. It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I'm not able to do that, but that's it's all right right now. Maybe next year. 
I'll figure out something to to do a little bit on the side, but I don't it's not I'm happy I don't need to do that right now. But um but yeah, but thank you for the the kind words, Matt. I appreciate it. I uh some of these episodes, you know, the Billy episode in particular, I was a little nervous about just because it's uh, I'm not used to interviewing people. And I know that's really Colin's thing, but I wanted to give it a shot. So I appreciate the kind words there just because I was a little self-conscious about it. Were you prepared um, or did you just did you just go? I was a little prepared in that I wrote out some basic topics, but not necessarily I'm writing out every question that I'm yeah. going to go to because then I it always gets recommend too against that. Oh, yeah, I recommend. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't want to let, the, let you got to let the subject determine where you go, you know? Right. Unless right. it's like an inquisition in some case, like I would think that there are two interviews where I really had to control it, which was the abandoned interview and the interview about the plagiarism. Those mm-hmm. were the two words like I'm going to direct this. But but right. for people that are coming on to talk about things like whatever you want, man, I have a way in. And then that's basically. And then I just kind of let them feel it out. So I, I, it, by all accounts, it's it, it very well received. Congratulations on that. We don't want to lift mm. you up too high, though, mm. and give you too much confidence. So we're going to have to sure. tear you down soon. So expect that in the coming <laughs> in the coming weeks. I won't do be, it now. I, was, I thought minutes, honestly, it, yeah. anything could happen. It's going to be hard to top what and Dustin would. It Dustin's too humble. He would never take credit for this. But him yesterday, when he splashed that really cold uh, that ice cold bucket of water on henry kissinger that was pretty that was pretty wild <laughs> wow he's too he's too humble he would never no. he'd never accept the credit for it but like uh, it was pretty pretty wild way to finish the year i saw i, I saw r.i.p bozo trending and i was like <laughs> oh who died you yeah know? it could have been one of only a few people and then i saw it was henry kissinger i've always found henry kissinger to be so interesting because he first of all he was really old and he did a lot. He was a Jewish refugee from the Nazis. You know? So like imagine being that old and then kind of being relevant. He went to Harvard in the 50s and then he worked obviously for um Nixon and Ford, but um he just kind of remained relevant. And I was reading about him last night and I was like, he released a book this year. Like what? Hmm. Well, the he, he He's a hundred years old. Like, I, I don't yeah, know. But he was, <laughs> I don't he know was, that. I think he was still doing interviews and like doing the rounds. I, I, I don't want to be mean. I couldn't really handle listening to him because he's just, he had, everyone knows what Henry Kissinger sounds like. It's yeah. just, it's like, a, you know, I can't even do the impression of it. I'm like, like I can't a garbage disposal. Guy. It's yeah. It's, it's not yeah. like RFK where you feel kind of bad about it. You know, it's like, oh, that's too bad. I know you didn't sound like this at one time. It's like Henry Kissinger's always had that weird inflection. And I'm like, I'm just going to read your words instead. But yeah, man, people are hyped up right now about what what he did in Cambodia. People are remembering, you know, a lot of the the coup d'etats and all these kinds of things. It's interesting. I pr- I choose not to celebrate death unless it's very specific people. And I got to be honest with you, it's got to be worse than him, you know, um, yeah. than like a Secretary of State or something. Like when Hillary Clinton dies, and I fucking hate Hillary Clinton. I'm not gonna like think that's a good thing, you know. Yeah. To me, he's know. like he's a hundred years old, so it doesn't really even matter. Like it's right. I don't know. Do you think he like, even knew he died? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone? No, I don't know. It's just a base on it. That was just an age joke. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. Dude, that's a that's a deep conversation that happens between uh, two characters in The Sopranos. Do you even know when it happens? Yeah. You. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And of course, well, I won't even. I don't want to spoil The Sopranos. No. Nope. It's old. I mean, you've definitely Sopranos ended. 18 years ago so you've definitely had your chance but um hey i was i was not of soprano's age when it came out and i didn't watch it until pandemic time i think you would have been like that little kid on that that thing when you were watching it when you were five you'd been like help I still <laughs> yeah seen exactly that been tony's me. putting a bullet in someone's the head. wall yeah i still i still have not seen it really yeah oh that's shocking you know why know. because it because you love Breaking Bad, which I think takes something from The Sopranos, meaningful. Oh, of course. Which yeah. I think is the antihero. It's, again, very similar to Mad Men and, and others where it's like the, the person you're watching, you don't like. Like, you're not supposed to like, but you do. And I think that really begin not the antihero doesn't really begin with him, but I think that, it's a, it, it's, I don't know, man, you would love it. You fucking love it. You'd absolutely love it. I, yeah. pro- I probably would. It's just, you know what it is? It's like, it's one of these things where I've avoided it for so long that I kind of think... <laughs> It's almost like 
I kind of want to keep it going for as long as I can, just because I feel like it's like slightly impressive that I've managed to avoid it for this long. Like I didn't see Lord of the Rings and Star Wars until like probably like, like both of them until like probably 20. 16, 17 Lord of like Rings. Like I avoided it entirely. Mm. Not even because I wanted to. It was just like, it just wasn't, it wasn't in my circle at all. I was not interested in it. By the time I was like a kid, the Star Wars prequels were out and I was like, I have no context for any of this. I'm not going to watch a movie from the seventies when I'm 10 to figure out what the hell any of this. Yeah, means. that's fair. Even though the movie from the seventies looks so much better than everything they do today by a fucking mile. My it's God, it makes well. me so mad. It's okay. I can't talk about it anymore. Yeah. Um, Chris. Dustin. Yes. You can find merch at last Ooh. Oh, cool. We appreciate you guys. We sold all through the, uh, the copies of super perils of baking. The last 500 sold in two minutes. Is that right? Uh, it was around two to three minutes. Yeah. Somewhere in there. That's Less and it's, than actually five, for sure. it's actually, it's actually technically four fifty. Um, right. And so I am talking to East Asia soft. I I'm in an email thread with them now actually to begin again and not with super perils but with hybroxia on ps5 so expect it and i have something very exciting lined up hopefully as the accoutrement like the key accoutrement that would come with the game that i oh, think I is going to be know about very this. very cool yeah you don't i don't know Do you want me to tell you right now you cut it out it's too risky. i don't want to no it's too don't, risky. don't even put it it's too risky it's too risky just don't even the glitches any, anything could happen don't don't do it yeah Fair enough. So last day media store. We appreciate you. Uh, Micah fastidiously sending out the packages, probably about to kill herself. I don't really know for sure. Mm-hmm. Please leave us nice reviews on podcast services and like the video. You can comment on YouTube. Maybe we'll even read it because we just did a sacred symbols plus episode going through some of your YouTube insults, which was fun. That was one of my, again, one of my favorite episodes we've done in a long time. Just not like interview wise or anything, but just like a, we don't do enough of them. Just the three of us dicking around. And I feel like, yeah, part of me is a little, I've said this before part of me is a little disappointed in how popular the first part of the sacred symbols is simply because it is takes no preparation and I don't even think about it for one second and then I put all of this time and energy into the rest of the show and then people are like I really just like the beginning the best you know but mm. like maybe we, we could constellation was kind of to try to harness that right and maybe we just need to do more of those episodes on the side next year you're going to find a different cadence to sacred symbols plus that I think is going to make a lot of sense to people where we're going to be able to do greater and better shows but we'll have more on that soon. All right. Let's get into the topics of discussion, my friend, as we friends. If I said friend, who would I be talking to? <laughs> oh, man. Wow. We'll leave that up to the we'll, we'll send out a poll. You know, having yeah. having a big audience discussion. Yeah. Reddit. Uh, dispatch one of your thousand post threads. Uh, yeah. I was going to say Reddit doesn't seem to like Chris and I equally now at this point. So. Oh, really? Hell yeah. Well, dude. Let's see. I don't want to get into it. No, I love that. <laughs> well, I they probably don't like you a little more, but it's it's been evening out, Chris. You've got a, you know, something's going on. Yeah, you know, they definitely don't like me. Um, it's Reddit. You I know? noticed like, that I mean, a long time ago. <laughs> huh? It's Reddit. You know, like, Reddit. like I, I can't. That's fine. I mean, it is yeah, what it is. You know. It is, it what, is it what it is. is. We I do one day. I do want to do a Sacred Symbols Plus episode like we did with YouTube, but with Reddit. But oh, I want to go yeah. deep into the bowels. Like I want to search the like for certain words and things. I think it would be funny as hell. Yeah. We need the next time we do an episode like that, that we need context for what the hell the comments are about. Really? I thought it was I I I I appreciate that feedback. I thought it was much more hysterical with just saying these random sentences and things out loud without any context at all. And by the way, I don't know the context either. The most context I would know, unless there's a timestamp, would be the episode. And I guess I can say that next time. Oh, right. Yeah, I guess so. That is, that is fair. I would just I would have just liked to, to like almost I would have it would be cool to kind of, kind of almost have both. Right. Where it's like we have the context and we have to guess in the beginning, like what it's about in some way. Like, what is this? What could this possibly refer to? What are what comes to our minds when we hear this specific comment? Right. And then it's kind like, of like oh, Jeopardy. Well, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'd be cool. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, let's do that. I'm going to make note of that. And uh, we'll we'll make all these things happen in the future. I think the Sacred Symbols Plus episodes are fun ways to also, I don't know, just t- it's it's a little slow and I don't know if you guys have noticed. Mm-hmm. PlayStation doesn't say a goddamn thing. In fact, uh, later on, I'll tell you how many times PlayStation has even spoken this year um, in press releases. You'll be surprised by how few. Sacred Symbols is sponsored by Fume, a wonderful alternative to going cold turkey. Learn more now at tryfume.com. That's F-U-M. 
and use the checkout code SACRED to save some of your hard-earned cash. As a businessman, I'm commonly staggered by the great ideas people and companies alike come up with, and often remark to myself, I wish I thought of that. Fume is one such idea, a novel concept that turns the entire notion of cessation on its head, so that you merely remove the bad from bad habit. So here's the rub. Fume is an analog device that you can't even charge because there's nothing to turn on. Instead, within the cylindrical fume go disposable modules called cores, and these cores come in a variety of delightful flavors and aromas. By pulling air through your fume, you'll gather the taste and smell of the core you chose, flavored air that replaces a very notable bad habit. Instead of vapor, fume uses all natural flavored air without any harmful chemicals, and the variety of options at your fingertips is impressive. Raspberry lemon, sparkling grapefruit, maple pepper, and so on and so forth, or my personal favorite, orange vanilla. Heck, my fume is right here, so let me take a pull. Uh, isn't that delightful? And I'm not even trying to cease doing anything, so I can only imagine how useful this will be for some of you out there that want to start making better personal choices. The taste, the feel, the look, the entire package, fume is awesome. It's innovative, a frankly brilliant idea that, as I said earlier, I really wish I thought of first. Alas, I just talk about video games for a living, but fume, they'll take good care of you. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the journey pack today. Head to tryfume.com, that's T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, and use the code SACRED, that's S-A-C-R-E-D, to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfume.com with the checkout code SACRED to save an additional 10% off your order today. Um, so Sacred Symbols Plus, we're always exploring things, but I want to get into a few topics of discussion here. And actually, we haven't had corrections and clarifications in a while, but we have a few I want to get through today. Hugo Falco wrote in and said, hi, guys, one small correction. In the last episode, while talking about The Last of Us Part 2 Remastered, Colin said that if you own it physically on PS4, you will need to buy it again. That is incorrect. You just need to insert the disc on your PS5 and you will have the option to purchase the upgrade. This was confirmed by Naughty Dog, and that's also how it worked with the Uncharted Legacy of Thieves collection, where you get the PS5 version by either using the disc of Uncharted 4 or Uncharted The Lost Legacy. Have a good one. Thank you for this clarification. I don't understand how this works. Because couldn't you just share the disc with everyone, or do you have to have the disc in? You have to have the disc in. Okay. Because I've done this many times. I don't remember you saying this. I feel like I feel bad. No, I, I, I would have corrected you. No, I did say that. Because this. I definitely knew this. But uh, yeah, you just got to have the disc. You're... Your PS4 disc then acts as a PS5 disc once it's in. Why aren't you, why aren't you listening to me 100% of the time? I'm, so, I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm, I'm like, yeah, uh, okay. yeah, I don't. You can't possibly be in conversations <laughs> for five hours and be totally tuned in 100% of the time. I don't know what people are thinking out there. The, but it's, it's funny because I, I didn't know this. And I guess, so you have to have the disc in as kind of like a DRM. Yeah. Yes. And you're still playing it digitally. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's that's interesting. So, yeah, there's really no you could. So that is a workaround. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's strange. I mean, I, I'm actually surprised that they do that, to be honest, yeah. because like you could just share the disc and be like, I'm going to take it this week. You take it the next week. You take it the next week. And like now, if you have like three friends that want to play The Last of Us and you all just go and buy it now for some cheap price and then you split the ten dollars. I'm, I'm not saying that's a little much. Well, I mean, I, it, some how's of you that different than just a normal disc. I mean, that's what I currently do with some games is that I play a game and then Holly, I'll give it to her. She plays it for a bit and then a friend wants to borrow it. It's no different. Right. But um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. But the, the single purchase copy could execute multiple upgrades, thus circumventing the original copy bought, <laughs> which would not be possible otherwise. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It's just interesting. I'm really surprised well, to hear that. And this goes to show you how little I deal with physical media. I'm confused. Yeah. Because... Each you still need the disc to play it, even if you buy if you buy right. the upgrade. Right. So you're upgrading you're not, the same game over and over again is the point. So I'm they making. would get extra money then because you would need to buy three upgrades. Right. But you would. But under my assumption is that you would need to have three copies and it would make more money than that. You know, oh. that's that's the point I'm trying to make. Right. But, I guess that makes sense. It's just you're still limited to needing the disc. Yeah, yeah, that's so, fair. I, we we agree. Yeah, on that. I, I think, uh, yeah, it's it's one of those situations where I feel like they're going to they they probably assume rightfully that very very few people are going to do anything like that because <laughs> most people, if they want the Last of Us Part Two, they probably already have it, so they're not going to go out and be like, oh, I'm going to get like a really cheap copy off of like 
at at, at uh, I don't know some games retailer and get it get it. I'm gonna buy The Last of Us Part Two for five bucks or something, and then it'll cost me only fifteen. Wouldn't that be great? I can't imagine there's many people doing that. Yeah, you know? yeah. If um, I were well, in high school and using physical media and like I didn't have a lot of money, I'd be like, oh, I'm definitely doing that. If I did, but I would have already had The Last of Us in that in that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I see what, exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, Dustin, they were, I mean, yeah. War, it was just on sale. Last of Us uh, Part Two was on sale. And so like Wario tweeted out like, hey, if you buy this on sale for I can't remember exactly. Let's say it's twenty dollars. Then you can get part part two remastered for thirty. You just buy it now and then you buy the ten dollar upgrade later. So there are people even doing this to some degree digitally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I'm, I'm glad they have that that path forward. It, it really. Yeah. It really took a lot of the sales out of any any criticism, I feel like. That oh, totally. Yeah, you're absolutely stuff. right about that. Because like we said last week, Chris, people were upset when the when it leaked without the context. Right. And yeah. I was of the mind where you'd be like, I'll buy it for 70 bucks. I really don't care. But yeah, and I do think that there are probably a lot of people like that. I do think also there are probably a lot of physical games people that are going to be like, I need to buy it again, which is exactly what happened with Remastered back in 2014 when it came to PS4. Um. Right. People were upset about that at that time, too, by the way, but not. Oh, yeah. Not so not this. Not this upset. All right. <laughs> DSAN 21 wrote in, said, good afternoon, men. I write into you today in regard to the discussion you guys had about transferring your PSN account postmortem. It seems like you guys are overcomplicating it a bit. Wouldn't it just be a matter of leaving your signing credentials to someone else? Maybe I'm missing a crucial detail here. Anyway, thanks for all that you do here at LSM. No, I don't. I don't think we're overcomplicating it at all, because I'm sure somewhere in the language of your account says, like, you cannot transfer it. And so I'm wondering, it's going to be attached to a different email and all these different things. And you're, I just think I'm not saying you're wrong because that is what would happen in the main. But I think it's got to be more than that, like a memorializing of these accounts. I, I do think this is going to become a thing at some point as we get older and people start to die in larger numbers that have these huge digital catalogs. Think about it. My first digital games on PSN go back to 2006. Yeah. So you you want to definitely and for people on Xbox Live, it's 2005. So you want to be able to hand that off in some way. And I guarantee you in the user agreement, you're not allowed to do shit like that. There's just no way, you know, um, Colin, I know. I know the, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I was gonna, you're saying about all your games. I mean, your, your PSN account, theoretically, you're not allowed to sell it, but if you did, surely it would be worth thousands of dollars. Yeah. Fortunately, you know? I, mean, I have yeah. over a thousand games probably uh, digitally right. between the three digitally between the three consoles i think it would be easily a thousand games because during the ps3 and ps4 era or most of the ps4 era i got everything literally like i would get codes for every game i would be Mm. i would sometimes go into psn and have like six codes that i had gotten that day and just go get them all and add them to my list and never really play them because we would get on the mailers for pr or whatever so yeah it would be valuable yeah i would never do that of course but um yeah that's true and i i I was gonna say other there are people do PSN must PlayStation and Sony must know that people do sign into the same accounts just because like power picks is a good example. Uh, people might remember when, but when power picks was smaller, it was unclear if it was one person or not. And it's definitely not one person, but it was like, holy shit. How did you get so many trophies? And it's because they're all logging into the same account. So I don't know that people or Sony really cares as long as nothing untoward is happening. And I'm not saying that it wouldn't be that easy descent. What I'm saying is, is that I hope that they make a way to do it. It's very similar to what I was saying about Facebook, how next of kin can go to go to meta and be like, we want to memorialize this person's page. Now, there should just be something like that to say, like, this person's dead. Maybe some proof of that or whatever and say, like, we want to transfer this. And Dustin, I'll leave you my PSN account in my will. Oh, how's that? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'll I look forward to that. Maybe I'll I don't know. Can we accelerate the process? Well, I'm probably doing. I want my inheritance my early, father. I'm yeah. the prodigal son. You yeah. know, <laughs> there's always people complaining in like in parts of finance about the cruelness, like the cruel, cruelness, cruelty of wealthier, older people making their kids wait until they die to get their money. Because it's like you really could use it right now. Like what? Why wouldn't the wealthy parents be like, oh, we'll buy you a house or something? You know, I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't do that. My parents didn't give me anything. I mean, they, they did the best they could. I'm not making fun of them. And I'm not saying you shouldn't get what you can from your parents. That's awesome. Like Dagan is paying for is going to pay for his kids to go to college, which was like not even a thing. My parents ever. That was not even my dad took me into a bank when I was 17 years old and going to Northeastern. and was like, you can take out your loans. You know? and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and actually set he co-signed and actually sat me down and was like it was probably one of the first adult like 
eyeball things my dad ever did to me as like a grown man where he's like, you can't default on these. And I remember being like going into my freshman year being like, I have no fucking idea what you're talking about. So don't worry about it. And, uh, (laughs) and what about my business? (laughs) It's amazing. It's amazing how little information at that age is retained in the way that it really, it really should be. So I don't know what the fuck we're talking i couldn't give a shit less i'm like dude i'm going to live in a freshman dorm with all these girls and all the it's like yeah like i'll worry about that another time and worry about it i did when i started crying at my desk when i got my first at igm when i got my first bill love it all right where are we here so desant appreciate it uh you're writing and you're right i wonder if anyone at sony listens to this and thinks like oh that's an interesting little project you know I, i do think that that would be like an interesting project be like how do we handle this and maybe they already have an answer to this and i just don't know it's in the uh the eula somewhere finally last is this the second to last correction actually yes i think it is ray wrote in said hello hello colin and co i just wanted to clarify the shimmering in alan wake too so for people that don't know i'm having this really bad effect at 60 frames on ps5 with alan wake too which is something many people are experiencing you can just go on youtube and watch the videos but of this really distracting light shimmer that happens on the edges and corners of objects etc and so on really blown out and fucked up says it's because in performance mode it's running at a very low resolution and is using fsr2 for imagery construction a very demanding part of the rendering pipeline outside of the software rt which is different from the hardware rt that happens when turning on rt on pc this is of course ray tracing is the post-processing effects in order to help greatly with performance these effects are running at the non-reconstructed image resolution and this is what leads to the heavy amount of shimmer you can easily recreate this on PC as well. So in order for that to be fixed on PS5 in performance mode, Remedy would have to do some very incredible work to get it to be lighter in their rasterization pipeline. Uh, last time I heard the word rasterization was in the Astrobot song on PS5. Mm. They talk about rasterizing in that, one of those songs. I wouldn't <laughs> hold my breath. Hopefully this helps a bit with your understanding. It does, but I don't know why you'd even... Because um, someone from... I saw this on Twitter that someone from our community tweeted at their community manager with my video saying like, it's all fucked up. I don't know if you got, you probably wouldn't have seen this. And they answered being like, kind of being like, we aren't entirely sure like what's being talked about here. And I'm like, are you is kind of how I understood it. And I'm like, and people writing in also being like, you know, what, what is Colin talking about all this stuff? I'm like, I'm telling you guys that this is happening to me now. Operator 408 wrote in and said, Hey Colin, I believe I have the same TV as you. The LG C9. Is that what I have? Doesn't correct. I have four of these, by the way, around my house. So these, these are the only TVs we play with. The, the point is that like, the, I have no other option. The shimmering in Alan Wake 2 is really bad, especially in the Lodge. Have you tried it on the PlayStation Portable to see if it's better? That's a great idea. It's not no, I don't know if it would. I don't know if it would work that way, though, right? Because isn't it just kind of sending a, a, a down rate? It's not re... It, it doesn't know natively that it's being sent to a 1080p. Yeah. The TV, wouldn't, the TV wouldn't affect that general like, i can't i can't imagine a situation where the tv would would have that kind of an impact on on rendering you know like unless i'm unless i'm really fundamentally misunderstanding how tvs work which i don't think i am that's not really that's not really that's not that's not what the tv does the tv just shows you what the machine is doing right right that's how i understand it too and I, my yeah. other point would be that the, the the ps5 wouldn't know that i'm playing i guess it would know i'm playing on portable but it would still be rendering it because it could still be played as a controller on the tv so i don't think you would still see it on the, on the right. Portal, it would just would, be down. It would just be at a lower resolution, which which right? probably it, it, because the I don't know, the pixel density might actually help it a little bit. But like, I, I don't think it would it, it, it wouldn't negate it entirely. Like, it would still definitely be there, you know, right. That's um, like a very much a switch thing where there's certain switch games that look horrible in dock mode. But because you're playing on a smaller screen. It can kind of hide better. some of the the yeah. nastiness a little bit in certain cases, but I uh, I don't know the FSR thing. I think that's part of what I said last week of my hypothesis of the situation is that there's some kind of upscaling going on that in certain scenes in particular you're going to get really bad shimmering. Um, so I don't. I actually agree with Ray. I don't. I don't think this is really a fixable thing. It's it's one of those I'm. I bet when they made this game, they had no plan to do a performance mode and that they later on during development saw all these things that happened with different games that were getting shit on for not having performance modes. And they thought, well, we didn't build the game to spec it that way, but we can make it work. And they did. 
just with some pretty big trade-offs. Yeah, I just wish they just would have kept it at 30 frames. And we would have at least known going in because it's the, the, the thing I'm disappointed in, by the way, I just want to say is like some of the people busting balls about this is if I'm not telling the truth or like. Yeah, I don't yeah. appreciate that because I tell you when things work and when they don't for me, I can't speak to other people's experiences. For instance, when I played Spider-Man 2. And I told you when I platinum and I'm like, I really had no issues with it, you know, and a lot of people other did. Well, I'm telling you what I did or when we talk always about Ben not being able to play returnal or something it's like these things just i think happen based on just very specific setups and maybe internal properties of these various machines and also people's ability to see through and buy things i i feel like this is such an obvious problem and the thing that bothers me the most is that it's all over youtube just go look like people have fucking clips of it doing exactly what i'm telling you it's doing it's very distracting i don't want to play the game like that so Mm -hmm. i think i'll i'll have to just drop it down i guess if I want to get through it, which sucks because Alan Wake remastered is at 60 frames. It's also 10 plus years old. I know, but it's just it's going to be going. It's it's just I'm broken at this point. I don't want to play 30 frame games. You know, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I, 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 don't I, I do totally it. get it. Yeah, I, I'm it's it's so weird. Like, I I'm not having this issue, but I, it is real. Like, I've seen <laughs> I've seen videos of it, you know, like it's clearly happening. It's but, more than isn't an issue to you. Yeah, yeah. Is, I the, think is the better question yeah. is not. It's like, yeah, I I can definitely see it too. Yeah. Um, I just understand it's a trade off of playing on a console. At, I just have it on I a just performance mode. It's it's just weird. Like I I feel weird about the fact that I haven't noticed it because I'm sure it must. It, these, I don't know. It, it, Cyberpunk's a pretty good example to the contrary of this actually. Where like I mean, even even if you have unified hardware, it still doesn't necessarily. Uh, uh, mean that it will perform equivalently across all hardware. I mean, Ben with with Returnal is another example too. Like there, there could just be like minor hiccups and stuff that uh, affect certain people and and don't affect other people. So it could be that it's just not happening for me, or it could be that it's happening at a lower level that like I'm okay with. I really don't. It 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 weirds me out that I haven't noticed this because I see the videos and it's so clear in the videos. And I'm like, holy shit, that is fucking out. That it almost looks like it's outrageous. intentional, like it's mystical, you know. It's like right, it's, it's yeah. Like sparkling. And I'm trying, yeah, and I'm trying to like remember, like, at like when I was playing through those sections, like, did I just assume that that was part of the style, and I didn't notice it? Because to me, like, I'll the game could, quite frankly, even as atmospheric as the game is, the game could look like fucking Tomb Raider one on PS one, and I would if if I could play it at sixty frames per second, I would play it that way mm. because I just it is so overwhelmingly important to me over everything else that maybe it's maybe these things just don't hit for me in the same way but i'm with you like i can't i I wouldn't be able to play it at 30 frames like i couldn't do it even if even if it looked immeasurably better when you like paused it or whatever i i I tried to do it too like i tried i wonder what the uh what the quality mode is and i just like i was like no no i can't can't do this (laughs) we're well past this being acceptable yeah, it's a bummer. I mean, me. it is what it is. It's no big deal. I, I am disappointed because I was really looking forward to this game. I feel like yeah. I'm going to have to restart it at this point because I've kind of just been. And I also had that bug that they acknowledged that that collective collection bug that I was talking about, too, which is good. But that's even like kind of secondary to this, just this visual thing that's that's bothering me. And I feel like I expected more now. I, I don't mean any disrespect to, to Remedy. I know they're an independent studio. Alan Way 2 is triple A, but it's very cheap made game compared to many AAA games and it's on proprietary a proprietary engine in Northlight so I know that they're working against a lot of different things but I just think there are too many examples of PlayStation 5 games that just slaughter on a technical front that it's there's no to me I'm like I don't know man that's what I want and if you're not going to give me that then it's like I look I know Horizon is a 200 million dollar first party game and it's like you see this game in Forbidden West and you're like this is insane this Mm -hmm. this this game is fucking insane look how beautiful this game is and this is what I want. I know the machine. Now I know the machine can do it. So when people don't reach that level, it's like, OK, that's OK. There's a bunch of different reasons why. But then you're kind of bringing it backwards by making this really profound problem with the lighting. And it's crazy enough that I'm not really tuned into a lot of the stuff, as people know, like I can let go of a lot of things, frame rate drops and like the, the frame rate dropping in Final Fantasy 16 didn't bother me as much as I thought it would. For instance, it was noticeable that it wasn't running in smooth 60, but this yeah. just really distracted me because I want to be immersed. I'm sitting in a dark, my dark loft in front of this dark TV and it's fucking, I don't know. It's, it's, 
It's shimmer. There's just other things I can play that work, you know? So I'll yeah. see. All right. Thank you for writing in. Jared Wilson wrote in and said, hi, guys, I was shaving this past weekend and listening to the podcast when my girlfriend walked in at the most inopportune time. The first thing out of Colin's mouth was asking the boys if they saw that tweet about Trump and golden showers. <laughs> I guess she asked me to explain what I'm listening to. Shout out to you boys for forcing me to have a very awkward conversation about my fit, my favorite podcast and to convince her it is just about video games and not about erotic sexual proclivities of past presidents. Keep doing what you're doing. Sorry, that is bad timing. Mm. Golden showers. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thank you for writing in, Jared. And I uh, hope your relationship isn't in tatters. Cody Rayburn wrote in and said, look, Fats, you're all put into a real life battle royale situation. You each get to pick a partner to work with. The only catch is that it has to be someone within the sacred symbols orbit. It can't be either of the other two co-hosts because they will be mixed in with your opponents. Who do you each choose and why? Do you go with the resourceful wild card, Micah? Perhaps you pick Dagon so he can draw wily coyote tunnels to trick your opponents. Maybe Gene can distract with his insane story so you can get the drop. Over the years, the roster has grown rather deep. Choose wisely. Mm. Mm. Dustin, who do you want? Does it have to be an official team member or just someone in the orbit? I think in the orbit is fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I've got to be honest. I don't I don't have high hopes of winning any battle royale. So if I'm going to go out, I want to make it fun. I'm going to I've been, you know, Jimmy. Jimmy's been on the show a lot recently, had a lot of good times hanging out with him. Him and I could at least we could at least pick off a few people and it would be really fun doing it. And then we could die together, you know, and that would be very mm. romantic. Do you envision so. it like like the Hunger Games with the cornucopia? Where you, we have to run oh, yeah. towards the center, or we just run into the woods and just. Yeah. Dude, I always, by the way, I fucking love The Hunger Games. Just wanted to throw that out there. New I just movie that out that, now. Yeah, I know. I, I don't the even prequel. know anything about this other stuff. Me but just that, just that first book, and, and even the Wait, film's pretty a, good, but that first book is so good. There's yeah. a new Hunger Games movie out? What do yeah, you think? Yeah, it's like a, a prequel. <coughs> what the yeah, it's about like what? a young like the, snow, I think. The, oh, like one of the oh, earlier whatever. Hunger Games or something. Yeah. yeah. Isn't the thing, the cornucopia, that has like a bunch of weapons in it. Right, so you like can choose to get the weapons. Stuff. Right. Like you, or you, you, can you begin in a start. circle and you can either run towards them and like fight immediately or like be in danger or just like, you know, retreat and figure out what right. you can do. Right. So um, that's mm. the way I envision it personally. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Isn't it dark? Have you ever th thought about how dark the Hunger Games is? I love it. Oh, it's so fucked up. Yeah. yeah, it's a little undermined to me, but mm. I'm sure the book's probably like pretty rough, but like the, the movie being like PG-13 is kind of yeah, yeah. like you notice it, well, like, it is I, not adult. it's no. not as violent as it could be, but I, I always envisioned it as violent. People are just dying left and right, you know, so and pretty good. Yeah, yeah. There's that <laughs> there's that scene that always makes me laugh of that. What is it? What is it? Uh, the Josh Hutchinson character dressed as like a fucking tree or something. Oh, is that PETA? Yeah, yeah. He's Pita, all. Dr yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he's all. He's 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 like cake bossed up into like a like a, it's it every time I see that clip of him like opening his eyes and he's like in tree makeup on the ground I think of those those videos of people cutting into things that like oh they'll cut into a shoe and it's actually cake right right mm -hmm. it's like oh it's Josh Hutcherson and cake yeah it's cake yeah room. he is um, Colin you at some point I know that it got like viral to the point of being annoying but you'd probably like Squid Game also oh i watched it oh you did yeah i don't remember this yeah hmm. I, I did i really i, really, I, loved it. I thought it was did awesome you see, did you see that netflix made squid game real yeah i, I yeah, like I, mr beast and, yeah. and it was like the most <laughs> I, i've never i've never that was that is the most tone deaf i've ever seen anything anything be in in my opinion like that was wild to see that people are like losing their fucking minds on that show like actually they're like oh man i could have had life-changing money but i fucked up this cookie and now now my psyche is ruined for the rest of my life and yeah. and like everybody's watching it for entertainment it's like this is so f i hate this oh this, man uh, oh yeah i saw this this tweet from discussing film players for squid game needed chapstick in the dorm so badly they ended up using lubricated condoms on their lips during filming producers eventually gave them real lip balm tins just uh, lubing themselves up i guess out of desperation they have it's condoms so that's yeah, actually I mean, a very good question. They're there I for a while. I didn't think about that. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, yeah, it's good. Okay, good, I guess, if that's what's going to happen. Anyway, you put people together. There's going to be some some horny who, men and who, some loose women. <laughs> oh. <laughs> who would uh, who who would you pick, Colin? Who, who's who's your battle royale? Uh, I think I would have to go with Dagan just because we would. I couldn't fight him under any right. circumstances. So we, mm -hmm. I would have to remove him it, from the the field in some way. We're going to lose. 
Dagan was a, a, I think a life scout. So right before Eagle Scout, I think. And so he's no, he's no <laughs> spring chicken when it comes to outdoors and camping and all that kind of stuff, much more sophisticated than I am, but he's a little, he's a little more meek. He's old. You know, I don't know, but I, I would have mm. to choose him just to get, cause I couldn't, what would I do? You know, I don't want to fight any of you really. Yeah. I'm just going to, sur- I'm going to, that was the beauty of the hunger games. And the whole notion of it is like, no matter how much you hide, you ultimately have to fight to win. Like you have no choice, but to kill someone. And that was so, that was what was so dark about it was like, there was no other way to do it. And that's the case. I'm going to have to do what I have to do, I guess. But mm. Chris, who do you have? I think we, I, I feel like, I don't know, man. I feel like, I, I feel like I want to pick cog. He's like, a, I, I, and I don't know why man. It's a great choice. Yeah. yeah. There's something like, I feel like, we, we, you know, we're from the same kind of area. I feel like we'd, we'd, I feel like we'd work together really well in that environment. Although like, I don't know if we'd win, <laughs> but like, I feel like there's almost like a rocket raccoon Groot type situation where he's like the, the tank, you know, and mm, I'll just like yeah. hang on his shoulder, like shooting, <laughs> you know, I don't know. It, it, it would, uh, that's the only, that's the only scenario where I feel like I'm getting out even remotely alive for it's, sli- it's slim pickings, a little while. Let's be honest. It's slim pickings it's slim, out there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, we don't have, we don't have much to chew. We don't have a, a, a vaunted list of physical specimens here where it's no. like some, some natural and really cog is the best example of the person who could probably act as your tank, you know? Yeah, man. In this situation. But, um, and yeah, like you said, ride him if you want. Just really Whoa. interesting collaboration, oh, hey. oh. you know? he puts you on your on his on his shoulders and you have a little spear like a a dragoon yeah yeah, exactly yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) oh man cody thank you for writing in dan excel wrote and said hey colin how's the sonos beam treating you i don't believe you have talked about your experience with it since dustin mentioned you he had bought you one as a gift has better audio improved your gaming experience please no more stinky tv speakers have a great weekend gentlemen it is not set up yet it's gotta be set up i knew it (laughs) It's going to turn here. into Chris's PSVR. No, that's so funny. That's oh. what I wrote in my notes. Uh, was, I was going to bring that exact thing up. So it's so great minds think together. I, I bought Chris a PSVR for his birthday. I wrapped it in bounty paper towels. Remember that, Chris? <laughs> I do. I do. And uh, I do. this was in 2019, probably for your birthday, probably right before I left. This is, yeah, this is 2019. And then yeah. because I had never, ba- I basically never opened it. Colin wanted it back and then I shipped it back and then it just never... <laughs> just never got to him so it's just like a, a loose psvr that's right that was the around. end of it that was the end of it was yeah well, of it. i was gonna I give never, it to someone i think no one ever used it <laughs> no one Com- complete waste it was of just money. floating around well no wait did i i must i feel like i must have used it at least like once because i feel like i remember having experience with the psvr and i certainly didn't buy one on my own and i certainly didn't borrow it from anybody and it's happening again by the way because i bought the psvr too and it's still at my friend's house who who also has not used it for for a while. This thing is Dude, cursed. Re four, re four happening. They just announced date like December eighth. Yeah, December eighth. Yeah, I didn't put that yeah. in the news, but yeah, December eighth for for re four. I want something. I, I don't know. I want something new though. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I I want them to really do something with it. And I I guess Horizon Call of the Mountains the new thing. But like I mean, oof, it's not. No, no, I don't know. I, no. I, That's got to be a Colin, lot better than that, man. Yeah, Colin's a huge Horizon fan. And the second he was like really mid on it, I was like, well, I'm not I'm not even going <laughs> to I am not going to bother with that thing. It's yeah, it was uh, it, it felt like a beefy Lynx crossbow training in some way. I mean, it, and there's not there's nothing really wrong with that. I just. We need better than that. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why I my, I believe that that would be. It's cool. The, well, I, I noted the right with the trophies. Like people fall off that game like crazy. Like people don't have not been beating Call of the Mountain. People play it for a little while and they do not play it all the way through. Like by yeah. catastrophic numbers compared it's, to um, which, which is, is always very. So, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I was gonna say it's it's very crazy, especially because I mean, there's not really much on PSVR. So you'd imagine that if somebody were to get a game a triple a game like from like a, a you know an important ip to that ecosystem they would play it you know at, at the if not to completion at the very least like more than they have you know what i mean um to completion so, Ooh. to completion like in that <laughs> i didn't know how else to say that yeah i all right so the sound bar i'm gonna set it up this holiday break for sure i don't know if you guys have noticed my the my office is a fucking mess up here so basically we have, we have so much shit in this house because we're selling all of our merch out of here. We've gotten a lot of that organized now. It's just cluttered in places. And so my so I like to like 
consolidate the clutter by just putting things in my office or in the loft. And so this holiday season, just like last year, remember this was all fucked up and then you came back and everything was set up. The drums were set up like this was all set up. Everything was done. I'm going to have a similar renaissance where mm-hmm. I'm going to get this all cleaned up. I'm going to start getting more G.I. Joe's set up. I'm probably going to open a bunch of my six inch Joe's that have been sitting behind me and all over here. I have like a hundred of them probably and start setting those up. And then because I just don't want to have all these boxes. They're also not valuable. And I, I really have just been lazy about it. I just buy whatever comes out and then they just ship them to me and then I just add it to the pile of G.I. Joe's. So I want to actually go through and set them up, get more of these guys set up. And then in the loft, which you guys never see, but you guys know well, Chris has never been here. But Dustin, you've seen it. Um, it's just like we literally have the ironing board out still from when we ironed our clothes to go to our rehearsal dinner before our wedding. Like it's just there's just so much clutter in that space. And I've cleared out some of it and kind of consolidated it to be able to most of it's G.I. Joe stuff to be able to sit on my couch and play games up there. But I haven't done that recently. So at that time, the soundbar will be set up. So I assure you the soundbar will be set up. We've already decided. I told you guys, I think on a previous episode, Micah and I talked about what we wanted upstairs or downstairs. And we think for the ambience, because we go upstairs for the ambient games and the ambient experiences, that would probably make the most sense upstairs. And so I was like, yeah, OK, that sounds great to me. So I promise you and I appreciate the gift. Thank you. No worries. I wasn't thanking you. I was thanking you, Dan. Oh, all right. <laughs> I'm like, <all> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thanking yeah, you both. For the question. No thanks for the sound system. <laughs> Armbar Mitzvah. Excellent name. Wow. Rodin said, symbolic ones. I'm usually a stickler for correct names and pronunciations for things, but one thing I vehemently refuse to use correctly is GIF. I cannot fathom for the life of me why it is pronounced GIF, like the peanut butter. Graphics don't have a J sound. They, it's not giraffics, it's graphics. It makes no sense. My wife uses it correctly all the time and it drives me nuts, even though she's right. What say you find, gentlemen? I had this very conundrum at IGN and much like the saying Mario, like Dagan still says Mario, right? Um, that was beat out of me. Completely beat out of me. Like, you can't oh. say it like that. That's not the way it's said. Like, you don't say it like that. And this was another one of those conversations. And I used to say, I always said GIF until I discover it, as we all know, that the creator of the GIF says GIF, at which point I started saying GIF. Because regardless of the logic of it, he made it. It's like he named it. It, it, I don't understand how else we could possibly interpret it. We can do whatever we want. But I go with the person who named it. It's like someone I've said before, Colin Powell, Secretary of State. He ruined everything for me because he said his name Colin. So everyone started saying my name Colin, even not as an insult. But I'm like, no, it's Colin. But what if people came to me and said, no, it's Colin. It's like, but it's my Hmm. name. And I'm telling you it's Colin. So this guy's saying it's GIF. It's GIF. It's GIF. I mean, that is the answer. Now, if we want to call it GIF, that's totally fine. I vacillate at this point between the two. Um, where do you guys, Chris, are you uh, passionate about this subject? I, I'm a GIF person. I, I simply, I, I refuse. I'm, I'm not going to say GIF. I just, I, I really could give a fuck less what this, what the original creator has to say about it. Because, you know, God bless, you know, you did a good thing. But your your you know your ability to create something doesn't necessarily and by the way your ability to create something cool it's an interesting little like internet format image format it's cool but it doesn't necessarily like your your proficiency in that doesn't necessarily translate to your ability to logically name them to me it's to me it's just kind of one of these things where it's it, it almost reminds me of the Asperger's guy where like. Hey, this this is a this is a disorder that affects kids who are like really susceptible to bullying. Let's name it after the guy whose name is Asperger's. You know what I mean, it's like it, it doesn't. It, it's really fucking unfortunate, and you should have the at least some foresight to be like, hey, maybe maybe don't call it that. Wasn't there a guy uh, named like Phil Johnson? You know, they could have called the Johnson disease. That would have been even worse, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it would be like it would be like if anxiety was discovered by like a guy named like Jonathan Little Penis or something. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you've got Little Penis's disease. He's Indian. And it's like, well, that's that's not fair. It's just that's not that's not fair. It's fucked up. That's by the way, autism level one now. By the way, Asperger's is gone. I had no idea until like a couple oh. like months ago. It's like that's not a term anymore. Probably because it's such a fucking horrible name. Yeah, and that's kind of the point where it's like just because you name it doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. Sometimes, sometimes people who name things can be wrong. Uh, and to me, it's just it, the logic is really the the main focus. Can I point also be honest with like, you about something right now, Chris? Can I be honest sure. with you? When people tell me that they have various illnesses, 
it's you i usually have no idea what they're talking about except for i know it's bad you know so mm-hmm. when so, if someone's like i have lou gehrig's disease or something i'm like i i know that that's bad but right, i don't know right. exactly what it is but i know that it's bad i still can't even tell you the kind of skin cancer i have no yeah exactly i, I, I just don't my mind kind of shuts off with biology and like the human body and all this i'm just like i don't know man yeah, I no, just, I totally get it. I, mean, I don't know why. That, isn't that strange? Yeah, well, you you say you get it. So I guess you don't think it's strange. Like, no, I, no, I, 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 I'm so eagerly interested in so many things. I consider myself a total renaissance man from that perspective. Maybe not good at everything, but really have a lot of interests. And when it comes to like, oh, here's a documentary about the body. Here's a, I'm like, no, Jesus Christ. You know, I don't want to watch. Here, biology in school was my worst science. I hated it. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot yeah. of things that, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I I I understand the because so much of medical terminology and so much of biological terminology is so inherently like mega scientific, you know, to the point where like if you don't know the root words for these like or the or the suffixes and the prefixes for these like really really core scientific like deep like inside baseball terms, then you're not going to like I don't know what the fuck Hodgkin's lymphoma is. That doesn't tell me fucking anything. Right. I don't know what I, I don't know what that means. I know I that it's think bad. That's what, I think that's what I think that's Greg cancer. I'm that pretty what? sure I, I know that's cancer. But like, I mean, yeah. like, I don't know what the fuck. I don't know what that means, really. Like, I don't know what kind or like how it works. I just know like, ah, that's right. That sounds pretty bad. It's got a first right. name and it's a, a an OMA. Oh, no. Right. That's, that's that's pretty bad. Right. Right. You know, melanoma and all those other things. Like, yeah, that's how right. I assume. I right. just assume bad. <laughs> bad thing. But I don't know, man. It's uh, it's it's GIF. <laughs> <laughs> Dustin, speak on it. Yeah, I also think that it's GIF. And here's the thing: I feel like this has come up at another point because I feel like I've I've mentioned this. Maybe not though. It doesn't matter. Uh, I remember this book in elementary school. I'm sure this is going to be a deep. This is going to unlock a core memory for some people out there that was read aloud to me called Frindle. It's about this kid who uh, in school. He's learning about different words and stuff. And he asks his teacher, like, hey, how do words get made up? How does someone decide something? And she says, oh, well, you do. The people decide what a word is. And he's like, OK, cool. I can do that. This pen is now called Frindle. And he has like this battle with his teacher over weeks. And eventually he wins out and it's like it becomes viral and he changes. So a pen is officially a Frindle. Uh, I don't know if anyone else remembers this book. I'm reading, for I'm some reason, at, this- I'm looking at it right now. It's. Frindle this is by a core Andrew, memory for me. By Andrew, Andrew Clements. Clements. Andrew yeah. Clements. So I'll, in this situation... This cover yeah, is horrifying, by the way. Yes, it is. Maybe it is. Maybe he named it GIF. And maybe that is accurate. But the people have decided it is GIF. He doesn't get to pick it anymore. Yeah, he created it. That's fine. All respect. But with language, sorry. Well, the, the thing about it, too, is... I guarantee the thing about it, too, is like he can name it whatever the fuck he wants, but I guarantee you he can't he doesn't have a good reason for why it's called Jif. I, I guarantee he's probably just no, an asshole. Yeah, he's probably just like I, I, <laughs> I feel like it's just out of spite where somebody was like, yeah. oh, it's a it's what does it stand for? Uh, what does GIF graphics, stand for? Graphics, graphics in, something interface. Wait. Oh, look, GIF yeah. wiki. Uh, yeah gifts graphical interchange format graphics format. interchange format. Graphics, graphics interchange format so i bet he made it and he was like oh he he named it so a graphics interchange format and somebody was like oh a gif he's like and he's probably just being a dick it's like no it's a gif actually and he's like what do you mean no it's not and he's like yeah it is i made it he, st- he strikes me as that kind of guy only somebody like that would want to make a fucking single image move for three seconds anyway yeah <laughs> I didn't expect this to get so so passionate. Such a robust conversation. Armbar Mitzvah, thank you for writing in. One more. Stephen Campos wrote in and said, hello, everyone. Colin, Chris, and Dustin. I am in a situation and I don't know what to do. I moved into a new apartment and me and my mom can hear our neighbors having sex. It's very awkward and I don't want to create a situation by telling them up front. What do I do in this situation? Should I just let it ride? Should I be more confrontational? Should I start shouting really loud? I can hear you guys to make them stop. What would you do in this situation? Crank off, you know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I don't know, man. That is tough. I've been in these kinds of situations. I lived, when I lived in Santa Monica, 
I lived with my you guys both know the apartments face like another apartment building and yeah. people you'd be able to hear things out of those buildings. And I heard so many things like people just getting railed and mm-hmm. for like 20 minutes go like just incredible sh- like it's like what is going on can't you guys be more self-aware out there i feel like it's on it's incumbent on people to kind of like not put on a show i know that that's hot for some people to do and they like and they like that or whatever it's like come on man have a little respect but if it's it, so that's different but if no one's windows are open and stuff and you just live with paper thin walls and i've had that situation too in san francisco yep then you gotta kind of tell them because here's the thing is i think that they'd be embarrassed it's like for me it's like i'm in on your i'm in on your personal moment here like don't you want to be it's your thing and like so maybe i'm doing you a favor by telling you like just letting you know you know it's a little strange and you have to just figure out an eloquent way to say it but i don't think you want to live with that especially with your mom because that makes it harder to crank off you know Mm. (laughs) yeah that's the problem right Uh, Um. (laughs) Chris. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I I've never experienced this in this capacity where it was a stranger like because I've lived with people like I've had roommates for a really, really long time. I think like this the last year was like only in the last year have I really lived by myself, you know, and even this apartment has a really thick. Well, it's insane how thick the wall Like I can blast my sound system to like 90 and then I, I can close my door and I can't hear anything. It's crazy. So like I don't hear anything at all from strangers but i remember living with you know roommates and and friends and in in apartments with like super thin walls i remember it and i would just if it was a friend of mine i would be like hey you know just you know so you know it's thin walls you know but then but then i remember also having this the the kind of state of mind where i was like listen I, i would i would bring people home and i'd be like listen you're gonna you're gonna hear shit i'm sorry I'm not. I'm sorry. The, the the walls are thin. I there's only so it can, this can only be so quiet. Mm. You know what I mean? Where it's like, I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how I would even address it with a stranger. That sounds yeah. so awkward. It is awkward, but I just don't think you can live like that because, again, I feel like it's an, an, an you're, you're kind of penetrating the veil of their whole <laughs> situation. You know, part pardon the pun. Where it's like, I don't know. To me, I'd want to know that if that was me doing it and I knew that other people could kind of observe it orally or whatever, I would. But surely they know is the thing. That's the thing. It's like, to, to, I feel like it would almost validate in some way. Like it could, it could backfire <laughs> in some it way. Could you know back, I mean? It could absolutely. backfire. Cause they could be like, Oh man. All right. Well, fuck it. Cause dude, I've had this exact, not this, not with this exact situation, but I've had like, I have a parking space, right? And I don't have a car here with me. So people will park in there and then my friends will come over and then they'll park in my space. And then I had some people leave a note on on my friend's car being like, hey, do you live here or whatever? And it's like, no, 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 unacceptable. This is my space. I'm being nice by even not calling anybody (laughs) and letting you use it because I understand how expensive this shit is. But like the the audacity of you Mm. to to come to, to put a note on my friend's car for parking in my parking space is insane. And I remember specifically, I would... Out of t- I kept that note, right, of just being like, hey, get the fuck out of my space that they wrote for me. And I would put it on their car whenever they would, whenever, whenever they would. Uh, and I made copies of it, too. So I have like an infinite number. I have like an envelope full of these. I have like 40 of these of these notes to say, get out, get out of my fucking space in their handwriting. So you don't want to trigger that level of spite in somebody like this. Who's already loud, who already is very aware of the situation. I really have no idea how you're going to do this. Get a get a big get a really crazy sound system. And where, blast it. where do you uh, escalate it and just get the car towed? Yeah. You know? Uh. Well, I haven't used most of them. I've only used it like twice. <laughs> you know what I mean? But well, I, have... I remember that because I had two spots in Santa Monica that were empty. And yeah, yeah, and yeah. people used to park in them sometimes. And I'd be like, I don't know. I don't want you to get the wrong idea, but I hope I don't see yeah. you here again. And it never they, no one. No one put me in a position. You're, try, you're trying yeah, to let right. it ride one night. Okay. If they, if they cause problems for me again, if the, if a friend of mine parks in my space again and I get another note like that, then I'm towing. I'm towing the next time they, they're here. Yeah, that's, cr- but it's that's crazy. Kind of, but I don't know. They got a handicap thing in it too. So I also feel, <laughs> oh, no. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What to, Dustin, do you have anything you want to add to this? This is like, this is a, 
a potential conundrum. There's a lot of different outcomes. There's a, an, a pleasurable outcome, you know? Well, you so, just got to have start having sex louder. Right. But, you know, yeah. And then get a vi- get get and then blame it on him because he has a reputation already. And then, like, maybe enough people will complain about it that he'll get evicted in, in your place and then you'll be fine. But if he has sex louder with someone he brings over, guess who else is there? Oh, mom. yeah, I guess. Because he I said forget. he's living with the mom, which is fine. Yeah. You know, I, we don't know the situation, but well, that's then why not. Is, well, then, wait, hold on. If you're living with. See, now I need the, the context of this. Is he living with his mom in the sense that it's his mom's place? Or is is it like one of those situations where he's like older and, and like his mom is living with him? Because if it's if it's his mom's place, then is is it not her responsibility to kind of go out there and be like, hey, listen, shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? You're just a guest or not a guest, but like a kind of like a dependent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're assuming this isn't a podcast for children. So we're assuming you're an adult and then we have to kind of ask the level of the relationship. Are you a young adult who is still living with mom? Does mom live with you? You know, are you mm. taking care of mom? Right. It's a whole also a possibility. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't this think you want to have like a, a bang off or anything like that. It's going to be a stalemate. You know, it, it, yeah, you don't, yeah. I, I this is tough, man. I, I this is why I'm so glad that I don't live in those situations anymore, because I know what you mean. And I can't believe that I ever dealt with shit like that in my in like my current mindset. I told when I lived in San Francisco, house next to house next to all attached to each other. The fucking neighbors on one side used to literally play basketball in their backyard at like seven in the morning. Like Jordan versus Bird style, just fucking chaos back there. <laughs> and wh- yeah. I, I've told the story in the past that I went out there one morning and I was like, uh, what's going on out? You know what's going on out here? And the guy was like, good morning, like something, something like that. And I'm like, that, that, that just didn't, it didn't register that like any, anything was wrong. They just were, they, and I just couldn't do anything about it because we were just so close in proximity to each other. And it drove me insane, you know? And uh, the same thing in Santa Monica and all the rest. And I just, I feel for people that are in those situations because if everyone lived like me, like a quiet little mouse, sometimes I'm allowed, but even with my drums, I only play my drums from like 12 to four or 12 to five or something. I never play them after that and never before ever, not even once. I assume there are people probably in my neighborhood that are at work that never don't even know I play. You know, Um, I don't know. Treat your neighbors a little more kindly. Stephen Campos, good luck to you, my friend, and be well. I hope your mom's okay. (laughs) No solutions. God, there's more problems. <laughs> no solution. We uh, no advice <laughs> at, at all. <laughs> well, I I gave him advice, but no one wanted to hear it. You know. All right. <laughs> That's true. Greetings, it's me, Colin Moriarty. Uh, just cutting in here with an interstitial because I'm coming in the next day after we've recorded this, and just hours after we published this podcast, I've asked the editors to put this in there because over at Windows Central. Dot com. Our friend Jez Corden, friend of the show, wrote a story entitled, We Have No Plans to Bring Xbox Game Pass to PlayStation or Nintendo. And he says in, in part, it's an extensive interview you can read about a bunch of other things, but he's asked directly about, um, well, I'll let Jez speak for himself. He says, quote, I asked Phil Spencer about Xbox CFO Tim Stewart's recent comments regarding Xbox Game Pass. Stewart, in a presentation with Wells Fargo, which you're going to learn about shortly, said that Microsoft's aim was to bring Xbox Game Pass to any screen that can play games, including Nintendo and PlayStation. Many Xbox fans took that to indicate that Microsoft is preparing for an industry where Xbox hardware no longer exists. Since Xbox Game Pass and its exclusives are a primary value driver for Xbox Series X, Xbox Series S, and Xbox One hardware. So to this, Phil says in part, quote, I'll start by saying we have no plans to bring Game Pass to PlayStation or Nintendo. It's not in our plans, end quote. And he says a bunch of other stuff that has nothing to do with it. This is really the only mention of that. Um, We're going to leave everything else the way it is because I think the conversation makes a whole lot of sense. Otherwise, it's also worth noting Phil Spencer said under oath during the Activision fiasco that um, PlayStation was the reason that uh, or I guess it was actually in discovery, perhaps that PlayStation was the reason that Xbox Game Pass wasn't coming to Sony in the first place. So while it might not be in their plans per se, it's obviously something that they're talking about. And clearly um, the CFO and the CEO of the brand are not even remotely on the same page. So um, 
I, we probably would have let this go and just discussed it on the next episode. So you had the full context there. But since this went live and then just hours later, this happened, we felt like it should probably just be edited in now. And then we can talk about it in a more robust way next week. So that's basically it. Um, go into this conversation with the context that Phil Spencer and his uh, conversation here with Windows Central completely contradicts what Window or Xbox CFO Tim Stewart had said just a couple of days ago and take that for what you will. Um, we'll talk next time more deeply if you guys want to about this. But in the meantime, go. this will now go back into the normal episode. And anyway, I got to go. I got to go to dinner. Bye. Shorts optional wrote in. Let's get into actual news, here, shall we? All right. Hey, CDC. Colin has been pretty bullish on a curated form of Game Pass coming to PlayStation at some point in time. Do the recent comments by Tim Stewart speed up that timeline at all? In a Wells Fargo Summit conference, the Xbox CFO spoke on bringing first party games and services to other platforms, saying, quote, that means smart TVs, that means mobile devices, that means what we would have thought of as competitors in the past, like PlayStation and Nintendo, end quote. I think we know that Microsoft wants to bring Game Pass to Sony and Nintendo, but what are the chances either one lets this happen anytime soon? Thanks for the time. I think this is a major story um, and it's being reported on, but I'm not sure it's getting enough um, play specifically because when you consider Microsoft as a corporation, so fewer than 10% or less than 10%, about 6% of Microsoft's revenue comes from Xbox, so it's a small part of the brand. The CFO is, depending on the corporate structure of the C-suite, second, third in command of the company, you know, um, in terms of the kind of the power structure. And everything he says is very in public is very intentional. And it's very similar to what I was saying about emails where they're going to say what they mean because they don't think anyone's listening. In these situations... As a, as a steward of a message of a major multinational corporation, you don't say things that are mistaken or out of hand. He is media trained through the roof. So I went to this um, Video Games Chronicle uh, article that I think talks about this the best, and I want to know what you guys think about it. It's entitled, Xbox Exec Says Microsoft Wants to Bring Game Pass to PlayStation and Nintendo. And similar to what was written into us, he said, quote, um, Tim Stewart told attendees at the Wells Fargo TMT Summit that the company's ultimate goal is to bring all content and services to every screen that can play a game. The mission is designed to reap higher profits for Microsoft's gaming division. That has traditionally been the case with its relatively low margin console business, the exec said. And it was one of the motivating factors behind the company's $69 billion acquisition of the Call of Duty creator Activision Blizzard, which completed last month. Quote for us, when we think about the business, and this is him now, gaming as it relates to Microsoft and with Activision, operating leverage and margin expansion is definitely a piece of the puzzle. At the highest levels, you go from what was a lower margin third party entity that we sold on our store to a high margin first party business. So when you think about the Xbox component of Call of Duty, you go from that low margin business to a high margin business. Then what you do is you also expand and say, we're now driving high margin sales on PlayStation and Nintendo, end quote. And then go back to VGC. They say prior to its purchase of Activision Blizzard, Microsoft agreed to 10 year deals to bring Call of Duty to Nintendo platforms and to keep it on PlayStation. And should, should the acquisition be approved by competition regulators, which it was. And then the quote from Tim Stewart goes on, quote, and that's really lastly where we're going in the business is that expansion of operating leverage where we think about placing our bets. First party subscriptions, advertising, those are all high margin businesses that we want to expand into. And what you'll hear from us more, here's the important part. And what you'll hear from us more and more is a bit of change of strategy. And again, not announcing anything broadly here, but our mission is to bring our first party experiences, our subscription services to every screen that can play a game. That means smart TVs. That means mobile devices. That means what we would have thought of as competitors in the past, like PlayStation and Nintendo. We're going to NVIDIA GeForce now, their gaming subscription services service. But when we think about taking our businesses to these endpoints, again, it's that high margin business to new gamers that really Activision allows us to do in a, in, in a much, I don't want to say easier way, but much more, I'll say fast way to get there versus trying to build on your own, end quote. Um, this is pretty incredible. I think because it's it's not a, it is a major column was right moment, of course, but this was obvious from even the depositions during the Activision mm -hmm. situation. I'm wondering, Dustin, let's go to you first. I'm wondering, what do you think about that? It's the CFO of Microsoft explicitly using PlayStation. It's not even being vague in any way, but saying like we want to do this now. I've said that this is going to happen for a few years now. And I think that that is pretty obvious that that's what Microsoft wants. I think it's more urgent actually than ever as their console sales continue to continue to lag behind PlayStation and they don't have the same kind of penetration part, you know, oh, pardon yeah. the term. I'm just wondering what you think about this. This is a, uh, again, 
this isn't off the cuff and and I think it should be taken seriously because of the person it's coming from. It's a very serious person that has a lot of power and fiduciary obligation. So um, I take what he says seriously and I think that this is the end goal and I'd be surprised if they didn't we didn't see more moves like this towards that end goal in the months and years to come. Yeah. Well, I think that still that if this were to happen, it would have to be a very specific and bespoke version of Game Pass that they may not like a lot of the qualifications. For example, I don't think it would have to be a first party, second party only version of Game Pass, because why would PlayStation want to give people the option to buy their competitors service on their hardware? Even if they were making a cutoff of it, they're undermining their own store. So first of all, it would be just their first party games or and second party, right? Or maybe exclusives. I guess to say broadly, we'll say exclusives. But then in addition, I would imagine that PlayStation would have a requirement that says, if you're going to do this, then you need to release these games a la carte on our service as well. Because someone can correct me if I'm wrong. There is no, are there any games that are behind one of these subscriptions? Like I know there's EA uh, available and then PlayStation Plus, of course, but there's nothing that is exclusively available through a subscription service on PlayStation Store. I think there are certain PS Plus premium games that cannot be bought a la carte. I think right. that's it. Okay, you're right. Yeah, that the classics, is true. Right? I know the, cla- the yeah, um, classic games, and there's not many. I think there's like a handful of them. Right, like Resident Evil Director's Cut. Yeah, I, I think, think yeah, like is, it's like maybe Ridge Racer 4 and shit like, or not Ridge Racer 4, Ridge Racer 1 maybe, something like that. Um, yeah, you are right about that. Okay. So that would be, but that's, to your, that's I think really you're rare. generally right, because it's, it's not, and there's nothing significant or important behind the paywall and that i haven't seen anything recently that's been paywalled so let's say that xbox agrees to that and says okay we'll release them all a la carte and we'll make a version of game pass that's just for our games at that point it's really just become kind of like a publisher subscription like ea play or something like that which it is a form of game pass but i i this is where i i think last time we had this conversation where i said it it's possible, but it's not like Game Pass like you imagine it now. I don't think they're going to allow Game Pass game streaming on there either because they have their own streaming service. Why would they do that? So, yeah, I guess what this could mean is that this is just a movement, it, you know, and, and you're right. The, the person saying this really does matter. And he's very upfront about it and knows that he's on a stage giving a message that people are going to hear. Maybe this is does mean that just Xbox is going multi-platform much like Sega did many, many years ago. Not that, though, I'm not saying that Xbox is going to get out of hardware, but if they really want to get their games on every screen, then I can't imagine Sony saying yes, unless it's under those conditions that I just outlined. Yeah. Important caveats, of course, and we all know this, is that because people will write in is, you know, technically they are multi-platform, right? Like Minecraft is a long time Microsoft property. It's funny, Microsoft has owned Minecraft for far longer than Minecraft was independent. So it's, it is really a, an Xbox product at this point in, so, you know, in some sig- significant way and games like that. So I want to note that, that that stuff has already happened, Psychonauts and, and things of this nature. And of course, the games go in the other direction, although that was kind of against Sony's will with stuff like MLB The Show, which MLB itself, Major League Baseball, acts as the publisher. So there are certain examples of games that are crossing between them, but I think you're right. Um, what I and Chris, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. I, I think what's interesting here, Dustin, you you hit on something that I think is kind of important and interesting would be would you test the waters with a la carte stuff first and not not things that we expect to come like I made the argument that if they were going well, they've already proved it with Elder Scrolls Online and Skyrim and stuff like that, but that you can make the argument that certain games like you could imagine a game like Doom, right? the next doom it's like maybe that is also a playstation game or maybe that's the way they they begin to experiment or keep things where they are noting that it doesn't really work out but the the ironic thing is that they can kind of throw game pass a lifeline or game pass can achieve its parity goals without playstation at which point playstation might be working under different terms to get them onto their platform so they might want to act more soon you know sooner if they can but Chris, I'm, I'm curious what you think about this situation and if you read into any, you know, I don't know how you couldn't read into this stuff. I think a lot of people are trying to downplay this. I don't, I don't know how you possibly can downplay it. It's, it couldn't be any more explicit than this. And so it leaves only the question of when, how and where. Yeah, you know? yeah. I feel I feel like I get really hung up on how convoluted this would 
be as long as Microsoft still is in the business of selling competitive hardware. Like, I feel like in order for this to to be functional in the way that Microsoft wants it to be, I feel like they would have to necessitate, you know, like we said earlier, like a, a pared down version that's more similar to like EA Play or, or any of these other services. But at the same time, it's like, what happens with, I think about it like Halo Infinite, like what happens with a game like that, right? Which I've argued for a long time should be on everything. I think it'd be a great game to, to be on PlayStation uh, specific, specifically, but that's a free to play multiplayer game. So it's free to play, but it's also like a really big Microsoft property. There's Game Pass associated with it. And then there's like microtransactions. How does that, how does the microtransactions for that work in, in a, in a cross play ecosystem now with like, if you, if you play Halo Infinite through Xbox Game Pass on PlayStation and you buy a cosmetic, how does that divvy up and and in what will like what would that deal even look like i don't know it's it's a really i have a hard time believing that playstation would ever want this i feel like they would just kind of want to avoid the confusion altogether because i mean as we went over in like a previous episode they're up what like 152 percent in in hardware sales and and xbox is down like an insane amount so like i feel like to them it's like what benefit do we have from getting game pass on our subscription uh, on our ecosystem a 30 percent cut i guess you know yeah but then but then that's what i mean it's like halo infinite yeah i guess so yeah, yeah. i, yeah, I guess 30 percent rip on all those microtransactions too Th- know? that is true yeah Money i guess i just do nothing it, Chicks yeah, yeah, but nothing, they, but yeah but they also will just get money for nothing anyway without game pass because i think they know also that's the thing with playstation it's like i feel like they're almost in a position where they have the luxury where they can just sort of wait it out because they know that they know that Microsoft needs to put games like Call of Duty on PlayStation for them to even turn a profit for it to make sense for it to make sense for them to put as much money as they do into Call of Duty. It has to be available on PlayStation because it just doesn't make sense any other way. And I think I mean, we saw it with Starfield where like that didn't really drive hardware sales in the way that Microsoft anticipated. So from where I'm sitting from a PlayStation standpoint, it's like we could just wait until they're just going to put their stuff on here anyway. And there's, you know what I mean? Like regardless of a subscription service being intertwined with what we do. And I don't know. It's, it's a really weird, it's really difficult to imagine, I guess, PlayStation going on board with it. I understand that they get like a cut and, and a 30% cut and their deal is probably going to be pretty good. And, and they get, they get a lot of free games for, for a little work. But that's going to be that's going to have to be such a compromised bespoke version of Game Pass that almost. I just don't. It's hard for me to visualize it. Well, so oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll just just to jump in. One thing that I was just thinking is that I think about Phil Spencer's interview with kind of funny his like weird defeatist interview where he said we lost the worst generation to lose um, in terms of people's digital libraries. And I think that. I don't know. I could see a path through Microsoft where they're like, well, we're not going to win in terms of hardware. And honestly, now that, you know, they bring up Activision, their biggest money maker is I don't think ever was hardware. And I still think continue. It isn't going to be. They're not going to be able to turn it around at this point. So yeah. now that the Activision deal has happened, they might just be looking at this thinking. Think about how much software we could sell on PlayStation. Think about right. A, so even a bespoke game pass, how much that e, they're not going to buy the Xbox Series X anyway. They're currently I mean, look at we talked about the Europe sales numbers just last week. It's like they there might be at the point where it's kind of a I don't know. It sounds so mean to say it's like a white flag, a white flag in terms of trying to beat them in a hardware game. And now they're saying, well, we can make. Microsoft doesn't care about winning the console war of as far as like which one they buy. They care about making the most amount of money. Right. And yeah. so maybe they're, that's the angle. They're like, we could just make so much more money selling software at this point. Yeah. 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 I, I, I guess. I just. But where does the hardware fit in then? You know, right. Do, well, they, that's what I'm do saying. they keep doing it? And yeah. And say so you can get the best value in the most amount of games on our platform. Do they? And, and, so, and, and then do, do they fold it? 
do they fold inward in that way? Like, do, like, could you see a, f- a future where, oh, okay, so Halo, Halo, let's say Halo's on PlayStation now because Game Pass is on PlayStation. Do we then see, oh, hey, here's a, f- here's a Microsoft, here's an Xbox controller for PlayStation. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, like, it's, it's just such a, it's such a difficult reality to imagine because we've never really seen anything like this. Even with, even with the uncharacteristically multi-platform nature of a lot of like first party games now, like we talked about MLB The Show and, and, you know, Psychonauts and, right. and obviously what will be Call of Duty, it, far cry from what things used to be where things were like very, very locked down. Um, although you still had exceptions where things were, you know, Tomb Raider was thought of as a very PlayStation centric game, but it was also on PC and y- you had like these, some, these stragglers, but you know, we're in a very, very different time to the point where it's like, maybe, maybe this does happen. It's just, I can't imagine being placed. I can't imagine PlayStation being super cooperative with it because I don't think they have a enough of a reason to, but I mean, more, more money is always good from a, from a company perspective. So maybe, maybe that's really all it would take. And maybe there is some, some sense of security in that, even though PlayStation doesn't need it to know that, Hey, we're not really competing anymore. But then what does that mean? What does it mean for them to not have to compete at all? It's weird. I don't know. It's, it's, it's fucking weird. Like, I, I can't imagine this world. Uh, although I, I think Colin's right where it's, it, it, it probably will end up happening. It's just so alien to anything that we are even remotely familiar with that it's, it really is genuinely really difficult for me to conceptualize this. Yeah, happening. it's it's tough to know when this will all happen or how it all go down either because there's there's so much to say in the sense this could go multiple different ways you could well the product like let's imagine the product right and i was thinking about this through the lens of what's already on playstation 5 like you said dustin there's already ubisoft and ea services and sony doesn't seem to have a problem with those right they're getting money Mm -hmm. out of those they might have some they they have unusually good relationships with those two publishers so that might have to do with it too, but they're on everything. You can get Ubisoft and and uh, EA's service on other things as well. So they seem to be okay with that. And then there's this other angle I was thinking of where it could be more like a Nintendo online situation where you imagine literally that same visual setup, of just box art of classic Xbox games. And just Xbox first party stuff that's added over time, maybe starting with older things. Maybe they come maybe very much like PlayStation 5's even cadence with PC where it'll eventually come or it'll eventually be there in some sense. But I do think about it. It's not even from Sony's perspective that I think about it more from but from Microsoft's where if you can't get Game Pass as it is, like as it is on everything that you want it on, then you you kind of can't compromise. In other words, it, it. I love the idea of this bespoke, very specific product that has those Xbox first and second party games, but that would be a great benefit to Sony. I, I don't see, in my opinion, I don't see why Sony would ever turn that down. If that was the deal given to Sony, they should take it right now. Because then they were like, well, we, what do you lose? You lose nothing from that. Yeah. And you kind of, that's kind of like a Walter White, like I won, you know, situation. Right. Where that that's so... I don't think that that deal is probably in play yet, but I think that that is more of the Nintendo World online situation that I maybe envision. But I see that as being like, that's not sufficient for Xbox because Game Pass should ultimately be at parity across platforms if possible. I know it's not necessarily right now. I know there's like one kind of going on PC and another on Game Pass for console and they kind of have different offerings. But eventually you want to have a unified hardware thing where you're, you're doing all these things and for them to have this exception on such a vastly played har- platform would really be disabling to them because they would never really be able to change that and so sony would have to become okay with giving games away and that is a problem because that's just that does go against the entire fabric of everything although they already do that on ps plus to a great degree and of course it's not giving away games permanently but but more of a rental so i think that the the issue is really a more on Microsoft on what they want to offer in this regard moving forward. And maybe it does just begin with a la carte offerings. And again, things that come out. Remember, we talked about the, the rumors about a Fallout 3 and a and Oblivion, but especially Fallout 3 remake or Fallout 3 re- remaster. And I'm like, I feel like that would come to PlayStation. You know, 
because they they have a heritage on PlayStation, and maybe that's the way they start to sneak things in, such that the prediction of Elder Scrolls Six being on PlayStation simply because Game Pass will be on PlayStation by that time, as I've been saying for years, is maybe ultimately going to be true. It's very intriguing, um, and I do wonder what it would take to make this happen because a big question as has already been brought up and David Mulhall wrote in with it says, Hey gents regarding Xbox CFO, Tim Stewart's recent comments regarding Xbox taking share in the gaming market in places like PlayStation and Nintendo. It makes sense from a game pass point of view, but don't, but won't that be the final nail in the coffin for their hardware business and hand even further dominance to Sony? Why would I buy an Xbox console to play Xbox exclusives and third party games when I could buy a PlayStation and play PS exclusives, third party and Xbox first party games via game pass on one machine? This is the catch 22. There, it's totally true. I mean, this is a this is a question worth asking. So when you do float, when Tim Stewart, I didn't float it. When Tim Stewart floats it, it's like okay, so that must be in the cards. I mean, you must understand that about your hardware. And maybe that's why we don't hear we hear rumors of redesigned base Xbox Series S's and X's, but not a new interstitial, like we do with PlayStation right now. At least we haven't heard those rumors. Is maybe that has something to do with it? I don't know. What if the offering is just coming back to kind of what their their offer is now is that if you buy an Xbox Series X, you can get Game Pass, which is, you know, the the meme, the insane value in that. Even as things go on, the value is th- theoretically going to get better because you can have Call of Duty and all of Activision stuff on there. So that would kind of be the selling point of the console. It's like yeah, you can get our games a la carte or through a bespoke Game Pass on PlayStation, but if you want to save a ton of money on all these other games that you love, like Call of Duty or whatever, then you got you to gotta buy this box instead and play here. Which I didn't even think about Call of Duty being part of that bespoke Game Pass on PlayStation. Maybe there yeah. are exceptions then. Yeah, Zach Blade wrote in too and said, hello, sacred dudes, with the recent statement going around confirming that Xbox wants Game Pass on Switch and PS5. What sort of financial deal do you think it would take to get Nintendo and or Sony to agree to allow Game Pass on their consoles? Both already have a subscription service of their own where they get 100% of the cut. So would Microsoft have to offer something like a 50-50 split where any subs used for Game Pass on competitor consoles? Or how do you see that working? Happy holidays all. Thank you. That I mean, these are all great questions. It's something that we really have to seriously, I guess, begin to consider. It's not just like a hypothetical anymore. And he said he's yeah. not he's not announcing anything right now. He said broadly, but he's saying things very deliberately. Again, I'm just I want to reiterate to people when you're a C-suite executive at a company like Microsoft, you sit with your PR people and your marketing teams and your your experts around you for hours and hours and hours. And they drill you and they they ask you sample questions and do fake interviews and all this. I mean, they don't just say shit. So this is very deliberate to get out to people. And so now we do have to consider all of these questions. And the money situation is very interesting too, where I would imagine it would have to be a different split too, because, and that's why it's, for me, from Sony's perspective, it's hard to imagine that they would allow it in the short or midterm because it simply cuts into their a la carte sales and makes it possible for new games. and makes it, if it came as it was and made it possible for its player base to imagine a world where that is true. I think it's kind of dangerous actually for them to allow that in the short to midterm, but I do think in the long term, if they just let them on, they they've they've won that that whole situation and they don't have to really worry about it anymore. But then that that does leave Xbox in limbo. I think the one thing I'll say about Xbox hardware is. Um, this is weird messaging to Xbox's fan base, and I feel for them if they really care about the console. Because I get that I love PlayStation, but I care about the console, too. I like the ecosystem. I like being on it. And I know how to use yeah. it. And I, I get that. I, and I think a lot of Xbox people feel the same way. So when you hear an executive at your company that you, you from which you purchase games from speak like this about a, about their future, it makes it seem like hardware is not part of that future. Although I think that they're in a unique position where they because they're so big and they don't really need to extract money from hardware anymore. And that's what he was saying about the margins, about making Activision first party just makes the margins nuts. But they also what he does, what he fails to say is he incurred all of the cost of running that first party. So that's a major thing, too. Um, but I just think they're in a situation where they can probably, as Microsoft, very similar to other thing, pieces of hardware that don't really seem to be doing great, but still exist. Like, I don't think Surface has ever really done great, right? Or any, anything like that. And I have a I have an awesome Microsoft branded laptop that I really love. 
but they, they're able to kind of exist in that space and continue to explore that space because they're so big and they don't really need to extract money from it anymore. So they, you can, they can always keep the Xbox as an option, but it's a great point that like, why would you ever buy one if you could get an at parity game pass on another piece of hardware that does eliminate the need for it because you just get game pass plus everything else that's on that hardware. Yeah. It's a great question. I mean, it's one that they'll have to answer probably to shareholders in the coming quarters during financial calls. Yeah. Yeah. You'd have to, you'd have to imagine like, what, are, what are the, what, like what reasons, like for somebody who doesn't have the barrier of cost, you know what I mean? Who like can just afford every single machine. Like, what is it about the Xbox that speaks to, people at that level that makes that machine unique you know what i mean enough enough to justify a purchase in an environment like that where they don't really need it to play the first party games that they need you know what i mean like it's a very different they're very different machines like i use both of them pretty regularly and they've got different feels to them for sure and I almost wonder, like, maybe that's the main part or maybe the controller is the selling point. Maybe it's like, hey, listen, you know, like uh, that those parallel sticks over there are kind of, you know, that's something because that's definitely something that I feel like when I play w- most of the multi-platform stuff that I play is on the Xbox because I just I need that offset stick like to enjoy a lot of stuff. But I don't know, man, it's it, do just do enough people care about that to justify purchasing a whole machine. You know, I don't I don't know. This is such a weird future to, to, to hypothesize about. It's just so weird. I wonder, Alien. do we agree that it could begin with more explicit a la carte, either day and date sales or of legacy products? Because that that could be an interesting way to explore it. And I've said in the past, by the way, and you guys know that I think Sony should release a one or two of their big games as a services on Xbox and switch if possible. I think they should also oh, yeah. do it. Like, just yeah. be like, we're going to go just like with MLB, the show, we're going to actually try to get this going on everything and, and including mobile PC, like just try to get some of those games out and just see what happens when you put them out to everyone. Maybe not your most important product. So I think Sony should also do this. But I wonder if we agree that it would, might begin with more surprising a la carte offerings where. Yeah. And again, because could it be and I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Chris, but could it be that. With Activision, they're fully in the books now. And we talked about how Activision's profit margin is not huge. And mm-hmm. it would take it doesn't matter how long it would take them because Microsoft has so much money anyway. But it would take years and like decades for them to make all the money back that they spent on it at the current profit margin that they're running. Right. And I wonder if they look at it and say, like, this is so I already made the argument. We already know they have to continue to sell PlayStation versions of the game. And in fact, I would argue that their whole we're putting it on Switch is actually more for them than Switch fans because they realize how much money they need to make from this deal. Right. They need to broaden it out. And I wonder if that experience even nascently has said to them, well, wow, we could sell. How many more copies of Starfield will we have sold on PlayStation? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I was thinking specifically, like, I wonder if Starfield might be that a la carte thing. You know what I mean? I, I was like, hey, in order to test, if we're going to play with the idea of getting Game Pass on PlayStation, let's let's test the water, see how much how much of this game can we sell straight up over there? Like how many people over there are even interested in something like this? Um, because they did the experiment of, of keeping it, you know, completely exclusive. And I think it was an experiment in, in just to see how, how it would affect console sales and to see if it would drive. And, and it turns out, I mean, I'm sure it did in some way, but not, not to the degree that I think it needed to. And so you have to wonder, yeah, I think, I think there's, I think Starfield has a pretty high chance, high likelihood of ending up on, playstation at, at the very least game pass is another thing it's just so confusing to to, to imagine that because like you said earlier about like the, the oh y- oh I, I understand the the bespoke nature of like a a very selective game pass but ideally you'd want it to be pretty uniform yeah i think that it's ideal for microsoft and i also think it's a unique sort of capitulation right if from a corporate standpoint it's like yeah we'll give you exactly what it is that will fit perfectly on your platform without ever hurting you at all. Like there's no compromise in that. And I think that that's too much too. I don't know. Isn't it? I don't know. Maybe you guys aren't as fascinated by this, but I am deeply fascinated by this. This seems like a sea change sort of situation where Mm -hmm. we we don't have to hypothesize. It's like you're, you're getting metric readings that, oh, there's an earthquake coming. But now like the ground is kind of shaking a little bit like, oh, 
Like we, yeah, the no, readings totally. were kind of right. It actually is happening. And it's, I am interested to see how it all plays out and what the strategy is. And what my whole thing is, 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 is it, is it Sony stopping this from happening? And the answer is probably yes. I mean, ultimately Sony is the arbiter, but they have mm-hmm. to probably really game it out very, very seriously with very, very smart people to figure out how this would actually work for them and how it affect. Remember, they're very reliant on PS plus too. PS plus is a huge, they're not re- announcing numbers anymore. I think because as we all know, COVID kind of spiked all of these numbers and it's the same thing with game pass too. And um, so we, we don't know these numbers specifically, but these are good pieces of just latent revenue comes in every month. They just need yeah. to figure out how to make them work maybe in harmony. I don't know, man, but it's going to be an interesting philosophical economic corporate conversation moving forward. And I don't know. I mean, outside of Halo and Gears, I, I personally don't even, I would really have to sit and think about which games I'd even want to play. Uh, and it's no offense to that stuff. I just mm-hmm. played a lot of the stuff back in the day that I would have wanted to play or whatever. But I think for a lot well, of people, have- yeah. You'd have future dooms and future Wolfensteins and, and future stuff that doesn't exist yet that could potentially, you know, peak the interest. It's 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 all kind of hypothetical, I guess, because I mean, the whole conversation is hypothetical, mm-hmm. but I don't know, man. I, I it really breaks my brain trying to imagine this future, <laughs> like tr- like really trying to concretely imagine like myself in 2027 or whatever, being like, OK, <laughs> let's launch up Game Pass on the PlayStation Store. It, it it's so fucking strange yeah it's it feels like the sega moment doesn't it yeah yeah totally as you guys were saying earlier like there's something mm-hmm. about it and also sega and microsoft share a history together going all the way back to the dreamcast and the original xbox yeah. so there is that and so there is some sort of legacy there but i i don't know how i feel about it either as like a PlayStation fan and someone who has covered PlayStation professionally for so many years, Xbox is oh, and not my PlayStation fan. I've always been there because, of course, it came out in 2001. But as a person writing about games professionally, it's always been there. And I don't know. I think that it's kind of a bummer that Microsoft doesn't want to try to make it work in a more traditional fashion. But I think that, Dustin, you made the point that they they just don't care, right? Like they just want money. And that is obvious and totally realistic. Uh, that's nature. And so they just are like, well, however we get the money. We, And I think that that's just a bummer for your more traditional console gamers. Like I'd be heartbroken if that happened with PlayStation, you know, yeah. not that PlayStation puts games on other platforms, but showed that they had no commitment to PlayStation as a piece of hardware anymore. And be, or we're going to become a kind of agnostic entertainment company. I'd be like, I need to find a different place to play your games now. And that's weird. It would be a whole change of pace because I've been on PlayStation since the nineties, you know, and for a lot of people that are on Xbox, it's probably a similar thing where it's like, hopefully this doesn't shake things up too much and where there's still hardware to play on if that's where you want to play. I don't want it to be economics is so destructive and I don't know that it can be any other way, but it's. There's something interesting about this, you know, about the this announcement or this it's not an announcement, but this this com- this conversation flagging um, all the different hardware decreases and pushing hard like hardware decreases when your big games are coming out it's a strange time and uh i didn't expect to talk about it again so soon especially because i know so many people get you're like stop talking about xbox it's like well now well, i mean like what do you want me to do now man you know yeah so we'll leave it there interesting to see if this is the, indeed the sega moment but it might just be not now but maybe like the the little domino right mm-hmm in my favorite meme okay let's see and thank you for everyone writing in about that as well i know god we got so many write-ins about that (laughs) all right i was curious what you guys thought of this this comes from video games chronicle as well wonderful website sega says creative assembly will return to genres it's known best it knows best i'm sorry after hyena's cancellation And the story reads, quote, Sega has said Creative Assembly will go back to working on the genres it knows best following the decision to cancel Hyenas. The Japanese publisher announced in September that it was canceling the multiplayer shooter and some unannounced titles under development in Europe following at least six years of development on the project. Developer Creative Assembly has has suggested the game was canceled due to ambitious plans and high competition in the multiplayer space. However, during a financial results briefing presentation held this month, Sega Sammy Holdings president and group CEO Haruki Satomi stated that the developer was working on a genre it didn't know well enough, 
resulting in the game's cancellation and a number of redundancies. Quote, each studio has its own strengths and weaknesses, but the favorable wins of the early COVID-19 period, coupled with the strong performance of each title, led us to adopt the strategy of accelerating more, even in areas where their studios have not tried yet further growth. However, some studios did well and some did not. So we have decided to focus again on the strengths of each studio. To put it simply, Creative Assembly was good at offline games in the RTS genre, but they took on the challenge of developing Hyenas, an online game in the FPS genre. However, although the game itself was good, we decided to cancel the development of Hyenas because we did not think it would reach a quality that would satisfy our users when we considered whether we could really operate this as a competitive online game for a long period of time, end quote. Dustin, it sounds like another game, doesn't it? Uh, with mm. maybe factions in some sense. Although I think a lot of people would argue that Naughty Dog has a has a deep provenance of making good online functionality in games. But it just sounds, again, like making sure things are right. Are, are developers, or I shouldn't say developers, are publishers finally starting to get it? That you can't continue to put these things, these the developer, you can't just take from all these different columns and say, I want this developer to make this kind of game with this sort of saleability and this timeline. It's like, no, these guys make this kind of game like this in this style. This is what they do. They're like a band that makes music. Mm -hmm. And you don't just say like, oh, I want Rage Against the Machine to play, you know, country Western music. It, it doesn't. So are they fine? Are they going to get it now that they're wasting so much time and energy and money letting these guys chase half baked products? And this goes Anthem was like the canary in the coal mine. Anthem is just like the beginning Battleborn. Even these were like just early examples of this. What do you think? I think this is a lot worse than the battleborn and anthem situation just because with like take anthem specifically they uh bioware had at least some experience making a even just a third person shooter right with something like mass effect you're changing it and making it more of a you know service game but they there's that you know famous quote or story or whatever where they didn't even look at anything else going on. They refused to even acknowledge destiny as a product and learn from it. So the the case with hyenas though, is that I think about, I personally like seeing developers adapt, take on new things to a degree that makes sense. You gotta, you gotta hop from one step to another. You know, you can't just, the thing with hyenas is that you take an RTS offline studio and then not only put them in an entire different genre that is many steps removed from a game that you'd normally play with, like, you know, an overhead game where you're commanding different, um, you know, armies and stuff. But you're taking, first of all, making it FPS, which already that would be a huge jump, but also making a type of game that even players that are seasoned like Bioware, where they kind of made less of a jump, still didn't succeed. So it's a matter of degree of understanding how many jumps you can take. And particularly that live service jump, even if you are ready to go, you might still fail. So hopefully there is some degree where it's like, okay, well, if we're going to do this, we got to make sure it's a team that makes sense to do it. And at least has the background in gameplay, but also is willing to adapt and learn to what a live service game needs. Like I said, the, the thing with creative assembly is that if the, if the success is, or if change is like you're hopping along different stones, they hopped, they tried to do a jump that was too far initially. And you got to make those steps kind of like you've said with Lilymo, you guys didn't want to immediately jump into making an RPG. You needed to kind of figure a lot of things out. You can't just go straight there. So hopefully this is at least the beginning of some change where people start to realize this. Um, Chris, do you have anything you'd like to add about this? I, I just feel like this is become becoming more and more notable. Like just, just let these teams make the games that they want to make and stop. I like, I don't want to say stop, like, because there's a creative element to this too, from the studios where they think they can do it. And it's like, there's, there's gotta be this end of the hype, like self hyping each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah all the way up the chain. Yeah. At some point someone says like, I don't know, man. Like, have you looked out there on the, on the market and seen? What right. we're going to compete with? I don't know that we need you guys to make this game. If we, if you want to yeah. make a bet, make a bet with like a, a real player 
that can do it, in my opinion. But what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I don't think I don't I don't have a lot of faith that this is necessarily an industry learning. I think this is probably just one, you know, it's it's this feels much very much more like an exception than the rule going forward. It feels like, OK, they they know <laughs> they know what they should do, but that does, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to trickle down to other publishers necessarily. But I mean, yeah, they, it was this whole thing was really poorly thought out. I mean, like Dustin's really spot on with the with the jumping illustration mm-hmm. where it's just i mean dude even destiny like even bungie went from a first person shooter to an, a first person shooter and the only difference was live service and even that was like really really rough for them so the idea of going from a an rt a, an offline rts to a a live service fps is insane um and even even something like uh go- with gorilla going from kills onto horizon i mean that's 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 a big jump but it's still in the same realm you know it's it's still real time you know, combat, it's still shoot that you're, it is still a shooter in some way. So like, I, I don't know. You, you really need to know what the hell you're doing. And, and they maybe just gave them too long of a leash. I don't, I don't really know what the development of hyenas really entailed because it just seemed, it's confusing to me because from what I've seen of the gameplay of it, it doesn't, it looks like it plays okay. It just looks like everything else is wrong. <laughs> it just looks like they kind of screwed everything else up. And the the idea that they were like, okay, we it, we evaluated it and we we started to think about, you know, how how could we support this game in the future? And we realized that that would be really hard for us, so we're going to cancel it. It's like, how was that not one of the first conversations you had? You're going into live service games, and 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 this is one of the last things you realized that you were that this is going to take many many years of maintenance and upkeep and support just baffling like I, I really just don't understand what the hell happened here or how it even got this far far along in the first place and you know um hopefully this means c- good things for sega going forward because I, i'm sure they learned something but i don't know if oh, i don't I'm know sure, i feel I'm like sure they spent still... a lot of money on that game <laughs> yeah well dude i'm sure he, yeah here's another analogy i just thought of imagine if colin the boss of the company comes to to me and says, Dustin, you're really good at making videos for Last Stand. Uh, I want you, I'm, I'm going to give you a lot of money, a lot of money, and I expect you to do well, and you're going to make a feature film for Last Stand. Uh, you're going to hire all the actors, you're going to write the script, you're going to edit it, do all the special effects, and we need it to make money. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I may be qualified to do a lot of production stuff, but I can't just jump over to making something completely different. Maybe if I we started by making a documentary, maybe we made a short film that we didn't expect to make money on. You can't just in any kind of professional saying you can't just expect to do something completely different that you're not ready to do. Why would you bet so highly on that? It's just stupid. Yeah, there's also a element and again i talk about this a lot lately and we'll talk about it again in the inquiries at the end of the show but just the heavily the heavy commoditization of games it's so it's so disgustingly shrewd to say we spent six years making this and we are going to disappear it now because we don't think we can make any money on it or we can make it take a series of write-offs on taxes on expenses paid into the game to try to make some of the money back because it's it, to me I, I i appreciate that i know that these companies have to do what they have to do to survive but especially with them admitting that it came a lot a lot of the headiness came from covid it's like how did all these companies misread what was so obvious about that period that people were more connected on psn and people were more connected on xbox live and all these things because there was nothing else to do because everyone was trapped inside because there was nowhere to go because how did they not know that the second that things went back to normal, that they would lose X percent of the money right. and the revenue and also the opportunity on the market. All those people just went away. There's, you can't even cater to them anymore. That's the way it goes. How did you not know that that was going to happen? This is the same reason. Like they couldn't help themselves but to announce all these amazing game, not so much Game Pass, even but PS Plus numbers and then be like, oh, now, now we can never talk about numbers again. Because when, even just, you know, <laughs> even just upscaling on on like staff and stuff like that, like there are just these crazy hiring bonuses that happen around that time because they just assume that that would that would be oh, it's the new normal now. And now you're seeing all these layoffs as a result of that kind of like dwindling away. And it's like, well, how did you not expect this to happen? COVID's headwinds were, crazy. were just temporary. We all knew that unless it was going to be the, the, the plague to end all plagues like we were people were going to come back and not. We people like me were kind of unaffected because I'm a homebody anyway, but 
people that have normal lives and normal jobs and normal situations, they're going to be like, okay, well, I'm not going to subscribe to PS Plus anymore. I don't know. That's a more of a general observation, but it kind of goes into this where it's like, you know, based on COVID and blah, blah, blah. It's like, man, it's just such a, such a waste of time and resources. And I, you know who I really feel bad for? The devs. Because when you think about a career spent in game dev, you might, let's say you spend, I mean, 30 years in it, right? which is kind of conservative, but let's say 30 years, that could be one of the five games you get to make. And it's not even going to come out. Right. It, 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 I don't know, dude, that's rough. So I feel for them, but that's just the way it goes. And it sucks for studios to be pigeonholed. And I think that they need to be able to make risks and, or take risks and, and, and make bets. But like, yeah, I think it's a perfect analogy too. like just, just one step at a time and learn as you go. And I think that Gorilla is a unique situation, if I'm being honest, because it's first party and they, it cost a lot of money to make that game. And it took them a lot of time, you know, like it wasn't right. Um, it wasn't overnight. Right. Exactly. Like it was. And they hired a bunch of people that knew how to do it, you know, um, right. <laughs> yeah. Which which is also pretty important, like people directly from Obsidian, people directly from Bethesda, people like they got role playing game people and. I think that that's a unique advantage of not only having big spends on games, but getting 100 percent of the revenue back for them. No middlemen. That's always an important part of the equation when we're talking about first party sales and how much more important they are. When you sell five million copies of Spider-Man, that's much more significant than selling five million copies of Elden Ring. Because the money made goes all to one company, it's not split. And so um, and again, that even ties back unintentionally, but ties back to our Xbox conversation and why they want to extract more money out of that as well. Guys, I was curious if you saw this next story. Just something to keep an eye on. I thought it was interesting. Um, Bloober team released a weird statement. So Bloober team, of course, longtime horror studio. We all know in Poland. They released a statement. They're making Silent Hill 2's remake, of course, and they say, quote, as Bloober team, We are proud to be a part of Konami's plans for the Silent Hill franchise. Alongside our partner, we are diligently working to ensure the Silent Hill 2 remake attains the highest quality. On behalf of our development team, we would like to clarify that the production is progressing smoothly and and in accordance with our schedule. We understand that many players around the world are eagerly anticipating news about the game, and we appreciate your dedication. However, we kindly ask for a bit more patience. Once Konami, as the game's publisher, shares more information, we are confident that the wait will be worthwhile. Thank you for your understanding and support. So some people thought I was like, okay, that's interesting. What is that? It's clearly said without Konami's permission, probably. And Konami itself is not a very well-respected entity anymore in hardcore games anyway, and they don't release many statements. So that's in and of itself, I wouldn't have reported on that. But I thought this was interesting. And this comes from Push Square. They said, quote, Silent Hill 2, when it was announced by Polish developer Bloober Team, seemed like it was pretty close to completion, but it's honestly been eons since we got an update on the game's st- release status. That's understandably led to nonstop questions from fans who are eager to revisit the mysterious town and come face to face with Pyramid Head once more. And so what I realized in reading the story is that this tweet didn't come out of nowhere. That days before Bloober Team responded to someone, so someone tweeted at them and said, when could we expect to get some news on the remake or is that up to Konami? It's kind of hard, hard to be stuck in the fog for over a year with nothing new. Even some screenshots would be nice. And Bloober Team at that time said, quote, Konami is the publisher of the game and communication is definitely part of their job. End quote. Just something to keep an eye on here. I don't think there's any acrimony, maybe, but this seems kind of strange to me. Uh, mm-hmm. Dustin, what's your read on on this? Is there a problem here? Something to keep in mind. We can't say this for certain, but uh, Blue Root Team is a Polish team. And so there might be a little bit of, I don't know, maybe and maybe their social person is not uh, from Poland. Maybe they are English speaking to some degree, but there could be some reading into this where they could have worded it in a way that didn't come off as passive aggressive as they did. It was like unintentionally passive aggressive. Um, I, I would say that they probably realized that they came off as passive aggressive and that's why they released this follow-up statement. But I, it does seem probably like they're maybe getting a little frustrated at this point that they want to talk about it more. The environment we're in now online is just that 
fans are so fucking annoying and stupid that they go <laughs> and harass people and tweet at them constantly. People yeah. there, de- when are you going to say more about this? It's like, dude, this is some dev's personal account. Let him tweet about his fucking lasagna or something. Like his, right, just that's how whatever. We learned, that's how we learned that Factions was still in development was because the director tweeted something and then said, please just leave me alone. Like it's, I'm still working on it or whatever. <laughs> right. Okay. So I'd imagine this is happening to them too, to some degree. So Konami is weird though. So I, I'm positive that there's probably weirdness going on there, but I'm not reading into this. Konami is the publisher of the game and communication is definitely part of their job. Maybe another way you could word this is they're the publisher and that's up to them or that's part of their job. And maybe again, language barrier. Chris, what do you think? Is there more here or is there something to keep an eye on? I don't know. It seems, it seems strange to me that they would, I, I guess to me, the only thing that's weird about it is the long silence. But if if that is Konami's job, then it doesn't strike me as that surprising because Konami's been a little bit out of practice for a little while. Hasn't been great with certain things. Even even the MGS um, the collection that should have been a shoe in wasn't wasn't really well communicated either. If you remember, if you remember them talking about how uh, th- what is it they they weren't really clear about like the frame rates and like. A lot of these other things about Metal Gear Solid One when they first were started talking about it, and people had to really kind of dig around and, and kind of read between the lines on a lot of certain things, and a lot, a lot of people still didn't really know what was up until until the game came out. Dude, that game has that the digital version of that game has disc read errors, which is awesome. But I don't know if you guys saw that video, but I heard about that. <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know. Crazy. I don't know exactly what happened. It's it's not, it's 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 pretty crazy, but. Yeah, I don't know, man. Konami, I, I'm not reading that into. I'm not reading super hard into into Bloober Team's response or, or what they're saying. I, I I do think though that this is probably a little bit of damage control or not necessarily damage control, but like they probably are aware that it's been a while since it, since they've said anything and people are starting to notice and people are starting to like talk about it and you know they're responding to criticism on Twitter about it where it's like, hey, listen, this is Konami's job and and so maybe they're just like, hey, listen, you know, I, I don't think there's that much of a story here. Um, I'm also honestly not really that concerned. I, I really feel like this is probably going to be good. Like, I'm not really worried. I know people have like concerns about Bloober Team working on it, but I really I just don't see how they're going to fuck it up because it's just it's just the second game again. Yeah, the blueprints there. You know what I mean, like the blueprints there, like I can't imagine them fucking it up, really. Uh, I agree. So and just, if they're eager to talk about it, I, I think that shows a little bit of confidence. And people do think that we or uh, and or others are too hard on Bloober team that they've had some successes. And I understand that too, but this is a, I would argue, and I haven't played very many of their games. Like they do layers of fear, right? Or layer of fear or whatever. I played mm-hmm. that. And, and and they have layers of fears, layers of, <laughs> I think they changed. Someone told me recently <laughs> that they stepped away from layers of fears, probably because we made fun of it too hard. <laughs> Let's we see. Specifically. We, yeah. Um, they really, layers, that's awesome. Layers of fear. <laughs> I don't know. Out of there, out of the name. Well, there's something else I wanted to say as a postscript here. Curtis yeah. Edwards wrote in, said, greetings, Slitty Headman. Oh, man. Uh, hey. Wait, what? It happened again. It's Slitty Headman. Oh. <laughs> you want me to hold them to account, you're saying? Yeah, we yep. said that if they if they if they brought up Slitterhead in any way, they're not getting red. And you let it go by yeah, the gold. Look, right. to be f- listen, listen, two weeks on, in a row. Right. To be fair, right. it's a. It's been a long time. B. I'm genuinely curious what the fuck is going on with Slitterhead at this point. Yeah. So like, I've actually like what the, it, it has been a long time. Uh, listen, I'm gonna that, bridge. I'm gonna okay. bridge the rule retroactively and say like, let's. I want you to try not to say it. Right. If you really, if something inside of you is like, really, 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 really got to say it. I'm not going to stop you, I guess, you know? Mm. Yeah, just save it. Save it for when it's re-revealed. Tell right. you that much. We'll give you we'll give you a little we'll give you some leeway when when, it, when they show it again. It'll be we'll call that but. episode Slitterhead Mania. Yeah, and exactly. It'll be just that. Curtis <laughs> Edwards says, curious to get everyone's thoughts on the Bloober team post about Silent Hill 2. I can't help but think it's a response to the absolute mess Ascension has been. I've been catching some people playing it in quotes on Twitch. And I think we would be entering the ninth circle of hell if more publishing gaming publishers decided that this would be the direction to go with their IP. Have you guys looked into this at all? I've seen things in passing. What is going? I think there was even a theory that it was like AI generated and then they had to come out and say it wasn't or something. I, I don't know what's going on. Chris, you nodded. Yes. So let's go to you first. 
Well, yeah, no, it's it's this weird like I don't know. Dustin was nodding too, so he's seen it too. But like, what? what how would you describe? It? It's like a uh, TV show that like you interact with, kind of. So and there's like points. I haven't seen it personally, but if you listen to Sacred Symbols Plus tomorrow with Gene and Jimmy and I, it's a big topic of discussion because both of them know a lot more about it than I do. But yeah, it's right. uh, apparently it's just written really poorly. It doesn't understand Silent Hill to any degree, like what's good about it. There's also really awkward tone and emotional changes apparently where it's like someone will be killing somebody and then having a casual conversation seconds later or something so yeah it's not a not very good not a good way to bring back the ip yeah to start it, to kick yeah, things it, off it really does feel like it's barely a video game like I, I, like i remember looking at there was like a post game screen or something for like a level and there were all these like fake currencies and and it's just like what the fuck is going on are there like upgrade trees with with like microtransaction elements and silent hill ascension what the fuck is getting and what oh also by the way what is what is it with ascension being like a really like being a a, a subtitle for like really not great like god <laughs> yeah like it's it's the second your game is called Ascension, I feel like it should be like an immediate like, oh, man, this is it's not going to be good. Uh, yeah, good. Doesn't one other thing. It's very important. I think you're going to like this, Colin. Mm. Apparently, a lot of people were uh, like spamming the same thing in chat over and over to get it pinned. Uh, the thing they were spamming was Hideo Kojima coming in my tummy. And eventually that got like pinned <laughs> on the page. Could Hideo Kojima come me in my tummy? So, <laughs> That's so it's something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is something to think about. Thank you. That is, in, in fact, That's so oh, man, I don't gross. know. Here's my question, he's a, though, is he's got a cummy ache. Oh, oh poor guy. No. It's gross. You So you can say anything on there and it gets pinned automatically. Apparently yeah. they figured out that cummy was not in the filter <laughs> and so why that's why that one uh, <laughs> why would it be <laughs> you know, some guy who are like what could people possibly say here and then thinking oh yeah cummy we should probably get that out of there <laughs> yeah i'm trying to find like a screenshot of the hideo kojima coming in my tummy yeah put that in here if you can moment. find it if i can find it but here i want to just to veer back towards the more serious for a moment what i really want to know about with with the Konami is like, what the fuck is wrong with them? What don't you get? <laughs> it's a good question. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You you don't understand how to do this. Like you just forgot completely how to do it. And, and it's like you invest money and you take time and you get involved with talented people and you make a good game. If this is the well, future of Castlevania on games, just leave it alone. Leave it alone. Well, dude, they, they definitely did forget. I mean, how long has it been since they've even been in this industry? You have to imagine that the people who are really good at Konami at that type of thing have long since left. Yeah, you're right. Or they fired right? them. <laughs> or, they fi or they fired them or they or they killed them. Yeah, they, or they just yeah, their bodies them the are buried. Front. Yeah. 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 So, like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I this is I mean, Silent Hill Ascension and the way they treated the Metal Gear collection. I, I understand that some people are OK with it. I understand that. It's not as catastrophic as it could have been for sure, but I still feel like it deserved a little bit more reverence. It deserved a little bit more care than than what they put into it. I mean, it's, it's funny because like even the loading screens of that game have like the the uh, the the blue point loading screens in there. So it's got like the the logo from the previous. game. It's just. I don't know. It, well, that, that's Konami's whole... really out of practice in a way that yeah. I don't imagine is very speaks very uh, it doesn't bode well. I'll put it that way. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. I think that a lot of people did bail and they fired so many people and got rid of so many people too over time, not only from Metal Gear and, and Kojima's team, but from Iga and Iga's team too. So like their yeah. two most talented teams gutted. Iga's just dancing on their grave at this point with the quality <laughs> of some of the products that have been coming out, and especially um, God, Bloodstained so good. I love Bloodstained. And, and the, the, the two 8-bit style Bloodstained games are so fucking dope oh my god i love those games so much the any create ones well they're all any create games i guess so 
I think we, yeah, that's just a question I want to ask. I don't know if you have any recollection here of, of or anything you want to say, Dustin. I, I just feel like it's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Don't don't you understand how even if you don't have the endemic knowledge anymore in your company, you look around. I mean, look, look, how did other companies do it? Why don't you treat everything with the same reverence? Because I've given Konami their flowers when I've said that some of their collections have been very good actually over time and that they've really been decent stewards of some really dope games, you know, um, from the past, like with their Castlevania collections and their Contra collection and all the rest, like they're good. They're really good. But then you come to things like Metal Gear. It's like, okay, cool. Metal Gear. Right, right, great. And then they just like, it's like a fucking fart. And I I don't, I just don't know why they do that. Uh, Why wouldn't you spend the money to do it right? It's the same thing with this kind of, I'm, this kind of weird Metal Gear Solid 3 remake. It's like, yeah, what is yeah. what is this? What are you doing? I want to see more. I think it looks pretty good, but why are you fucking... Do you have any idea how many studios would have fallen all over themselves to have anything to do with that? Like, I know Konami did this thing a couple of years ago because we, we talked about it where people are able to pitch them on them. Like, they're, they basically have opened up... Remember when they released a document of all of their IP and were like, you can pitch us on any of these games. And... yeah. I'm sure that studios large and small have pitched Konami on all sorts of things. And I would imagine you would hope that they would be like, oh, any creates or way forward and Castlevania. Oh, okay. And you would hope with Metal Gear, you would be like, you think maybe someone like now, maybe you don't want to step on any toes, but you know, an IO or something like that would be the right studio for Metal Gear if you wanted it or got and imagine this guys. Imagine this if Metal Gear just stopped. Oh, whoa. That'd be pretty wild. Mm. And they made, Mm. and this is going to be the really crazy part. They made something new. You know, that's a possibility (sighs) where you can make your own rules, make your own universe. I just thrown it out there. And Castlevania, they've done a really good job. And this is, again, the, the, the fucking yin and the yang. It's like, yeah. why are the Netflix, why are the Netflix Castlevania show so good? They're not like good. Mm-hmm. They're like really like well-respected vastly beyond anything Konami has done in years. And they didn't do yeah, it. They're just allowing it to be ha- to happen, of course. But so yeah. the same production pipeline internally that gives you that farts this shit out. And uh, I think that that's really <sighs> confusing. So moving on. Just a couple more things to get through in these news, uh, smaller news items, my friends. Games Industry App is reports U.S. kids want game subscriptions and virtual currency more than games this Christmas. It says, quote, a report by the Entertainment Software Association has found that 72 percent of children in the U.S. want games related products for Christmas. So that's good news. But only 22 percent have asked for physical games. I don't care so much about that. So of 500 plus children surveyed ages 10 to 17, quote, subscriptions were the most popular gift idea, 39 percent. Followed closely by consoles, 38%, game accessories, 32%, and in-game currency, 29%. Surprisingly, only 22% of the children surveyed wanted physical games this Christmas. Um, does this mean anything, Dustin? This is very really interesting to me. I, I, um, it's not so much the physical games thing that matters, because that's going to happen one way or the other. People want, obviously, digital currency, but you would think that the, the in-game or digital currency would be higher, and it's actually third. Gaming accessories. People want gaming accessories more, but they want subscriptions the most. So what does this mean? This is a good good sign for Game Pass, I assume, and potentially PlayStation Plus. Although I imagine this includes many other things like GTA online or Fortnite mm-hmm. subscriptions or whatever that you can get season passes and all the yeah. rest. So I don't really think it means what we might think it means. Yeah, and I kind of wish that the data was more specific about subscription versus virtual currency because those are two totally different things one of them means that kids are wanting to spend money in live service games or i guess you know i i guess you could argue that certain certain single player or multiplayer games that aren't live service that have currencies but most likely it's something like fortnite roblox whatever uh and subscriptions mean something completely different whether it's game pass or ea play or whatever something like that um but yeah, it's not surprising. I mean, when I am at my like this last uh, family gathering I was at for Thanksgiving, it's like those kids all like Roblox and 
Fortnite. And so, yeah, it would make sense that that's what they're into. And it's sad thinking about that because I I've thought about this with my little cousins. I was like, man, I was playing so many games and I know this is just like you always think that the way you did it was better. I'm not it's not obli- I'm not oblivious to that, but I think about how many cool games I experienced when I was their age that I cherished forever those experiences and i just think about oh they're just playing Fortnite, and i'm sure that'll be a great memory because there's games like that that i played that are great memories but when i think about that being one of the only primary thing for so many years for certain kids don't you get bored with that don't you want to play something else yeah i don't get it man do you want a good story do you want i don't know it's it's very very it's, it's very foreign to me. I, don't, I'm, I mean, I'm sure they're going to grow up and be saying this, saying what I'm saying about, yeah, well, yeah. why don't the kids just want to play something like Fortnite? Instead, they're, you know, doing something else. It's always, you know, going to be something else. Yeah. I, you could kind of say the same thing about, I mean, you think about kids who play like sports, right? You know what I mean? Where it's like, it's, there's only like a handful of, of, of sports that are really like common for kids to play. And, and a lot of times they kind of specialize in one and it's like, how, how can you play football for that, that many years? You know what I mean? It's like, well, what do you mean? It's just what, it's just what we play. And I feel like it's, it's gotta be a, a similar kind of mindset where it's like, yeah, we play Fortnite. It's also their social time too. That's kind of another th- aspect of it too. Cause I remember that being the case for, for Halo back in the day where that was, that was basically my social life was, was just going on and like talking to these people on, on that. Game. Oh Yeah. And I have to imagine mm-hmm. that that's a big component of it for it's less about playing Fortnite and more about, oh, let's hang while this kind of thing, while this game is kind of happening in the background. And so it makes sense that they would want to. It makes sense to me that they would hold that very, very highly as far as like a valuable thing to them, because I remember I remember I, I had the same thing to a lesser degree. I remember asking for I don't know if I would ask for it, but I remember I would get like Microsoft point cards like for like birthdays and Christmas. And I would always use them to buy like weird, like games on the, on the store, like uh, did the dishwasher and, mm. and super, and super meat. That Boy was a cool and, game. And those kinds of the dishwasher. I love the, I dude, I love this. There's so many obscure, like XBLA games that I really, I really miss. Are they available uh, still to play today? I don't think so. I haven't, I feel like I would have stumbled across it by now, but like maybe, mm. um, but those are, I don't know, man. I, I, I understand why, it would be such a high thing for like, or, or such a highly requested item for kids. Because I remember even back when I was a kid, I was asking for similar things. If, if not exactly the same, then just, you know, definitely the early uh, kind of like the zygote of what is currently, <laughs> currently very, uh, very common, you know? And they say, I have a hipster vocabulary. <laughs> is that, is that a hipster word? No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it's a hipster accurate, word is. Right? I have no idea. That was the whole point. That was, I can't do it again. Yeah. Let's not do it again. We'll, we'll, yeah. Let's just assuage this. All right. Just a few more things. I just wanted to bring this up. Kotaku points to this open letter that was written by the Game Awards future class members, 66 of them, apparently, that they demand acknowledgement of Gaza's human, so called humanitarian crisis. And I'm not saying so called, it is a humanitarian crisis, but that's what the Kotaku thing says is acknowledging Gaza's humanitarian crisis in quotes here. So I wanted to note that this letter, I don't even know how to put this. Can we just have anything without agitation, like on a constant basis towards a specific predictable political end at any Mm -hmm. given time in the industry? Can like what's going on over there is tragic. It's tragic from multiple angles. And I don't see why, the game awards has to have an acknowledgement of it for it yeah. to feel like people are showing or caring that they matter. These people are so tired and annoying. It's like, go play fucking goodbye volcano high and leave us alone. You know, I can't, this, I can't what, take it. All. I can't take what, it anymore. What you know? really confuses me is that the, do they not understand the premise of like, there's a time and place? No. Like, do you really want someone on stage being like what's happening in Gaza is a genocide and then cut to like a Doritos ad? Like, I just don't, I, I, I don't understand why you would want that. Like, I understand this is an important, this is, what's happening right now is 
undeniably super important. Like, absolutely. Which is why it should not be at the Game Awards. <laughs> That's kind of the main point. Like, uh, it's not going to benefit anybody. Hold on, Chris. Let me, let me read you what your direct response uh, in this letter. With the currency of the games industry, silence mm. is a message. Silence no, is yeah. tacit support. Silence is dehumanization of Palestinian lives. I read read right from the letter. Well, this is the thing is. This is my where I'm confused and where I feel like people of this ilk try to just wedge anything they can, like anything they can into where they are or what they're doing to make it relevant so that they can talk about it. It's so fucking obvious and it's obnoxious. And they say, quote, like many of our peers, we are appalled by the war crimes the Palestinian people are victims of. Only the Palestinian people apparently were victims. And we grieve the loss of so many civilian lives. Oh. Adding to that pain is the knowledge that our industry is playing a role in this. <laughs> Indeed, the genocide watch outlines that a crucial step to enable a genocide is the widespread dehumanization of its victims. Several game developers and journalists, including blah, 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 and many others have called out how, hu how a hugely influential games industry systematically produces works that dehumanize and vilify Muslims, Arabs, and the many brown and black people living in the regions of Southwest Asia and Northern Africa, end quote. What? Where? The what games? fuck are you talking about? What are you talking about? Yeah, like, what games are these? What are they playing? What? Five days in Fallujah? Or well, six like days Bush, in Fallujah? Like, Bush shootout? God, they in wish like it was five days in Fallujah. They got an extra day, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> what the... I, I don't even know what the, like this is what I'm talking about about wedging things in to make it seem like it has something to do with you and then you have something to say about it and you can wedge your politics into something and listen we all have our politics and we all have our points of view I have a point of view and Chris has a point of, point of view and Dustin has a point of view and sometimes those points are relevant and they come up on the show even outside of the subject matter we talk about because it's such a personal show and we talk for four or five hours every week with each other here right but generally speaking we try to keep it and I think we do a great job of it. I mean, we made an entirely different show so we can just totally be different on that show and do what we need to do there. Where it's like people come here for a certain reason, typically. And if we put a political opinion in, it should be relevant and germane to what we're talking about. Oh, an economic point of view or this game's about this subject matter or like the rumors about the new Call of Duty, for instance, is that it takes place in the Gulf War, which I think is fucking dope. And that's going to open up an entirely new can of worms about things to talk about that are political and that will be relevant to our show. But we don't have the litmus test thing going on and all that kind of stuff. And though what's going on right now in Gaza is horrifying and there are victims a galore on both sides, it's a horrible situation. And I said on Constellation that it's, I also think it's just, it's ho it seems just totally hopeless. Like it's something I don't even really want to talk about in my personal right. life, nonetheless yeah. on the show, because I'm just like, I don't know, man, like, you solve this problem with more violence. You create more terrorists. You have like it's this whole fucking disaster. It's a fucking mess. Jeff, Jeff Keeley is not going to solve these. That's really exactly right. I can tell you. I can tell you that much. Yeah, you might get no, close. No He's a nice guy. He's but. a nice guy. <laughs> maybe if they if, if they both just sat down with Jeff Keeley, maybe something could happen. But like, I don't think that's going to happen. I think. I don't know, man. It's frustrating too because like I don't even like disagree with the perspective. Like I think like I don't know. I, I do think. You know, th th there's an equivocation with this conflict that I think is like really like <laughs> just not accurate at all. But the but the Game Awards is not the place. It's not the place to talk about any of that stuff. You don't want to have like, oh, hey, world premiere Gaza. What the fuck? Do you want these things like separated by five minutes of airtime? Actually, and do you not think that would be a problem? Like, oh, my God. Like, OK, so they're talking about. Uh, the Gaza, the the conflict in Gaza, and what's happening there, and then it cuts to this huge marketing campaign. Like I just don't understand what people don't understand about the tone deafness of that, and how there's a there's a correct forum in which to go about these conversations, and the, it's just not the fucking place, man. Yeah, I agree with you, and I know that you and I probably don't see eye to eye on the entire thing. But that's also not relevant. Oh, probably not. Re that's probably yeah. not relevant. Well, it's <laughs> definitely not relevant to our show. And frankly, it's not important to me at all. Like we all I, in fact, I, I've come out saying like I have deep seated bias towards, you know, certain things because of where I grew up and how I grew up and the things that I right. learned. And I don't think that people should really 
be coming to me for news and information, like go to a different source. I don't even want to be that. That's the whole point. You know, I guess I'm trying to make is like, why do these people want to be a beacon for things that I don't give a flying fuck what the game awards future class thinks about anything. And I certainly don't think I care about what they think about the ongoing saga, you know, in Palestine going on for time of memorial, basically at this point. It's to your point, yeah. Chris, like it doesn't it just doesn't nothing's going to be solved by doing any. And and I really just want to say, like, quote, adding to the pain is the knowledge that our industry is playing a role in this. End quote. That is such horseshit that I can't even believe that people with a serious and somber face wrote it. And then that all of these thousands of people from the industry signed it because that is fucking yeah, like it, bullshit. Yeah. That is such bullshit. If anything, video games have been a binding agent for people's going back decades. If anything, entertainment and video games break down barriers and show people different cultures and introduce people to players around the world and all these different things. And of course, it breeds hatred and contempt in some corners. Of course, it does. But generally speaking, I think it's been a force for like obvious good. And to just to to just demean it like that so that you can wedge in your political point of view, your very narrow political point of view for this very specific situation. Oh, I can't believe it. It's such and it's such bullshit. Get systematically produces works that dehumanize and vil- vilify Muslims, Arabs, and the many brown and black people living in the regions of Southwest Asia and Northern Africa. Like I literally, dude, I've been doing this professionally for years and years. I have no fucking idea what you're talking about. None. Maybe this is yeah, happening I, somewhere I, in like the like bowels of steam or something because I I have no fucking clue what you're talking about. Yeah, none. I, I feel like I, I genuinely feel like this is this is an article that is ripped out of like a like a time that is not like i'm sure that was absolutely i'm sure there were games that were a little like very very like one-sided or very very you know insensitive with the way that they portrayed certain people it's like for sure but like i don't i i can't remember the last time i experienced that in my adult life like i just straight up can't like maybe the original call of duty games weren't as like you know uh (laughs) as well-rounded as they could have been or something you know what i mean but I, literally like what game is that is, is is it horizon spider-man dude the, the god of war dude the literally hey, hey, in my opinion halo psychonauts what game what, what game are you talking about correct me if i'm wrong I, correct me if i'm wrong other than six days in fallujah which is not even out yet we're going to talk about it a little later it's in early access or whatever the last right, games right. that i honest to christ remember there being a big racial hullabaloo about was resident evil 5 so that was what 13 years ago and right yeah that's right and bioshock infinite which was 10 years ago and both of those hullabaloo's were nonsensical but that's literally the last time i I remember that even being a conversation so i when i say i literally have no fucking idea what you're talking about i mean it and yeah i'm disconnected from many things in games and i don't know everything of course but i feel like i would know have some sense of what it is you are talking about when you use the word systematically dehumanize it produces works that dehumanize and vilify a group of people and that the knowledge in the uh, that our industry is playing a role in what's going on in palestine it doesn't make any sense no other than a wedge pol- political issue that's literally it dude there's there's no citation either there's like you you think if they if if this was such a systemic issue you would have examples you would have like no shortage of like here's a list of every game that came out last year or this year even that proves that this system exists there's a lot of systemic issues in in the world, but to, to to act like this is like a genuine problem, like oh yeah, the game industry, the games industry, the games industry <laughs> is is systematically creating works of fiction that demean people of different cultures systemically. Where? Show it. You must have examples. You must be thinking of something as you're saying this. So what are you thinking of? This is baffling. This is baffling. This is baffling from the perspective of somebody who probably agrees with the general sentiment of the core of what they're talking about. I cannot fathom what they're talking about here as far as like what they're referencing, like what they're where the systemic issues are, why the game awards is is the, the venue that this is appropriate for makes no fucking sense. None of it. Yeah, this is just I don't know, man. I don't. Place and time. You said it perfectly. Place and time. And understanding the gravity of this situation, it 
and it, <laughs> I've said it so many times recently. It's it's the most complicated situation I can literally ever think of geopolitically. It, it there's no there's nothing good to say about it. There's no good solution, and it's hard. It's a horrible thing. Like, why mm-hmm. is it not okay to have a moment to escape that, or to also acknowledge that? And I don't want to be too reductive, but one of the things that could tie a Palestinian and an Israeli together, or a person in Gaza and a person in Tel Aviv together, is their love of game or their love of play. You know, uh, things that competition, all those kinds of things. I just we are not the, and I don't mean we certainly are not the problem, but we as an industry and we as a as a niche are not the problem. I hate yeah. to tell you this, and for some reason. <laughs> The games industry itself is the one that brings the most ire in on itself. It's not even the people that play the games. It's the same thing with like Gamergate back in the day where this was so self-manufactured by people in the industry about an industry like a shadow industry that doesn't really exist and didn't really represent the full texture of any of it and then made it seem like it's this place where horrible things happen. So then it's easier to scapegoat it. And uh I think this is just strange. Like if you want to talk about this so bad future class game awards, future class, go write a, go to fucking get your master's degree and write a, a dissertation about it. Yeah, that would be where it own. would be appropriate and where someone would care. Silence yeah. is a uh, remember though. Silence is tacit support. Whatever you say. <sighs> These are like the last people I need to be judging me or t- telling me about anything. Please. All right. A couple more things. Just thought this was interesting. In CD Projekt's recent financials, they released Q3 2023 earnings. And it's noted that um, 20% of people that played Cyberpunk 2077 or owned it bought Phantom Liberty. So 4.3 million people bought it. Game sold at launch. It's pretty nice attach rate. And it was it's interesting, too. They show it here graphically, but it looks like half of the entire studio is now on to the new Witcher game codename Polaris. And um, it looks like more will be joining that team shortly. And they have, it looks like 10 different teams going of different varying sizes. So just wanted to make note of that. We look forward to seeing more from CD Projekt. And finally, uh, I wanted to ask you, Chris, about this. Destiny 2, the final shape gets a release date. So it was reported after all the hullabaloo and the 9 or 8% reduction in workforce that this was going to be pushed out a little bit further than it was initially intended. And they did acknowledge that now with a release date of June 4th, 2024. I was curious if you have any thoughts on this. I don't know, man. It, it's it's Des- Destiny's been in such a weird place for a while, and especially af- after these layoffs, which is absolutely like the reason why this is happening. It, I, I don't like the idea that it's like, oh, we're delaying it because we want to put more polish into it. It's like, well, you're delaying it because you've got rid of a lot of people and you need more time. It's not <laughs> it's not like out of the goodness of your own heart. Like, I get it. You don't have to. I, I, you don't have to sugarcoat the language. You you could just say like, hey, yeah, you know, like we're delaying it because we lost a lot of people. It's fine. Like that that would be transparent and honest. I don't know. I haven't played Destiny two in a while, largely because just this game, this year has been just so, just so chock full of uh, just amazing titles that I just haven't really made time for it. So I'm a little detached from the community right now. I'm a little detached from what the player sentiment is. I know that there's currently like there's currently a big hullabaloo about this. Um, there is some uh, special package thing that comes with in-game ornaments that you know they're charging for. Yeah, and they the re- didn't they announce that they changed that or whatever that they. Yeah, but I something. think they walked back on it too, and and so like I don't, they're. If it, I get the sense that they're kind of on fire over there in in, in some way, um, and they're just trying to really weather <laughs> this crazy storm. But I mean, I, I'm still curious about the final shape when it comes out i'll definitely probably pop in i might as well i've played this game for nine years i it'd be really weird to jump off right as it's concluding but uh i've been so again i've just i haven't played in a while so i'm largely disconnected from it but june's a pretty good time for that for for something like that to come out i think at least for them all right let's quickly get into what we're playing before we uh move into the bigger pieces of news I'll say that I'm playing Final Fantasy IV, one of the great games of all time, in my opinion. Such a strong game, such an awesome game. Can't wait to talk about it, but we're doing that over on Knockback, so you can look forward to that soon. We actually did Final Fantasy IV way, way back at the beginning of Knockback in early 2018, but 
we didn't play it before we did it. We just wanted to talk about it. The show was a little different back then. So we wanted to do a very comprehensive conversation about it beat by beat, talk about all the great characters and the wonderful story. I fucking love that game. And it's just reinforced in playing it again. I've played it so many times. It's one of the games I've played most probably in my life just by happenstance because it was released so many times to GBA, DS, um, <clears throat> PS1, and so on. So I'm going to save that for knockback. So that's what I've been playing. I'll leave it over to Chris. Let's go to you because you're playing Alan Wake 2. And yeah. Dustin, you're also playing that so you guys can share your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of got back into it. I, I, I don't know if I have anything new to say about it, but I still I still really love it. I, I know Dustin... Dustin, you... um. Unless I'm remembering wrong, you're you finished I'm it. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. I just finished it uh, a few nights ago, and yeah, I'm overall very pleased with it. I had a fantastic time. Uh, I I'll tell you immediately because I the one of the main things people ask me like is it is it your game of the year? I'm like no, it's not my game of the year. I think it is an amazing, uh, well made, uh, with a striking creative vision. I have a few issues with it that i didn't put in my tweet that we'll get into primarily on the spoiler cast but it's funny to me that the number one thing i dislike about both alan wake games are the combat and i it's completely different reasons for both games where especially as i got more into alan wake 2 i was like man combat just feels a little clumsy in this it doesn't have it's more a, like a survival horror game. I think Resident Evil 2 remake or something like that. It's more in that line, but it just doesn't feel as good. And I never there's certain points where I'm like, is this supposed to be hot combat heavy? Am I supposed to be running around? I don't know. But overall, I really, really enjoyed the performances. The Like I said, the overall uh, direction of the game. I think is absolutely incredible. We'll save. I don't want to talk about the ending really other than. I'm not really sure how I feel about it right now. I got to chew on it for a bit and think on it, but I don't. Mm. I'm just not sure. I'm I'm not saying good or bad. I just it's. uh, It's something. So we'll be talking about that very soon. I'm also playing uh, Super Mario RPG still. And just having a nice time with it, just just lightly on the side. I didn't write in my notes here, but as of last night, I'm back on Baldur's Gate 3. I got to beat Baldur's Gate 3 before the end of the year. Like I said, I have 60 or 70 hours into it. So I'm, oh. I'm very, very deep. I'm on the final act. And so they just released a giant patch today that they added like all new epilogues. They did a lot of performance stuff, bug fixes. So it's the perfect time for me to jump back in. What if it so, deleted your save? Oh, that'd be sick. I would probably just, you know, die, you know, just <laughs> just end it at that point, because I wouldn't do it. Well, I would maybe do it again. I would just do it completely different. Uh, like there's the Dark Urge playthrough. Have you heard about this, Chris? I know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. There's like this mode where your character gets compelled to kill people. So you could either like lean into the dark urge and just kill a bunch of people or you could try to play it and like resist the dark urge. I'm very, very intrigued. Lockmore was saying how he's so impressed with the dark urge playthrough. It's like a completely different game. So maybe when I'm done, I will check that out. But he seems like someone uh, that has some dark urges himself. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I think it's fitting for sure. Cool. Um, I'm going to begin playing another game earnestly over the next week or so, but I'm going to save that for a more appropriate time in this podcast because it's actually going to be a little later on. So we'll leave that for now. Oh, I think we might be in sync here. Yeah, we might be. Let's we'll, we'll, well, we'll find let's out. Let's go. Let's, let's save it. Yeah. Two ships in the night, my friend. All right, let's get <clears> into the news. All right. So a few big pieces of news this week. We can move through it pretty quick, though, I think this first one. So as I said earlier, there was this amazing blog post written by an old member of Rockstar North's development team going all the way back to their DMA design N64 roots. And he wrote this series of short blog posts. They weren't really copy edited. They weren't especially well written, some typos and stuff like that. But it was just interesting insight into a bunch of different projects. And I was going to report on all of that in the show until, as I said, the notes, actually, they're right here. This is, these are the notes that I took about all the things he said just about the GTA games and a little bit about Manhunt. But he also said something about 
more than we've ever heard really about the game Agent. And for a long time, PlayStation fans, this will kind of close the book on this, I think, although we knew for a long time that it wasn't going to come. But for newer PlayStation fans, maybe they'll be interested in the tale of Agent. And so I wanted to make it number one this week. Obi Virmaj isn't a name many of us know, but he was once an important player at Rockstar North, the developer behind Rockstar's smash hit GTA series. He began as a programmer on the obscure 1998 Take-Two published N64 exclusive Space Station Silicon Valley when Rockstar North was still known as DMA Design. By 2001's GTA 3, he rose to the team's technical director, a role he would retain through the release of Grand Theft Auto 4 in 2008 and its DLC by 2010. And he wrote an absolutely amazing blog with multiple entries about the development of many Rockstar games, including the top-down GTAs, PS2's GTA Trilogy, GTA 4, Manhunt, and most tantalizing for this podcast audience, the long-lost PlayStation 3 exclusive agent, which Rockstar North revealed at PlayStation's E3 press conference all the way back in 2009. Sadly, Vermage was later asked by Rockstar and Take-Two to take down the blog post, which he did, but not before they were all archived for posterity. While we will dedicate an episode of Sacred Symbols Plus to the wider, remarkable writings on that blog, here's what he had to say about Agent in, a, in part. Quote, so we really don't almost nothing about this game. And so this is all very interesting stuff. Quote, after San Andreas, we really wanted to do something that wasn't GTA. Rockstar San Diego were working with a, on a James Bond style game. Leslie Benzies was keen to do something along those lines. We did a demo doing some spy stuff in San Andreas. I think there was a hang glider and a car turning into a submarine or something. It impressed Rockstar San Diego and Rockstar New York, and we started working on it. The idea was that his team in North would be roughly split down the middle. Half of us would work on GTA 4 and the other half on Agent. Internally, the project was known as Jimmy. It was a James Bond game, and Jimmy is the Scottish version of James. The game was to be set in the 70s, which is something we did know, be more linear than GTA and with a number of locations. There was a French Mediterranean city, a Swiss ski resort, Cairo, and at the end, there would be a big shootout with lasers in space. Classic James Bond. The vibe was very cool. We really got going on this one and worked on it for over a year. I remember working on a downhill skiing chase scene with guns, for instance. The game wasn't progressing as well as we'd hoped. It was inevitable that eventually the whole company would have to get behind GTA 4. We tried to cut the game down in an attempt to get the bulk of it done before the inevitable call from New York would come. We could out, we could out an entire, le- we cut out an entire level, Cairo, I think, and maybe even the space station. It became clear that Jimmy was going to be too much of a distraction for us, and we ditched it. I think it was handed over to another company within Rockstar, but never got completed. End quote. Agent was first incubated between Sony and Rockstar as far back as 2007, and indeed it was mentioned, though not by name, during interviews surrounding E3 that year. By 2009, the year it was fully revealed, Publisher Take Two reiterated it would launch perhaps in 2010, and by 2011, it was in question whether it was even PlayStation exclusive anymore. Interestingly, everyone remained dodgy about it both within within Sony and Take Two, and even though the trademark for the game was strangely renewed in 2013, it was abandoned by 2018. Since 2009, various artwork and dating and design concepts have been leaked by various people who worked on it, and now we know the Cold War espionage thriller was dead long before the trademark's abandonment. So what's interesting about this is that it seemed like it was coming from a different team. And by the time it was announced, it was in someone else's hands. But this is really the most information we've ever received about this game, other than kind of tacit acknowledgments and in, in other forms and kind of the renewal of the trademark, which was very peculiar. I don't know what that was all about during the launch of the PS4 that year. So this is always, and I don't know if you remember Dustin specifically, because I know you were in the PlayStation podcast and kind of the PlayStation world for a long time is there was long this theory that's that Rockstar owed Sony a game. Do you remember that? That I do remember that. Yeah. That like there was like they didn't come through on some deal. And obviously that was nonsensical. But um, yeah, where are you on this? Any interest in this anymore? I'm always interested in hearing about canceled games. And this is one of three or four big AAA style games that PlayStation has announced that never that never saw the light of day. So what do you think? Yeah, I'm actually I'm bringing up right now. There's that great uh, website, Unseen 64, where you can check out canceled games. I'm bringing up Agent, which you're right. There is definitely some leaked stuff that you can see. The The saddest part to me about this, it just reminds me of when there was a time when Rockstar made games <laughs> like <laughs> I know I'm being facetious because they're they're making GTA six and that's going to be, you know, the biggest game ever most likely so rockstar you know this i guess what you could say is that was back when rockstar made games plural and now rockstar really particularly after red dead redemption 2 i think is now just going to make game and that will be grand theft auto and there was a lot of cool stuff that they did back then you think of games like 
uh, Manhunt and they had that like a tabletop tennis game and they did uh, some stuff that they published too, like uh, Midnight Club, right? Was a one of their joints yep. that they published and they are remember, doing. A- remember State of Emergency? Ugh. Oh yeah, yeah. I've that never game. played that, but I know you're talking I hated about it. It was it was advertised in the instruction manual for GTA Three, so I think it sold like a million copies just based on that. And it was so yeah. bad. It was like a riot simulator, basically, which is kind of an interesting idea. But mm. um, like you would run through a mall and like fuck it up and like and all this. But it was not good. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, it's cool to hear about these things, but it's it's uh, sad to hear about, you know, this time of Rockstar gone by. You think about the people I- I've never played this game. I know, Chris, I think you've championed this, but I don't think you're ever getting a bully sequel from yeah. Rockstar. It's never happening. That that era is just over. And this is a money. Money doesn't always talk. But when you're making this much money, it certainly does. Yeah, and yeah. I feel yeah. like there, there's a there's a threshold, I think, that you kind of pass. Uh, and I was actually thinking about this earlier today where it's like it really sucks that like I understand that business is inherently money driven and, and you need to turn profits. And, and that makes sense. I like I, I, I get it intrinsically. But there does come a point where something succeeds so much that it actively like kind of has a deleterious effect on things around it. I think I think the success of GTA five is, is kind of one of those things where it's like it's a shame that GTA five is as successful as it is because there's no real incentive for a rock star to do anything else now because it would be just financially really dumb of them to do it. Like I think what was the last thing they did outside of red dead was max Payne three, probably 2012. I think it was probably like the last non purely like, Oh, Hey, red dead GTA thing that they actually like really, really put out. Yeah. I think it would, that was after midnight. The last midnight club was 2009. I think so. Yeah, that would be right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it does, it is a shame, man. Like I would love, I would love another bully, dude. A modern bully that had me sick. I, I, I pray every day for that. But although I know that that's that's going to be something that you know, as as good as I am at at willing games into existence, that's gonna that's gonna require all my energy. Like if if I get bully two, I'm never getting anything else again. It's gonna drain all the energy out of me to make that I think- a reality. I, I wonder what the I do wonder what the motive is behind not doing more. And I think what because the Rockstar itself is a bunch of different teams and Rockstar North and Rockstar San Diego are the, the ones that really get the most respect and plot. It's Rockstar North is in Scotland and Rockstar San Diego, obviously in California and North is really known for GTA and, um, you know, the San Diego studio really known for Red Dead, but they have a lot of these. It's almost like a, a Call of Duty style situation where they just have a lot of different teams working on different things and helping support it. And you can see that in the credits of the games because they're yeah. extensive. So I wonder if they've just created a situation where there really are no more resources at in play to be able to do much more. But you would think that you would want to engage with one or two of your big IP and do uh, they've shown so much in, in some way. Maybe it's not surprising because they've, they've shown so much restraint. Remember how many Grand Theft Auto games came out and then they just stopped. And yeah, that's a that's a sign of restraint, like let us work and let us do the right thing. And so maybe less is more from them. And they're afraid of competing with themselves, too. Although I think that Red Dead 2 sales show of like 50 million plus are just incredible for a single player game. It's just incredible. Yeah, for a cow, a single player cowboy game. That's pretty nuts. (laughs) Actually, if you really like digest that, I know there's a there's a lot of people who are fans of Red Dead Online. uh, And there is something about Red Dead Online that is really kind of kitschy and cute and and a lot simpler than i don't know gta 5 i remember trying to get into gta online and then i remember i think i tried to get a car and then they were like you need to buy insurance on this car and i was like no (laughs) no thank you i don't need to i don't want to play a game where i pay car insurance that's insane it's already a problem that i i already resent the fact that i have to do this in real life so like no (laughs) keep this away from me but yeah, it is. It is kind of crazy. Um, I was actually surprised that we even got Red Dead Two in the first place. To be honest, like I, hmm. I thought GTA Five was just so successful that there would be no reason for them to do that. So, I mean, maybe it just takes them a long time to really branch out and do these other things. And maybe who the fuck knows? Maybe we could get a, maybe we could get Bully in who the fuck in like maybe six years <laughs> or something. But yeah, I, I don't. I'm not gonna hold my breath for it. Yeah, I. 
I wonder also, and I don't think it really matters. It definitely didn't matter for GTA five where the whole, that whole like je ne sais quoi about them, about violence and pushing the boundaries. I remember even when Manhunt finally came out, which I loved, I was like, this is pretty fucked up. It was a pretty fucked up game. And, and they had that vibe, but it's kind of not really cool anymore. And like the whole like edgelord sort of vibe of that's why I really want to see what the nature of this GTA game is. And also that other company that that is being founded and kind of run concurrent. They just announced something not, from guys outside of Rockstar. It's called like uh, something ventures or whatever. And they oh, just yeah. announced that they just announced that they're doing like a radio show and like this limited streaming show or whatever. But they're going to be these cross media sorts of situations yeah. like Laszlo absurd. is working over there now. Absurd, absurd Venture. ventures. Right. That's right. And so maybe that's where the spirit of things are. Like I know Red Dead's Red Dead 2's primary writer just went over there. And so I don't know. Uh, it, having the talent to be able to execute on that stuff is is real, too. But it also I mean, the, the cost of GTA 6 is going to be astounding. And so they might just want to be in that space now and use all their resources to that end. So anyway, I am glad to know more about agent i doubt we'll hear much more i'm a little disappointed though not surprised that rockstar kind of busted this guy's balls and had him take his stuff down but it is archived out there if you want to look for it and you can just you'll find it very easily if you search around all right number two number two and number three are somewhat related but only tangentially in an exceedingly rare piece of corporate communication playstation revealed a so-called uh quote-unquote global strategic business partnership with ncsoft the prolific South Korean publisher and developer of PC-centric MMORPGs. Believe it or not, the PlayStation brand has only penned 11 press releases all year, so it's always interesting when they have something to say. And this piece of news seems to confirm long lingering rumors about these two brands, though more on that shortly. Underlining the extent of the partnership, the press release specifically outlines that mobile gaming will be amongst the areas of cooperation, with PR speak noting that, quote, the two companies are evaluating a range of potential opportunities with an aim to foster strategic synergy leveraging NCSoft's technological prowess and SIE's global leadership in the entertainment field, end quote. This agreement, signed by NCSoft's CEO Taijin Kim and PlayStation CEO Jim Ryan, who apparently has no more power and is being fired, hinges on different goals for the two sides. Kim's statement notes, quote, This partnership with SIE is the beginning of our efforts to build various synergies together. I hate that word. Utilizing both companies' core competencies, technological capabilities, and expertise. We will deliver a new and enjoyable experience to our partner or to our audience across, uh, I'm sorry, across and beyond genres and regions, end quote. Meanwhile, Jim Ryan is quoted as saying, quote, partnering with NCSoft advances our strategy to expand beyond console and broaden PlayStation's reach to a wider audience. Like SIE, NCSoft shares a similar vision in creating high quality, impactful entertainment experiences for players everywhere. And together, we're excited to collaborate to push the boundaries of gaming further, end quote. So if NCSoft sounds familiar to you, it's probably because very compelling rumors emerged from South Korean publication MTN back in late 2022, indicating that NCSoft was making a Horizon MMORPG for mobile and PC. And this was supported by some interesting evidence, namely that Horizon's home studio, Gorilla, was hiring a mobile producer and get this, a Korean translator uh, that would work from their home office in the Netherlands. So this could be public acknowledgement of not only that project, but others in the works potentially as well. And as cannily noted by website Push Square, which did some awesome research here, this actually isn't the first time Sony and NCSoft have been sniffing around each other. The website reports that 16 years ago, at E3 2007, NCSoft announced they would be bringing products to both PlayStation 3 and PSP, neither of which ever materialized. And reporting from 2009 indicates the plug was pulled on any potential products by that year. So this reemergence is a bit interesting, particularly because NCSoft in 2007 and NCSoft in 2023 are very, very different companies. In 2007, NCSoft had its popular lineage franchise of, of MMORPGs going, and it had acted as publisher for the popular ArenaNet MMORPG from 2005, Guild Wars. But it wasn't until 2009's Ion and 2012's Blade and Soul, both still healthy and ongoing, that NCSoft truly hit the scene. And at 5,000 employees, it would be hard to say that, the, that its expertise and success, not to mention its South Korean location, may prove to be an interesting acquisition target for Sony in the future. Um... Sony doesn't really do things like this. So I think that this is like the first step towards a more mature second party relationship that might build more into the future. Here's my real hope, though, Chris. Mm. And I think Push Square reported this in there. And, and, and I understand this as well, is that this project is separate from the multiplayer project that apparently is coming out for Horizon, like another Horizon multiplayer game in addition to the third game in, mm. the, in the core franchise. And my hope is that maybe we have been misunderstanding that the whole time and that this is all one in the same 
So anyway, what do you think about this kind of going towards the MMO RPG route with Horizon signing with a South Korean publisher? I said that these this story would be connected with the next one by the well it will be because we're going to talk about another South Korean entity. Sony seems to be very interested in this in this country in uh, kind of being here and trying to get things out first. So do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think there's a lot of talent over there and they would be wise to kind of scout and and forge partnerships over there where they where they can, especially because things are so different now than the way that they used to be, especially especially obviously with NCSoft growing as much as they have. I was looking up their history and they've been they've been at it for a while, dude. Like they've been at like 19. Well, I mean, not in the grand scheme of things, but 1990, 1998. Yeah, that is a long time. That's pretty. You know, that's a storied. That's a storied company with a lot of talent. And I mean, I know you say you hope that this is something separate, but what, what's 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 your gut saying? It's saying that it's not just because if they're going to NC soft for their specialty, then they're making a very specific MMO RPG style game that would be different than what was implied would be a, an online horizon game. That that right. description doesn't seem to fit for me, but yeah. I would hope but I. I would just hope that they would realize that the, the, there is no appetite for that many Horizon games. Yeah. Unless they're just like, unless this NC Soft game is literally just like going to be a mobile game, then that is literally what it's going to be. I would just hope that they would be smart enough to put it on everything. Not literally, maybe not the, one of those games I was talking about with on Xbox and Switch, but you would put it on PlayStation. Well, you would, yeah, you would have to imagine that the new mobile strategy now going forward, especially now that phones are just strong and, and capable and now that the biggest things on phones and, and in Gaming in general happened to be cross-platform mobile to console to PC, things like Genshin Impact and what is it? H- Honkai Star yeah. Rail. Yeah, the exactly. Least, least pleasant thing to ever say. Horrible. Um, you have to imagine that like if they're working on anything, like it, it wouldn't be just either or. It would, it would. You'd have to imagine it would be both because that would be the wisest way to extract as much value out of it as possible. And, and also just probably even just beyond selfishness, just probably to make the, the best possible experience as well like i can't imagine that you know the 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 days of mobile games being like snake are like way behind us now um so yeah i don't know it's it's a it's an interesting i'm glad they're looking into i'm glad they're looking at talent in this way as opposed to just kind of gobbling up um kind of established entities or or kind of like making partnerships with people that we are kind of already know and instead kind of going into this this new kind of area where there's just like a lot of unfettered talent makes a lot of sense to me. Dustin, I want to know your thoughts, however you want to take it. I also am curious if you think anything of Jim Ryan, you know, obviously making this deal. I mean, that's not a huge surprise, but there's this theory that among some, and I don't think it's necessarily that unreasonable that he's kind of being courted, you know, kind of like, you know, okay, it's time to go maybe a, a, a mutual parting or whatever. Although it's claimed that he's retiring and that he's kind of tired of traveling, and I believe all that as well, but certainly this seems like a, a pretty expensive and powerful move to make with a, a big company that has a staff the size, you know, comparable size to your entire first party outside of Bungie. So, um, doesn't seem like something a powerless man does. But I'm, right. I'm curious what you think. Did you see the photo of him? Yeah, it's, he's like in a T-shirt or something, right? Yeah, you hold use on. That. Yeah. Uh, let me. I'll copy the image address here. I'll send this to you guys here and I'll put it. Whoa. That was oh, the- oh <laughs> my God. Look at that inc- Holy shit. Oh, holy, on, on, what on, the on. fuck? Dude. Hold on. New one. That is the longest link. I just copied and pasted it from Google. Okay. Here's a better one. Okay. Uh, let me put it in the show notes so I can remember to put it in. This is the craziest link I've ever seen in my entire Ryan. life. Ryan. Yeah. Jim, Jim Ryan, Ryan just showed up. This. He's just, uh, <laughs> just in a white tee, just pulling the white tee out. For this this is the most horrifying image of anyone I think I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> this is so deeply distressing. I could easily Photoshop him with like a mic in front of him. So he's like podcasting with us. Like yeah, you got to do There's a lot of it. opportunities with this. Oh, one. my God. Yeah, I was, was I, when I saw this, I was I was gleeful in the sense that we had a new <laughs> one to add to our repertoire for our different thumbnails. Because I have to know I, I do notice and I, I, I'm I got to say I'm a little disappointed when I see the thumbnails where you don't do anything to them. You know, they can't all be bangers, Colin. Why not? Why do you got to milk me like this? You, 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 dude. <laughs> you got to have oh your God, age of all time. You got to have a breakdown about this. You got to have your age of breakdown Ultron about sometimes. this. Okay. We're, we, we put out, I put out 13 thumbnails in two weeks. Okay. Come on now. Come on, man. Um, but no, yeah, we'll definitely use Jim in this way. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know how, 
Come on, man. We'll Come figure on, it out. Man. Come on, man. Um, <laughs> as far as this deal is concerned, yeah, there's there's something going on with South Korean development, and we saw them do this with uh, Canada as well when it came, comes to uh, getting in with uh, Haven, right? So this in combination with the next story, obviously there's something going on there, but I don't, as far as NCSoft, I don't really know what to think of them. What, while, while you were reading the story and while Chris was talking, I went, I was just looking up gameplay videos of stuff they released in the last few years. And yeah, it's some of these games, despite probably being successful, don't even have English Wikipedia pages. Uh, and I'm not saying that they're not big. It's just that they're it's very much a like Korean mobile games. Uh, for example, I was looking at one game they released in 2021 is called Blade and Soul 2. Mm-hmm. And so I was just watching the gameplay. It's very much a standard MMO with sort of MM, with uh, anime, Korean anime looking characters. I, I've noticed now I've started to get clued into it's like a Korea very much has their own distinctive style in a lot of these games. And so I wonder what exactly that the end product of this partnership looks like in terms of, you, you know, we talked about a horizon MMO game. And, and last week in particular, I talked a lot about how it's, it would make sense that Sony would want to get in on some of that Genshin impact style money, where you have games that work on your phone that you can also play on your PlayStation. And they've got tons of microtransaction and, and gotcha type elements and, Maybe this is them getting all of the elements they need together for something like that. They just, you know, they got the IP. They've got the team to do it. So I wonder if that's the case. Yeah, it's it is cool to go to these. They're doing with India, you know, obviously, like, you know, we've noted in. um, Yeah, just go and get this this talent that is behind the language barrier that's behind the cultural barrier it's it's wise but yeah. i don't know that nc soft is necessarily untapped either they did do that game phaser right which was fuser uh, fuser that's what it was oh fuser. wait but that was a harmonics they, they i yeah, wonder they, what their involvement is with that yeah they i don't know they they did some project with that the point was is that they have some sort of like liaison with western teams already and obviously with arena yeah. too but they, this um, says they published it they published it yeah I, uh, oh yeah, that probably makes sense. Yeah, I would see. I would be be interested to know. I just want to know more about this project. If it's the same as what we've seen, or we didn't see anything, what we've heard, because there was really compelling stuff. Out, like I said, in twenty twenty two, out of Korea, that this was already going. So we kind of know this. We've we've actually baked this in towards our assumptions towards Horizon already. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm getting. I'm getting. I don't know, man. As I think about this story, and and I look at this image. <laughs> I'm getting like just bad vibes from this whole thing. <laughs> there's, there's really so, like I don't know if you guys see this, but I sent something in the chat where like his, his face really reminds me of of this horrifying oh, this illustration. Doesn't, this doesn't work. Does it oh. not work? No. It's the pale lady from from uh, scary stories to tell in the dark, where like there's just something really disturbing about this this oh, image of Jim Ryan. I can't get over it. Oh. I really, I can't get oh, over. Yeah, it. I hate this image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, there's like that that same face that's going on where it's like, hi, but like you're not. I, don't know, I can't. I can't. I'm getting bad. Bad. He's vibes tired. I get it. You sleepy. don't gotta be. You don't gotta be so scary, sleepy though. Boy. He just rolled out of bed. <laughs> All right. This other one I wanted to report on. I'm not sure there's much here, but it's worth noting because people are gonna want to. Well, people did want to talk about it. A lot of people wrote in about it. Number three. Rewind, if you will. Back to 2019, when we first learned about something called Project Eve, an action RPG coming from Shift Up, a promising new South Korean studio. Then in 2021, it reemerged as a at a PlayStation showcase. Well, by the next year in 2022, the game had a proper name, Stellar Blade, and it appeared that Sony had stepped in to publish the game itself in a second party capacity. To be clear, a first party game is a title both funded by and made by a team which the entity owns. So think The Last of Us from Naughty Dog or Horizon from Gorilla. A second party game, on the other hand, is one funded by and often, though not always, owned by a publishing entity, but created by a developer it doesn't own. So think of Quantic Dreams, three PlayStation games, or even the original Infamous or Spider-Man, which were made by Sucker Punch and Insomniac before they were purchased outright. 
This is the realm Stellar Blade finds itself in, which is why it's so interesting that seemingly redundant news is popping up about it. The source of this news is seldom referenced PlayStation website PlayStation Lifestyle, which dug up a Korean language article from a website called Game Chosen. The title of the Korean article is, quote, Shift Up, the first Korean developer to formalize a publishing contract directly distributed and supported by Sony, end quote. And the article notes that on November 24th, Sony and Shift Up signed a contract over Stellar Blade, making it, quote, the first Korean company to join Sony's second party partnership, end quote. Otherwise, the article merely makes note of the game's brief history, along with some other information irrelevant to the question at hand. What's different about this agreement to the one they already had? As a Sony-funded game explicitly published by PlayStation, which we've known about since 2022, Shift Up is already acting in a second-party capacity, and Stellar Blade is already the very definition of a second-party game. There is a caveat, though. Unlike virtually any other PlayStation exclusive to date, Project Eve, its original iteration, was actually an explicitly multi-platform game, meaning Sony did come in at some point to take it over. It's due to launch sometime in 2024 exclusively on PlayStation 5. Is there, I, I don't know if either of you had the same thought. I'm like, didn't we already know this? I, I, and, and reading the South Korean article just translated, I'm like, there's nothing here. This seems like one of those things that circulates just because it was written somewhere and no one really checks the provenance of it or cares about that. But it doesn't yeah. really, it doesn't make any sense. We already knew this. Um, Dustin, do you have something to say? That's exactly what I was going to say is that I... I don't know this. It's like news and not news because obviously you said, you know, it's they went out and made this, but it's like, yeah, we thanks. Appreciate <laughs> you letting us know. We already kind of had yeah. this figured out, but apparently they want to make it more official in some degree. I don't know. Does, does this reek of, uh, you know, trying them out, trying them out, seeing, hey, like we're we want to make it known that you're you're our second party partner. And maybe if this game pops off. Maybe it'll be a first party yeah, partnership at some point. Some people are conjecturing, and I think this is probably accurate, that so a studio like Quantic Dream or that game company both signed multi-game, three-game deals for each of them. Um, right. And so that's where like Flow, Flower, and Journey came from. And that's where Heavy Rain, Beyond Two Souls, and Detroit Become Human came from. And some people are saying like, oh, well, Stellar Blade is late in development. It's probably... I'm certain it's content complete. I'm sure they're just testing it and polishing it now. They probably really like it. And they're like, okay, let's get you signed again. And so maybe this is just a multi-game deal that's either being not really relayed very well or something's lost in translation or the contents of the contract are unknown or this is literally just a reiteration of what we already know. It's one of those things. But I think yeah. it could very well be that they're just saying, oh, we'll do this again sometime. And yeah, get get you involved with our, you know, ex dev and have a more intimate relationship is maybe they move closer to buying a studio like this if they feel like they fit. So I think there's something to that. Um, what do you think about this, Chris? I don't know. I'm excited that they see this much potential in it, I guess, you know, like to for, for them to make a I mean, you know, I again, this was kind of assumed to be true. A lot of this stuff is even when I was reading it in the news, I was like, I feel like I feel like even I knew this. You know, and uh, Stellar Blade it was something that I was curious about, but I wasn't super paying attention to. And I none of this sounded like new to me. But I mean, I'm honestly just really pumped and really curious about what this is going to be. If they see this much potential in it and, and if they're really like, hey, you know, let's get you in in some real um, tangible way that, you know, is, is, a, is a tangible way that so many others have gotten their way to first party. Like, I'm, I'm stoked about it. Especially because it's just like a single player first party or not a single player first party, but a single player, you know, action game. That's that's very I don't want to say nostalgic because that's because that's not accurate, but very old school in the way that it's presented. It's kind of I don't know. It's exciting. It's cool. It's exactly the kind of stuff that I want out of PlayStation, really. And so uh, I think they probably are aware of that on some level that um, that they're probably catering to a, a demographic that's been a little bit. A little bit left behind. Uh and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just stoked about it. Two postscripts before we get into a couple of listener inquiries and get on to the next news item. The first is that the date lines up. This is why I said that the two things are related. If this deal was signed in South Korea on November 24th, then it was pro they were Jim Ryan and, and his entourage were probably in South Korea for the NC soft stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So that stuff lines up. So that's interesting and deliberate, I'm sure, and good use of time as well. Um, and I wanted to make note of that. I guess the second thing um, could be noted in one of these listener inquiries. So I'll just go right to it. Steve Balmer wrote in. It's always good to hear from you, Steve. He <laughs> says, Hope all is well, guys. 
recent news, by the way, the, the video of him going around recently of that at that conference in 1999 where he's just sweating profusely, you know, yeah. and giving it, he's he's awesome. He can sell anything. Hope all is well, guys. Recent news indicates that Korean studio shift up has signed on as a second party developer for Sony. Stellar Blade must be coming along very nicely indeed. Personally, I think there are great catches. Stellar Blade with that little content we've seen looks quite impressive, to say the least. An unknown studio has one of platinum and looks to have given us a current gen Bayonetta that gamers have been clamoring for. With more talented studios like Round 8 and Pearl Abyss on the rise, showcasing solid titles, Sony would be wise to keep their eyes on South Korea's thriving talent. What say you guys? As always, keep up the amazing work. I can't possibly imagine how you guys can top yourselves, but LSM seems to be full of surprises lately. Cheers. Oh, just you wait, Steve. Thanks for writing in. And keep up the good work over there at Microsoft. Um, now, the interesting thing here about what's going on with Pearl Abyss and some of these other South Korean studios is that I think Sony is in on knowing that they need to be in these places. And I give them credit for that. I think the ownership and stakeholding in Chinese owned stuff is probably more complicated. And that's the first place that they went that they really tried to breach. And I think that that was really smart. I mean, look at the success of the MiHoYo stuff or whatever. Like they were definitely close to the to the yeah. center of what was going to happen. And they knew and they got some cool games out of it. But I don't think they want to or even can really own entities there and, and publishing contracts in that place are probably a nightmare. So the next place they stepped over to was India and the India Hero Project is ongoing the first round of it. And we're going to see a lot of the games they chose early next year to kind of fund and get behind. And that's going to be really interesting. And so now with India and South Korea, more capitalistic societies where they can really get stakes in on this thriving talent where their competitors simply won't or can't or don't go. Yeah, it's absolutely the wise thing. We've already kind of reiterated that, but it's worth noting that being ahead of the curve like that is huge because there's really probably not that much more truly untapped potential. You'd ha- you're going to have to go find some smaller indie stuff, and that's going to be everywhere. But as far as like established major companies you can work with, NCSoft is huge. Like I said, 5,000 people is a lot of people. And then KB wrote in and said, hey, gents, Jim Ryan, who is on the verge of retirement, has made deals with two Korean based studios and NCSoft and shift up. Does this clear any conspiracies regarding Jim's exodus? In various corners of the Internet, you'd hear that Jim was fired or pushed out because of his inability to stop the ABK deal from happening or because Sony isn't happy with the Bungie acquisition. However, if this were the case, it begs the question, who would why would someone who was pushed out make decisions on behalf of the company who forced you into retirement? I generally agree with this notion. It could be as easy as him following the orders of the C-suite around him and the board of directors and all of that. But I would generally agree that you don't want the like a, a, a dis, you know, a, a a fallen face to be the face of all of these deals you're making. I just I, I always feel like that was kind of nonsensical either. I don't want to say you take Sony at their word. There's no really reason to take Sony at their word, but I do believe that unless Jim Ryan was very deliberate over the years, he made it pretty clear in a lot of interviews how much he hated kind of the parts of the job and especially like the demands of being on a plane all of the time. He said it many, many times. So unless that was always like the lead and then or they could have said like, well, you said this so many times we can use this as an excuse to kick you out. But I just. Why would the man that's so online. It's very online interpretation, isn't it? Because really, PlayStation is bigger than it's ever been. And PlayStation 5 was a meteoric success. Yeah. And it doesn't. Re- so now, some of the long mid. I, I don't. I said this when he it was announced that he was leaving. It's like, I don't really know that we're going to know about the things he greenlit and stuff until he's gone anyway. And they might not be confident about it for all I know. But I agree, generally speaking, KB, that that was a misreading from the very beginning in that Jim's exodus is more about. That's a great Jim's exodus. We should save that for when he actually leaves <laughs> the end of the first quarter, first calendar yeah, yeah. Year quarter. All right. I'm sick of talking about South Korea. Let's talk about Japan. Number four. Let's put the rumors to rest once and for all. That leaked Dragon's Dogma Dragon's Dogma 2 release date from last week is real. It comes directly from publisher and developer Capcom, and we can now shout it from the rooftops. The promising upcoming open world action RPG will launch on PlayStation 5 on March 22nd, 2024. It's a sequel to the cult hit 2020, uh, 2012 action RPG Dragon's Dogma, which launched on PlayStation 3 that year and later received a 1.5 style update called Dark Arisen that launched in 2013 on PS3 and later on PS4 in 2017. In a write-up on the official PlayStation blog, Capcom der- uh, describes Dragon's Dogma 2 as, quote, a narrative-driven action RPG set in a fantasy world. Players can experience a variety of actions and the pawn system allows players to feel as if accompanied through the single-player game, end quote. Later, it continues, quote, Dragon's Dogma 2 is set in an immersive fantasy world. The dragon, feared as the threat that brings misfortune, takes the player's heart. This sets the journey for the player to slay the dragon as the arisen, end quote. 
as was the case in the 2012 original players can play as multiple races, character classes, and so on. And the aforementioned pawn system, a, ro- a robust party like setup also makes its return from the original. And thankfully, it's being directed by the same guy who directed the first one, Hide- Hide- uh, Hideaki Itsuno, sorry, who notes that the in the write up that the game, quote, incorporates ideas that were not technically feasible at the time we created the first game. I believe this game will let you experience the fantasy world you've always dreamed of, end quote. Itsuno, who has been with Capcom for some three decades, is a directorial veteran, having directed classic fighting games like Rival Schools, Power Stone, and its sequel, and every Devil May Cry game since two. Okay, mm. so here we are. Um, what do we think? Dustin, this was the game I was thinking of. This is the game I was thinking of. Yeah, nice. That, Dragon's Dogma uh, Brothers. Yeah, I think this is going to be a game for me in December because I want to be ready. And mm-hmm. so many people that I respect have told me that I need to check out and play this game. So I think this is going to be a nice little game for the Steam Deck because, Colin, bad news, 30 FPS, that PS4 version. Really? Yeah. Is that Never right? Never got updated. Mm. I'm, pre- I'm 90% sure I will verify when I'm not talking, but... That is stinky. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, unfortunate. But yeah, this mm. is exciting. I briefly clicked around their presentation. I kind of don't want to watch it because here's the thing. We're always talking about this Capcom renaissance right now where... They are such high tier for me that I think I'll pretty much play anything they put out. I didn't play Street Fighter, but I'm not really into fighting games, but I have a huge amount of respect for it. So this one, I'm going to put the work in. I'm going to play Dragon's Dogma and just based on the excitement. And like I said, people who I really respect their taste in games have always told me about this. I want to be ready day one for Dragon's Dogma 2. So. This is uh, exciting. I'm very intrigued by this series as a whole. Yeah, I'm reading now. It's a 1440p 30 frames on PS4 Pro. Stinky. Stinky. Yeah, I don't know. That kind of that kind of Stinky, I find smelly. that a little dismaying. That might I might have to I might be looking in another direction now, but uh, that's oh. interesting to know. I, I just made an assumption because I'm like, it's a PS3 game. Mm-hmm. Like, how could it not be upgraded and ported? Yeah, it, it is. It is kind of crazy that it's not. You'd have to even on base PS4, you'd have to imagine that it would probably would have been easy to hit. But I don't know. I guess I guess not. You know, it's crazy. I apparently I so I remember playing Dragon or not playing Dragon's Dogma, but like kind of like experiencing it a little bit like a really, 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 really long time ago. Not on PC, but on PlayStation at a friend's house. And but apparently I just own it on Steam. I think that happened to me, too. Where I thought, I'll, like a, a year or two ago, I downloaded it. I don't. I think I played maybe a, a few minutes of it, but I just had it. I was like, oh, that happens with Steam, you know, some of these sales and deals. It's like, <laughs> oh, I just happen to have this game. Mm. I have no memory of buying this at all, but I mean, I, I do have it. So, and it's 19 gigs, and on Steam Deck, that does sound kind of. I don't know, maybe. Maybe this is maybe this is something I'm I'll jump in. Dude, on. I didn't I didn't I was thinking I would have did, to buy it, you know what I mean? <laughs> Chris, did you see any of the trailer? The the no, recent I have, stream. No. no, I have not. When I was clicking around, there's this shot where they're fly, like someone's like they're like holding on to an eagle or something, and then they drop down on this giant enemy and they have like these like oh. magical looking stones sticking out of them that they cut off. I'm like, dude, this is very shadow the colossus esque i think someone uh, someone (laughs) that doesn't i think i saw a little bit i skimmed through it because that sounds familiar somebody was like look at this and i did and i i i I didn't sit and watch the whole thing but i did skim through it yeah i don't know this this might be something that i'm 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 a lot more keen on checking it out now that i know that it's such a small download and i already have it (laughs) and also i didn't even think about the steam deck that's a good Sounds pretty fucking dude. And it sucks. I'm gonna compelling. play my Steam Deck again, and it's gonna push me to want to get a Steam Deck OLED. You know, have you thought Why? about that at all? No, I have Why? not. <laughs> no, because it's like I, I'm just total. Well, first of all, I didn't even buy my Steam Deck, right. so like the, the whole point of it was just like, all right, this whole thing is free, and that's sick. But now you love so it, like, and I I do love it. I, I think it's I think it's fantastic. But I, I I don't know if I were to buy a handheld PC again, it would have to be like a a, a, a huge step up, or it would have to have a different function I, like i would have to access like game pass on it like on the rogue ally or something just to give it mm. like an, its own purpose but sure. yeah i don't know 
You guys don't you mean uh, the, don't you mean the Raj ally? The Raj? Oh, is it? I have no idea. <laughs> Not, dude, I've heard R O G. I've heard Rog. I've heard Roger ally. The Ro- Roger. Whoa. Well, Logan Carter wrote in and has a little bit of a reaffirmation for Dustin because Dustin and I were only Dragon's Dogma brothers, but for a, a nary a minute. He says, "Greetings, what sacred gentlemen." Long time, first time here with a comment for Dustin. With the recent Dragon's Dogma 2 live stream, my curiosity got the best of me and decided to check out the original I've had in my backlog for quite some time. After about 10 hours, I can say I'm loving it and really feel like it has some FromSoft DNA, and I really think you would enjoy it. I know your backlog is already exceeding exceeding mass capacity, and I really think if you were to check it out, you won't be disappointed. Thanks for everything you do. Keep it up. So just a little bit of a reaffirmation of your goal to play it this December, perhaps, on your Steam Deck. and Yeah. Um, yeah. Godspeed to you, my friend. Thank you. I, I, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. It, it's disappointing about that 30 FPS thing. Yeah, uh, I didn't. I don't know why I just kind of was very cavalier and just assuming. Well, naturally, a PS3 game to PS4, that would be bumped up. But they bumped up the resolution. It's like, I don't care about the resolution. Number five. Finally, it's Sacred Symbols, which means it's time for another slate of PlayStation Plus games, this time for the all encompassing lowest tier essential. In other words, these are your so-called free PS Plus games for the month of December, regardless of which tier of PS Plus you subscribe to. And the lineup this month is maybe a little bit underwhelming. Available on PS5 only is a game called Sable, a one-time timed Xbox exclusive from 2021 that launched on PS5 late last year and which never received a native PS4 iteration. It's an adventure game from developer Shedworks. The other two games this month are on both PS4 and PS5. The visual concepts developed racing game Lego 2K Drive, which launched, launched earlier this spring, launched Earlier this spring on both consoles is up next. And finally, Power Wash Simulator will also be made available. A surprise hit from excellent British studio Future Lab, the guys that did the awesome Velocity games on PS3, PS4, and Vita. Published by Square Enix and another timed Xbox exclusive from 2022, the PS4 and PS5 iteration of the simulation game launched early in 2023. All three games will be available beginning December 5th, and you can grab them until January 1st when they'll be replaced. Remember to add them to your download list before the month is out so you don't miss out. Um, So... Phil McCarthy, you're speaking my language here, wrote in and said, hey, boys, not a question, but a recommendation. This month's PS Plus lineup has been revealed in one of my very favorite games of the year is included. Power Wash Simulator is a legit fantastic game. I sunk 80 plus hours into it for listening to podcasts or just unwinding. This is digital meditation, a surprisingly cool narrative. No bullshit, along with addictive gameplay and some awesome DLC, both free and paid, including Final Fantasy VII, SpongeBob and Back to the Future makes this a game I couldn't recommend enough. Happy holidays and love from Ireland. So this is one of those very, very rare months for me where a game comes along and I'm like, oh, I kind of wanted to buy you. And I just was like, eh, I don't know. And Power Wash Simulator was that game. That's been that game for months and months. Mm. I think I would like it. It is one of those mindless games. Like if I find some sort of 10 hour YouTube seminar that I'll listen to or something, it's like, oh, that's the game. I got to just play that while I'm listening to this. So, Phil, I'm totally down to, to play that. But over overall, I would imagine this is somewhat underwhelming. Did anything for you guys on here that you're interested in? Oh, I'm pumped for that Lego game. Really? Because, is it supposed to be good? Uh, no, it's supposed to be fine. I remember the reviews were in the <laughs> 70s. <laughs> so it's probably, you know, <laughs> what I want is I want to sit down. I want to play it for two to three hours. And that's it. And then just move on. It looks cute. It looks, you know, it, the way your car transforms on different terrains. I think it looks fun for a nice romp, but I didn't want to buy it for $70. So this is fantastic. I can just get that out of me. And Colin, you know, who recommends Power Wash Simulator highly amongst our crew is Ben. Oh, ben yeah, yeah. Has, I think I know he got all the achievements on Xbox when it was on Game Pass, but I think he bought it again on PlayStation wow. and maybe has the platinum or at least he told me he had He's the got a passion yeah. to do that. So, yeah, he is a big power wash simulator fan. So I don't know anything about this Sable game, right? Is that it? Yeah, yeah I remember Sable. when it came out because it's pretty. It, it looks pretty. I, you know. I played I played it for a few hours. Hmm. It's pretty good, but it's it's it, it's largely like a visually striking game. Like it's it's really pretty to like exist in and room around. It's very like kind of there's a journey quality to it that's like kind of like very like flow statey and kind of meditative meditative and it's very kind of exploratory. There's not a lot of I don't know, it it, it kind of lost my attention really quick because I just I'm very I, I need <laughs> like high paced action. I'm just like my brain's fried in a lot of ways to to slow games like that. But I think it's a pretty solid 
I, don't know, I feel like this month's kind of okay. It's not like exciting, but I think it's reasonably decent. Like, uh, obviously, the lack of, I guess, uh, classics is disappointing. I obviously, but um, I don't know. All these seem pretty okay, honestly, to me. I'm not really super disappointed by any of this. Well, fair enough. By the way, I'm. I was. I have a tab open, and it's still. Here, I'll send it to you guys. It's still this tweet that you sent me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I so it's I just love, so fucking funny i, I don't love, know why it's so funny yeah. to me, but, it's pretty good yeah it's a good one poor kid all right well i just don't understand i, I can't begin to, to dissect the the 10 year old kids approach to this you know let yeah. him i'm just gonna let him be let him be all right that's it for the news listener inquiries let's time or let's time it's time to wrap it up sacred symbols ends each and every episode with six questions comments concerns thoughts and ideas from the audience over on patreon patreon.com slash last stand media i put up a thread in the news feed each week you respond to that i go through it then i delete the thread entirely and no one ever knows what was said at all scott 2xp wrote in and said what's up sacred symbols is the gaming business too serious these days i get that money is king but are we really having fun i grew up playing games in the 90s and it was this fun weird novelty today it seems like it's all about that precious cheddar I'm sure it was all about the money back then, but I feel the tone has shifted. Games are rushed to market. Journalists rush to get out reviews and content creators rush to express their opinions. It seems like everyone under the sun is trying to turn a profit as opposed to actually enjoying the games that we're lucky enough to play. Thanks for all that you do. I don't. First of all, games were always, 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 always rushed to market, like way worse than they are now, I would actually argue because but it's it's bad today because of patching. It's bad for a totally different reason. They didn't release broken games. You couldn't really release straight up broken games or you wouldn't survive very long. Sometimes I wonder, yeah. Scott, if this in, this interpretation of things is just through the lens of modernity and we're getting old and we're kind of old men yelling at clouds in some way. And then sometimes I do think like, yeah, it, it is different. It is different because it's 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 much more saturated. It's everywhere. And when we were younger, it wasn't. And it was always about yeah. money, but it was about money for fewer people and selling fewer games to, to fewer customers. I, I just I don't know that things have changed. I do think, though, Chris, the one thing he says that I agree with is games are rushed to market. Journalists rush to get out reviews and content creators rush to express their opinions. Yeah, this is this I feel is so blatant. And yeah. I think I've said this before, and I believe this with my whole heart, that if your audience is relying on you for day and date coverage and they are not there for you when you don't have it, then they are not there for you. And that yeah. your access is the only reason that people are clicking on it. And that's a very precarious place to be because at that point you have to be an access journalist. And I don't look kindly on you, obviously, but I think that that's a difficult place to be because you're fucked. The, yeah. The beauty is, is that our audience truly doesn't care. Like, and mm -hmm. we, but we engineered that and the people that don't care are not here for us anyway. And that's, this is a much less precarious place to be as a result. So, yeah, what, what do you you're a very esteemed and experienced content creator. I mean, what do you think about all Scott's uh, Scott's letter here? Yeah, I have to say, I think I I agree more than I disagree. I, I, I do think I, I'm always very, very self-aware of of the fact that, yeah, dude, I'm getting older. And so things <laughs> modern things are a little scary because they're unfamiliar. And I, I'm very keen. I, I'm keenly aware of that. But also, I do think there is something to be said about how much money the games industry makes today and how much it spends today versus how much it made and spent back in the day. And I do think that leads to a, a, a very, very different attitude where like, dude, like, I mean, even just the not only the development costs, but just the way that we we talked about it and, and just the way that the, even just the way that E3 was presented. I mean, we had live people live on stream on 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 cable TV giving, you know, press conferences live and they risked a lot go doing that. There was like so much, so many chances of things not working. There's so many stories from like really, really world famous world-class developers of, about how they went on stage and the demo that they had was like, there was a 80% chance it would crash on stage. We've seen that happen a number of times. I remember, I think like 2017 or 2016, 2018, one of those years, there was a battlefield there was a Battlefield demo where the sound was just fucked and they, they were just showcasing Battlefield with no sound and it was a fucking disaster. And that was even just a, a few years ago. That wasn't even that long ago. And, and the idea that, you know, that at that time wasn't such a big deal. 
you know and now it's like you wouldn't see that anymore now it's like they, they really rarely do that at all now it's you know this direct kind of very very controlled very very buttoned up very very self-serious um there's there's so much money being overspent i think on on a lot of games and in, in, in the development pipeline and especially with with content creation dude like I, this is kind of the thing that makes me really sad about and uh, like about how things have progressed both on online and and with like various industries that i've i've followed over the years and it's i i get in my head sometimes about man i kind of do wish we weren't so incessantly capitalistic in the way that like it wouldn't it be nice if all the content that you saw on your feed was content that people made because they wanted to and not because it was financially reasonable for them to do so you know i i saw this thing the other day of and i tweeted about it too because it really like kind of bothered me of some guy and he's talking about here's my here's my secret to tiktok success or whatever and it was him just like i go to youtube and i screen record the first uh minute of a video and then I go to YouTube and I look for gameplay of like some mobile game. And then I screen court a minute of that. I put them on top of each other. I auto generate captions. I post it on TikTok and I made $1,200 this week. And that simply, <laughs> that's so depressing. And I think that that's an attitude that has always been around for sure. There's always been profiteers. There's always been people who like put money above everything else. But I do think it's I, I do think it has reached like a fever pitch um, in a way that it really never has before. And I do worry about the effects that that has not only on content creation, but as that attitude kind of swells into into neighboring industries. And I mean, even this year, I, I feel like you can see it with, you know, the amazing games that have come out. Right. You have, you know, Alan Wake 2, you have Baldur's Gate 3, these incredible um, world re world renowned like world-class experiences that are like critically acclaimed 90s on Metacritic. But then you also have a, an uncharacteristically insane year with like Lord of the Lord of Ring Gollum and, and Kong and th that Kong game and, and walking dead destinies. And I don't know. It's uh it's concerning. I, I do kind of long for the days when things were like a little bit simpler, a little bit cheaper. There wasn't so much of a financial incentive to just kind of milk the industry for all it was worth. Felt like there was a little bit more, I don't want to say integrity because that's probably not the right word, but there was something holding people back from doing this shit as opposed to now where people are proudly out there being like, hey, this is how I'm really, this is how I'm making money being a, a scummy piece of shit stealing from shit. And, and this is how I do it. And I like that I do it this way. And I'm going to advertise that I do it this way because I'm, I'm not even ashamed of it anymore. Yeah, it's, it's similar to, I saw a story going around of this guy who scraped I don't know if you saw this, like basically used AI to scrape SEO off another website and basically just heisted millions and millions of views off of yeah. them by doing this and then was circulating how he did it. And I'm like, that's really pretty nefarious and strange to go around having a business model like that. The other thing that's going around though recently, and Dustin, I'll go over to you, is I saw this thread from a developer saying that he didn't want to pay a YouTuber to cover his game. And people really piled on this dude. And I was surprised by that because. I don't know if you saw it, but I was surprised by this reaction because I was like, where did the, the whole ethics and games journalism thing go? I, I don't, I'm confused by this. Like, wasn't right. this a really important thing that we were going to, I hated that term, by the way, I was so fucking stupid, but it's yeah. like, you're literally, this guy's literally saying like, I don't want to pay content creators to cover my game. And they're like, what the fuck do you expect people to do it for free? And I'm like, dude, I, we cover everything we do without being paid by the companies we cover because that's really vital, you know, to our, our business model. And a guy saying that he doesn't want to feed into this very plastic and fake way of doing things. I, and then he gets attacked for it. It's very broken. That's why I think that the, the audience has to take some credit for soliciting this sort of information because some people really just like it and you have to go find your place to get deeper yeah. content. But I'm curious, Dustin, you're also a content creator of many years. So I'm curious where, where you stand on this. I think it's partially, you know, Scott talks about it just being fun before. We have access to information to of unparalleled degree about pretty much everything. Uh for better or for worse. And so and honestly, because of that, shows like this 
can exist where we can talk about a tweet from Bluebird team talking about Konami and we can analyze that. And that's fun to, you know, a degree. But I guess you could argue that having this level of information for, you know, all that's positive also that you can introduce a lot of negative uh, and cynicism of just knowing about, you know, you know, games being rushed to market uh, reviews and content creation around that. I mean, I guess that all kind of just fits together. So I guess that for the good news for Scott, maybe I shouldn't say this because we want you to listen to sacred symbols and enjoy games in the way you do, but you kind of can unplug from a lot of this stuff. It's always amazing to me. There's certain friends I have that like games, but they're not into them. Like we are I'm like, man, I'm really excited for this. I'm like, Oh, that got delayed. Or there was this real big problem with the publisher. And they're like, Oh dang, that really sucks to hear. I'm like, wow, it must be, it must in some way, if you truly love games, be awesome to be ignorant of some of these things. Cause they, totally. it's just genuinely exciting because you just care about you know playing the game obviously i'm not shitting on being involved to the degree we are (laughs) obviously we've made careers out of this and we're you know happy that people like and and support our level of analysis into things but i don't think that undercuts that there is some purity of just not knowing not needing to know everything about uh what what you love to some degree so I don't know. I don't know if I really have a definitive way to wrap up my thoughts on this other than just it's true. Things are more negative and there are actual problems. Games rush to market. But like you said, Colin, I don't think that that's any different. Than Dude, they used to make games you just didn't know about it. They literally made games in weeks. On the right. Atari. And then you would get yeah, like, E.T., <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. for Christmas and it was a piece of shit. Yeah. So it, I guess yeah, the- it's yeah, it, it has always been there. But like I, I, the, what he said was like, oh, it's, it, is it too serious these days? And I, I do think that's true. I do. I do think that is something that is distinctly different from even just the PlayStation 3 era where like they were a little bit kind of loose with it. And even even just the way that they advertised and. And just some of those, I and mean, we talk about that a lot on the show, right? Like the the feel of that time and how, um, especially even over on Xbox too, with like, uh, was it Major Nelson and and all these different like characters? Yeah, what happened right? with him? There's something up with that because I know he left. Oh, I don't know. No, oh, I know he, he I left know. Xbox, but then he tweeted out a link. Did you see this to play a oh, PlayStation? To buy, to buy to buy a PlayStation, PlayStation and then he said something like snarky, like we, when we all play, we all win or something, right? Or I'm like, dude, that's my favorite Phil Spencer quote. I'm like, what is? That, that's so fucking weird why would you say that yeah you know, um yeah, i don't know i don't remember that i didn't i didn't know he, he left even yeah yeah he's he was but, uh, gone he left a couple months ago probably yeah i think generally speaking we're all kind of right around the goal here i think games are rushed to market still sure they can be fixed so that you can argue they can e- they're even more rushed to market per capita journalists rush to get out reviews this is probably true i must admit though when i was a journalist and in media and i was under embargo it started the the whole embargo situation started getting worse and worse and closer and closer to the vest. I also had really early access to a lot of things because of IGN. So I must admit that that's probably a case by case basis and people have to dedicate the time to beat those games, although games are bigger and longer and people need to spend more time with them. So it's it's difficult. I'm sure that that's a problem. And then the content creator rush is just again, I just think that that's such a soulless and stupid way to make content just because you're ultimately an arbiter of the market not of the audience and you have to retain access and when you don't have it it's a big deal and it's stressful i just don't i i appreciate that other outlets want to operate like that neither other shows in under us have the the right to operate however they want um but i also understand i think that if maddie and cog didn't have connections through their own shows and their own work that they would probably be fine doing it the way we do it too that that kind of access comes by way of other content that they're doing so I just try to be noted. I try to I'm really thankful for that. I mean, we've we we have an, a really hardcore audience of people that are like it. When you get to it, you get to it. If you get to it, we're here for other reasons or whatever. And I think that that says a lot about the audience that we've cultivated. You have to cultivate audiences like that if you want, I think, to survive, at least in these in these valuable niches that exist. And I that's why I don't do game promotions, dude. And Dustin knows. I mean, I mean he only knows really the half of it. But I, I mean, because I've stopped taking them a long time ago, but we could make so much money having game ads on the show. It wouldn't, it would be insane. 
Like the, the amount of money companies pay for that stuff is crazy. And I think that that would really, I think what, what is called endemic advertising would really, really injure us. And frankly, you know, having, you know, putting your hashtag provided by PlayStation in your tweet is a kind of a form of advertising. You know, um, yeah, I'd rather just buy my own and not be encumbered by that. So I'm glad that it resonates. So are we having fun? Dustin, I think you're right to Scott's point. I think the individual is having fun on an individual by individual basis, depending on their exposure to the fucking madness. And I personally don't feel like it's much different now than it's been for years. Not a long time, but for several years, probably since right before COVID. It it all feels the same, you know? Right. I think, Colin, it's important to point out that for us, the madness is fun. You know, the the these different stories, the the minutia of, you know, talking about was Jim Ryan fired or not? And, you know, deeply analyzing these things to some people, it's going to be off putting because it's you have to deal with a lot of negative aspects that may influence how you feel about certain games or whatever. But I, it's not going to be for everybody. So maybe, yeah, Scott, I, you know, yeah, I, I think. I agree with that, but it, I remember you guys, I, I think it might have been Chris that really took umbrage when I said a long time ago that I always found it weird when a person loves video games enough to listen to a video game podcast, but not care about how it's all made, like how it's all done, like what's going on behind the curtain. That doesn't make any sense to me. And so like people listening to a podcast and being like, I, just talk about the games. It's like, really, dude, like when I listen to NFL podcasts, a fraction of it is about the games. It's all about like what what this guy said after the game. And the, the the nature of the team and this trade and this person said this and this thing happened. It's like th- that's what's fucking interesting. And then we go watch the game that, that that's kind of the way I feel about video games where it's like we talk about everything around them. Then we go play the game, you know, mm-hmm. right. and it's so so I get that there's people that aren't into it, but I am surprised they found their way here is sure still my stance on that. Yeah, I think yeah. that, yeah, you can love games and not care about how they're made, but to want to get into a games podcast and not care about how they're made that I would agree is weird. Do you think that that only goes so far though? Like, is there anything that you truly, truly love that you're just like, it's just the baseline. Like I love this and I don't give a fuck about anything else about it. I mean, that to me is that only goes so far to me. Everything that I love, I'm curious about. Right? Yeah. Yeah. To a degree. I mean, there's, there's definitely like, thresholds i think right where like i love music right and i'm curious about like and i i want to i know how to i learn how to play music as a result of that but there's still like there's deep levels of like music theory that i'm like that's okay <laughs> that's that's all right I, right I, I, but we're I, not I, doing that here that would be like saying this game this is about programming to me it would be like saying what we do is just well, what, I, what I'm saying is like there are different there are different rabbit holes in everything that people could get sucked into. There's there are certain people who really, really love music, who have no interest in playing instruments, but really are interested in the music theory of it. And there are people who are really interested in video games in the sense that they're really interested in the, the creative process behind them or like even even the programming side. But they're not necessarily interested in in the economics of it, because like, you know, these are different avenues of the same thing. And they're all they're both. All of it goes very deep, but I, I do think your average person only has enough bandwidth to really go, dive deeply into uh, so many areas while juggling just the, the reality of life. Yeah. Uh, among I'll give them else. something to juggle. Yeah. Like, that's, I, I feel oh. like that, <laughs> I feel like that way for me where it's like I'm definitely like way like I'm super interested in, in, in the way engines work and, and the way like programming works and how physics engines work and how like, oh, that's interesting that like the reason this is this way is because this is coded in, in, in this way. And, and there's a lot of people who are interested in more like, Oh, acquisitions and like, Oh, well, what does this mean? What are the, what are the business realities of the games industry? You know? And yeah, uh, I, I think t- to me, I, I agree. I see what you're saying to me. I look at it as a person who votes and is very, and it's like, I really love to, I, I it's really important to me that I vote, but I don't, or actually it would be the reverse. It'd be like, I care about anything, but the vote. No, it would be that I'm going to go vote, but I don't care about anything leading up to it. I don't care about the politics around it. I don't care about anything. It's just this thing mm-hmm. done in a vacuum. And to me, yeah, not caring. It doesn't totally crazy. wash, you know, but I, I but it, I don't know. I don't really care what you do out there. It's totally fine. The point is, is that. We have fostered a podcast that allows us to explore that space because the audience is patient enough for that. And I just think I think to I, I, I don't know. This is my interpretation of it. I maybe I'm wrong is that 
I think a lot of the audience resonates with this show because not because we necessarily go and buy stuff like they do, but because we're all experiencing it together. Or at least have the opportunity, like they have the opportunity to experience something before or at the same time that we do. And that's not an opportunity they ever had when I was at IGN. There was nothing that you experienced before me. And there's something special about that to by the and that sucks for me too, by the way. I remember when I beat The Last of Us and I had it all wrapped up before E3 that year. And and then it came out like that E3 week, I think. And then there was like this huge furor and everyone was loving it. And I'm like, that sucks, dude. I played it like three weeks ago. Yeah. You know? Like, I don't even yeah. know what, like, what anyone's talking about anymore. I've moved on. Yeah, you can't really talk about it either because it's right. like, you don't want to ruin it for people or. Yeah. Right. And that's a whole cool. And by, by the way, that is really, really cool in the beginning. But I, I when I say that I don't give a shit anymore, I really don't. It's like, whatever, man. What's two or three more weeks? I would be so excited to get all these things back in the day. But it's like, it's just stress. The embargoes do become stressful you have to at least yeah. aim for that and now there is no embargo it's just like whatever we want to do and that's why i get mad or not mad but it's like a little upsetting when people like try to dictate what we play it's like dude just let us do our thing and and we'll i promise you we'll do it right you know um with no expectations about getting products for people and i'm i'm re- i'm relieved by that because it comes with yeah. expectations and anyone who's telling you that you talking shit about a product or coming down hard on a product or whatever doesn't affect your standing with PR people that are representing it or that you're standing with that company, they're lying to you. Fish Dig wrote in and said, hello, boys. I saw that Six Days in Fallujah was on Steam and has been since June, according to the site. The game has caused quite a stir when it was revealed and I have heard nothing about its release. I'm guessing none of you have played any of it yet. And if not, would you give it a go? Great show is always love to the family. So. To be clear, in June on Steam, it entered early access, and it is coming to console, including PS4 and PS5, but it is not out yet. It is apparently coming out in 2024. I'm definitely playing this game. I, I looked at gameplay recently, and gameplay came out when it came to to uh, early access, but before that, there was even a round of like previews. And I think there was some controversy around it, too, because I think they were paying some for some things. or something. I don't know what, what, what was going on. Don't, don't quote me on that. But um, Or some, uh, some something with YouTube, some drama with YouTubers or whatever. I have no idea. But, yeah, I have no idea. But it's uh, it doesn't look like the most high quality game in the world, but I definitely I'm curious about it. And frankly. I'm wondering what you think of this, Chris, an industry that let's assume and I think Windows Central, our friend Jez over there reported was the one that reported this Gulf War rumor. Yeah, about the new Call of Duty, which, again, I think sounds dope. We're going to have to differentiate now why that's not going to be a huge problem but six days in fallujah is a huge problem because now we're getting the conflicts that overlap with each other and are more relevant that conflict happened in my lifetime and this seemed to be a big selective problem with six days in fallujah which was always my argument it's like why is this any different than stalingrad like i don't i don't understand like what the difference is other than proximity i guess and other than just constant complaining and so mm-hmm. I think the rubber is going to hit the road with this game when it comes to console and is more more visibly aware uh, uh, available to people where they're yeah. going to have to line things up about are you or aren't you offended by this? And if so, why? Like, why is it specifically offensive to you? So I'm definitely going to play it because I'm just curious about it. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, yeah, I, I'm definitely going to play it, too. I just I ref- I just generally refuse to get into things on early access unless I have a semblance uh, unless it's something like. Minecraft where you kind of get the sense that it's kind of always or, or like Fortnite where it's like it's never going to be done. You know, it's just going to continue to evolve over time. This looks like something that's going to be done at some point. And so I'm going to give it the opportunity to just finish itself. And that way I can. OK, I can I can enjoy it when, once it's actually done. I don't need to go through the weird early access troubles of like, oh, it didn't load. And it's like, oh, well, it's not supposed to load. <laughs> it's like, OK. I don't need that right now. I'll, I'll wait till they're done. But yeah, that's going to be an interesting. I'm I'm really keen on on the news cycle when this game comes out and, and when it actually hits, because this is what's so fascinating about this game is that this game just for for a decade now, it's it's been the source of so much, so much controversy. I, I remember I remember the original like the original um controversy over this game on on fox news back in what like 2008 2009? Yeah, 2008 that nine something like that yeah i remember seeing that and it's just so interesting that it remains controversial even though we're so far ahead and and yeah like you said like what's what really is the thing that separates this outside of just proximity and if that's really the only argument it's like is that even a really is that even a good argument in the first place because there are definitely people 
older, definitely not playing games, but still definitely alive at the time Call of Duty was making World War Two games. You know, like, what does that mean for them? You know, like, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I also think it's important to note that the controversy shifted. The controversy back then was actually a right wing. Largely white right wing military controversy about the ongoing war and its proximity to this conflict only a few years after it happened. And Konami, remember, the game was done like the original version of the game was basically done. And Konami was like, we're just not going to publish this. And then it obviously came into its new iteration, which is not the old iteration. It was more of a tactical shooter, I think, back in the day, which was a one time yeah. pop more popular than I guess it's become in some sense, like those those more budget tactical shooters. I used to write strategy guides for some of those like uh, Rainbow Operation Six. Desert Storm or whatever the fuck those games were called. And so I that was then but now it's all like you're killing muslims i think thing and i'm like i don't know man like yeah i don't remember i don't think the, either of these things are totally or completely or have any legitimacy really it just is what it kind of is at this point yeah um dustin do you have any thoughts about six days in fallujah just that uh no early access for me i'll wait to potentially check it out when it's out of early access but honestly it's I would say I'm interested, but if it ends up being a really bad game, then I'm perfectly fine skipping it yeah. as well. Like, it, like if it has like a if it's like low 70s, high 60s or something, you're not going to. No. Yeah, it's yeah, that's yeah. OK. That I'll at at that point, it, it, it like you, you guys have been saying, it's very interesting game that it as far as its subject matter and where uh, it's taking you. But that doesn't negate that if it's a bad game that. I don't want to right, play it. Yeah. No, for sure. I, I I definitely feel weirdly historically compelled to play it in some totally. way. Just because it's it's just sure. because it's been so it's been such a such a conversation for so long and over the course of so many distinct iterations that I'm like, I have to if this game comes out and the reviews are like three out of ten, I, I feel like I I still I feel like I have to. Mm. I gotta know what the and also there's gonna be part of me that's gonna be like, is it really a three out of ten? You know what I mean? That's a good point. It That's will kind of get, that, dude, the reviews will not be fair. Absolutely. Yeah. Not. Yeah. No, um, no, they won't be at all. This predetermined outcome, which is unfortunate, but. And that might be why they, they, the strategy in going to early access was to kind of like diffuse a little bit of that to have like kind of an, an, a release. So people aren't like um, as it as enraged, perhaps when there's more money to be made. I don't know if that was part of the calculus, but I want whatever the developers want to make within the furthest bounds of reason i think there are certain things that shouldn't be made obviously i, I don't think either yeah. of these these the subject is wars are, are well worn and like i said what there's just no difference and the 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 evolution of of why people have a problem with this game just shows that the outrage is so selective too that this game could attract so much drama for really no reason at all and um it's just that the people that are complaining didn't know that video games about desert storm existed in the 90s they they don't know that yeah, Bungie so they, made one. They, so when a game <laughs> comes out about Fallujah after the Iraq War and the aughts, it's like, oh, but they don't, they don't know. Ariel, a connoisseur, wrote in. Oh my god! Said hi, CDC. <laughs> I recently bought the controversial MGS Master Collection Part One, knowing full well that it wasn't the ideal way to experience these classics. But alas, I desperately wanted to play this series for the first time. Although I've heard countless stories of Metal Gear Solid One and the tricks employed to make encounters such as Psycho Mantis and others so timeless, I was still blown away. How developers didn't it try to iterate on the idea, he, the ideas here is beyond me. So my question, could you describe what your first interaction with MGS1 was? And if it was as mind blowing as at the time as I'm finding it now, 20 years later. I don't know if you guys remember mm. your first time with MGS, but I do. I have very specific memories of it. I got it for the holidays in 1998 when I was in ninth grade. And it's the reason I actually got my dual analog controller as well. And which at the time, of course, was not a necessity. There was there, and, and it didn't require it. It wasn't until Ape Escape that you really even needed to have it for sure. Yeah. But you could get through most of PS1 without having the, the secondary controller. So I remember getting that and. There was something very, 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 very special about that game that everyone kind of realized. I think what I was always taken aback to by was the, the, the and this is kind of lost if you're not playing the original, I guess, and it's not a big deal, but it's just the the minimalism of the case and how interesting that was on the shelf surrounded by and how confident it was surrounded by just all sorts of shit. I mean, the, the old idea of bull shots and these and an artwork that 
didn't represent at all in a classic in the, in the cartridge era, especially that didn't represent the game whatsoever. And you really had no prayer. And these guys were like, ah, fuck it. We're, we're just going to put this beautiful white, bright white with red metal, Gear solid logo on it, have some information on the back end. You're going to kind of go in and sight unseen. And you know what? This was kind of a Konami style because the year before the, the, the fall before Castlevania Symphony of the Night came to PS1. That's um, in 1997. And if you look at that cover, that cover sucks. And it's like a very minimalistic cover that doesn't do anything to, to sell it at all. And so they're very and, and those ended up being two of probably the best five PS1 games, which is very, very interesting. So, Dustin, what are your memories of Metal Gear Solid 1? Yeah. So I want to first say in terms of the Psycho Manus fight, it's awesome. I don't want to give you the wrong impression that I, I think it's very cool. In the end, though, it is a cool gimmick. It's not something that I feel like, wow, we need to do more of this in a game. The lasting impact of Metal Gear Solid is. It it wasn't the first cinematic game ever, but it really was the first one to do it to that degree. And I remember even as, you know, playing it in what, 2000, 2001, I think is when I played it in first grade and just thinking, wow, this video game is really fun. And it's also like a movie. And that's really cool. Just being invested in the characters and the story to that degree. So I think there's, there's that element to it, but also how Metal Gear Solid is a very linear game, but it's gameplay felt so open-ended, you know, I can go around, I can use a, uh, you know, I can punch them and, and choke them, or maybe I decide I can kill the enemies or I can sneak around in a box. It really had this sandbox quality to it. And again, not the first game to do that, but it was this game that brought together so many elements into this cohesive package that really, I think, solidified my love of games at the time. It's like, wow. Games really are more than thinking about what I was playing before that Crash Bandicoot, a more recent, which don't get me wrong. I love I love Crash Bandicoot, but and I love the games I played on on Sega Genesis and NES. But Metal Gear was just this complete package. It was like, wow, games really can be this entire different thing than anything I'd ever experienced. And I feel like that's kind of the lasting impact on a lot of people is what what that is in terms of story and and then of course dude metal gear solid 2 i know that's not what we're talking about but the lead up to that game and how exciting it was playing that demo that was included on zone of the enders over and over and over again just uh some of my absolute fondest memories in gaming uh chris you have any thoughts you want to share yeah, I mean, I, I don't have as much to say about it as, as, as you guys do, because I, I came I came around to Metal Gear way, way later. Um, I had the first one spoiled for me to, to high heaven <laughs> by the time I even had a chance to re- like that Psycho Manus fight would have been really cool <laughs> to experience. But like my friend wouldn't shut the fuck up about it. And so it just completely robbed me of that experience. So, and at that point, like any time that I tried to play it, especially back then, I just couldn't get a handle on the controls. I was getting into splinter cell which was stealth that was a little bit more my speed it was more i feel like splinter cell was just more true stealth to me i didn't really get what was what was so phenomenal about metal gear until way later when i realized like it is kind of the the insanity of of that story and 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 the the sand the the robustness of that sandbox but i mean one to this day because i've had i had that big reveal kind of spoiled for me I never really went back to finish it. I finished two and three. I finished um, four. I, I think I remember finishing four. And I made it really, really deeply into five. Didn't touch survive at all. <laughs> but one is the one that I have not truly like experienced the way that I want to. Even the Twin Snakes re, uh, remaster or whatever. I, I, I never got around to that either. It's been this kind of mysterious game to me because I do want to play it. But then every time I, I go back to it, it's always in some really fucked compromised version. Like the one on, what is it? The, uh, oh my God, the P, the PlayStation Classic. I remember being really, really oh, excited. Yeah. 
and it was just such a it was so bad like it was unfucking play I, I couldn't i couldn't do it i was like this is an eyesore on on modern tvs it's not it's not even any sharper <laughs> it's it's jittery and fucked so i don't know man I, I wish i had a better experience with the first one i i ended up loving the the next two and five i adore actually but one is the the one that kind of got away i feel like i just missed it you know yeah it could. I, don't, I don't really know if there's an opportunity to really get into it again if they're just going to continue to ignore all of the upkeep that that game needs to be presentable in a modern format i really thought this i really thought the collection was going to be that thing dude i really thought but like i i just can't i can't do it there's something about it it hurts my fucking brain looking at it yeah there's something um twin snakes i think is a good way to kind of i like twin snakes personally on gamecube i think it's a good way to experience the first game but the first game itself is really something worth worth playing and experiencing yeah. and i i guess i could be deeper in the sense that i was in ninth grade the game had come out right after my birthday that year and on ps1 and i knew i wanted it and i asked for it for christmas and i got it <clears throat> and then i believe it was the if i'm remembering correctly it was like the day after christmas or something i went to the mall and got my dual shot controller because while you didn't need the analog sticks and it wasn't required there was force feedback in metal gear solid and you could experience that on the dual shot because mm. the dual shot came out like in 97 but i didn't care about it at all so i didn't have one for like a year and then it wasn't and i just have very vivid memories of, of and why it always comes up with ape escape is i just have vivid memories of my neighbor coming over having rented ape escape from the video store and being like can i borrow your dual shock you know, or your controller you know and i was like yeah all right so that's how i that's how <laughs> that's embedded in my brain that happened to me too except for i was the one renting it and i had to borrow my dad's friend had a dual shock uh yeah the dual shock and uh yeah and then i fell in love with apescape amazing game areola areola connoisseur thank you for writing in john wrote in and said hello sacred scallywags previously leaked but now confirmed news indicates that robert pattison's suit from the batman is being added to arkham knight on switch and later to consoles they're releasing a dlc suit for a game that came out eight years ago but they refused to release a 60 frames patch i would sincerely love to replay arkham knight but i'm too accustomed to 60 frames at this point this leads to my question. What is the most egregious example of a game that has been left behind? Could it be Red Dead Redemption 2, Crash Team Racing, Dishonored 2? Please let us know which games you guys would love to see reinvigorated by a next-gen performance patch. Thanks for all the great content. I mean, the, the answer here is, for most people, Bloodborne at this point, right? I mean, I, I just see endlessly, endlessly people are clamoring for this game to, to yeah. the point, as I've noted in the past, that I'm so curious about what is precluding them from doing it. And I really do believe that it has something to do with FromSoft being like the first right of refusal kind of thing where Sony obviously owns the game and funded it and all of that, but From has to be the one that patches it and works on it. And there's just no time or inclination to do so. That must be the only reason, or they're really, really planning something for it, which would be cool, but I don't know. So um, what needs a performance patch? They, 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 he brought up a couple of Chris games here, Chris, uh, Red Dead and Crash Team Racing. Uh, Dishonored oh, yeah, 2, dude. that's stuck in the, what, what's wrong with that? that? That's at 30 frames, I guess. Dude, that game always ran kind of bad yeah on i remember I'm, i remember really really not liking it initially like when it first came out and i was so disappointed because it just ran so fucked i don't remember what i didn't remember what specifically was wrong with it but it felt like there was this input delay that was just mm -hmm. unquestionably there like and i couldn't it was it got in the way of that it's that sucks too because that's a great game and it's it just really did not have a good Shot. Crash Team Racing is egregious that it, that's at 30 frames per second. It's a remake of a PS1 game. I don't I, I don't know what the fuck the excuse the excuse could possibly be. Um, it's not even on PC, which I find really questionable. Um, although I guess I get it because it's more of a console type game. But still, you would you would imagine that even just the availability would be there. My answer, I mean, ties into the previous question, dude, Metal Gear Solid 1. It, it, it bothers the hell out of me that <laughs> and I understand why I understand the limitations. I understand all this, all of the reasons why it is that way, but it is still it, 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 it bothers me to the core of my soul that there has not been a group of people that have gone back and dedicated resources to figuring out that problem because Metal Gear Solid 1 is such an important game that has no real good modern way to play it outside of twin snakes which by the way is another game that is kind of not available on modern hardware really in any capacity either so um or at least not that i've seen i, I have no uh, if that game's on pc or something and i'm not aware of it let me know but i doubt it i feel like i would have known about it by now and so i don't know man that's that's the one that comes to mind immediately 
Because that's what still about, on, oh, on the sorry. on the. No, I, I'm just saying, like on the on the collection that they just came out with it is it, it runs at what 20 25 30 and it's not yeah. even like it's not even it's not even helped either it's not even like oh well now at least it runs at consistent 30 no it still runs as poorly mm-hmm. as it did back then granted it was less important back then everything kind of ran poorly on the ps1 especially early on like that but i don't know man pretty egregious to me yeah I think, Colin, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with Bloodborne. The thing that in particular that's so painful about Bloodborne is that you can't even go off platform to get a 60 FPS experience. A lot of these games that are stuck, like he brings up Red Dead and Dishonored, both of those games, if you're truly desperate and you got to or not truly desperate, but you have an uh, there is an option to play those games at 60 FPS. Mm. You just can't do it on PlayStation. You got to go on PC. And not everyone has that option. I get that. But and you want to have the best experience on your preferred platform. I get that. But the thing with Bloodborne is there is nothing. The only thing you can do right now is hack your PlayStation or figure out how to. I know there's ways that people are doing it now where there are some kind of console hack where you can get it running at 60 FPS now. Uh, I don't know if you need a dev kit console or or something like that. I haven't looked into it because I don't want to be tempted to do it. So. Though that that's the most painful part about Bloodborne, but as far as other PS4 exclusives, I was looking like Last Guardian would be nice to have a patch for. Uh, I'm trying to think. I, the, luckily, most of the the main stuff has been pushed over in in one way or another. So maybe Gravity Rush Two, if they oh, ever dude, did that. Oh my God, Resistance. Every well, those just need to straight up. And those I know. Be ported at this point. I hoard. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Believe me, I know. Tyler Van Valdenbrini wrote in and said, "Hey CDC, why does the gaming industry not have war stories that carry the same kind of reverence that war films do? War films are considered in the top echelon of cinema, worthy of many Oscars, like Saving Private Ryan. However, war games are mostly comprom- comprised of Call of Duty titles, which are seen as mindless multiplayer games." Spec Ops The Line and Wolfenstein The New Order are disappointingly rare exceptions we need more of. Where is Naughty Dog's historical war drama? I refuse to hang up, but I will keep listening. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler, for writing in. <laughs> I mean, you, you, when you have killing as the goal of the game, it's just it, it's going to be impossible to have any reverence for the subject right. matter like a film would. It doesn't mean you can't do it right. I do think that you think that Wolfenstein The New Order, which is just alternate history, really future history, but alternate history, too, is is like compelling war drama. I think it's a great game, but it's not war drama, really. I mean, Spec Ops The Line, I think, is the great example of of doing it right. But even death and the killing in that game is is part of the narrative and would be hard to replicate. Like the reality is, is that when you go when your grandfather went and killed Nazis or whatever, he didn't kill 70 of them. You know, like he killed four or something you know and and he wasn't laughing right and it was like horrifying <laughs> and yeah i don't know it's just it's just a i just don't know the, the best war stories to me are ones that just try to do it differently like valiant hearts is a really great example of a, and that's a world war one game but that's a great example of a game where it's oh yeah it tries to do things differently where it tries to rem- and that shows more reverence and respect for the subject matter than a lot of these other games do just by nature of what they are it doesn't mean that i, I love shooters dude it's just i'm not trying to Thinking about the the beginning of Saving Private Ryan or whatever, and then thinking about the beginning of a Call of Duty game where you're literally storming the beaches of Normandy is so different because by the time you get onto the beach and are you already killed like 17 people, and it just it's hard to keep, yeah. take that too seriously. I, I think. I think interactivity kind of lends itself to different types of drama. You know what I mean? Like I th- I think something like Saving Private Ryan, I feel like you can't make that into a shooter and have the same re- reverence. I feel like maybe you could build you could make it into a narrative game. Or you could make something like that set in a war that kind of has that element to it where it is kind of treated very seriously, but shooting isn't like the goal or the main mechanic or something. I think that could be done, but I think ultimately, you know, the things that really um, resonate in this sphere is stuff like Bioshock where, you know, the the interactivity is such a core element of the story that can't be it can't be replicated in like a movie or or something like that i also just think low-key to make a game fun i don't know can't have private ryan slide canceling 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just it's a different it's just a different medium entirely. Uh, I just don't think it's built for that. I agree in that way. Anyway, well, would, wouldn't that be the argument against uh, six days in Fallujah? Yeah, I mean, I guess. I mean, that would be an interesting. That's what. That's why I'm so curious about it. I want to know like how they're going to right. do it. Like, yeah, I, because I don't know how you do that. I don't know. Will how there be you make- slide canceling? <laughs> in Fallujah. I want to be clear that my my interpretation of the issues in Six Days in Fallujah now have nothing to do with what we're talking about, but then had to do with what we were talking about. In other words, the original canceled iteration was more along the lines of what we're talking about now. Yeah. Right, Cause, right. Because I think the I think both arguments are are weak, personally. Because I don't yeah. I don't because I don't think a game has to show reverence to anything. So it's that's, yeah, that's true. You know, like I don't give a shit. It's do whatever you want. I mean, it, 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 it sh- you can totally sell a person on your reverence to something and, and it can you could totally be lambasted on the market for not showing the appropriate reverence. So do so at your own risk. But you have the right to do that. I just think people are measuring things too personally. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's an Tyler. It's an interesting thought exercise, but I think the I think it's kind of obvious why this hasn't happened. Ambitious Casual has the final inquiry and says, hey, Sacred Poppies, Mr. Beast's recent video, one dollar, what well, I guess, one versus ten million job, ten million dollar job features an Immortals of Avium ad. Jimmy states that the developer put him into the game as a boss. If you kill him, you receive more gold than any other boss in the game. <laughs> With what seemed like a catastrophic flop of a game, is it smart for EA to pay advertising dollars as a last ditch, this ditch effort to save Immortals of Avium? And Colin, are you going to hop on and hop and pop a cap in Mr. Beast's, Beast's head? No, I'm not going to do that. I think. You're not seeing it for probably what it is, although maybe I could be wrong about this, which is that this is a game that is free for them to experiment with. At EA, mm-hmm. I, I, this has nothing to do um, with Ascendant Studios or whatever. Like the Immortals of Avium is dead, and what I would imagine is that Electronic Arts is like, what would happen if we had this major activation activation in a game? And we, how would it do? And what would the telemetry show us? And would we get away with it? And would people care? And let's do it on a game that doesn't matter. I, yeah. I I feel like that's kind of how I that's read it personally. Yeah, so that's I, I read on, on it too. Yeah, I don't know if you agree, Dustin, or not, but that, I, I don't think there's any real intention here to get people to go back to a Morals of Avium. I think the ship is kind of sailed on the game at this point. Maybe you can re- sell it at much lower price, but I really do think that this is experimental because I'm sure EA would much rather be spending this money in FIFA doing something crazy, and they just don't know if they're going to get away with it. And I think they need more information. So that's that's my theory. Yeah. So. I just I'm trying to find this. OK, so this video came out five days ago. Uh, it has 81 million views. So that's, that's a crazy. lot of advertising. That's a lot of eyeballs on your product. So. I'm sure they paid a lot for mm-hmm. it, but. I don't I'm I'm curious to see if it pays off. Like you said, it's a good experimental thing for them to to try out with that level of advertising. I got to say, I looked up. There's a video how to find Mr. Beast in Immortals of Avium. They didn't even model him into the game. Yeah, I it, I'm trying to figure out what this even is. Like, did they put his voice in? I don't have the audio on right now since so I can hear you guys. But it seemed like a kind of a, a lazy way. If it's, you're going to do it. Yeah, imagine I, it would have been so much cooler <laughs> if for Mr. Beast fans that think, oh, I want to play this game because it has Mr. Beast in it. Dude, put him. If you're going to spend the money to put your stuff in a Mr. Beast video, put him in the game for real. It looks like a cut boss that they just sort of like gave (laughs) a new name to and just sort of like hastily threw it. Which I mean, like, look, they're trying to spend as little money as possible on this thing. It's dead. It's, you know, they're they're experimenting. Um, I no trophies. I don't know. I just looked. Yeah, no, that would that would require work. <laughs> All right. But yeah, I don't know. All right, let's bail. It's time to go. All right. All right, my friends. Let's go around the horn and say goodbye to everyone. Chris, goodbye to you, my friend. Have a good rest goodbye, of your day. Bye, man. Yeah, man. I'm gonna go uh I'm gonna go kill Mr. Beast. <laughs> nice. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Be careful. Dustin, <laughs> goodbye to you. Goodbye. I am going to uh get what is it, Dragon's Dogma installed on the old Steam Deck. Gotta do that and too. check that out pretty soon. And and dude, Baldur's Gate. I'm excited to get back to Baldur's Gate. It's just uh, it's a little Act Three, a little intimidating. A lot of stuff going on, and uh, you know, I've I've taken a, some time off, so I'm trying to get my feet wet again. We'll see how it goes, though. All right, I'm out of here. I'm gonna go hang out with Micah and watch football, eat dinner, 
hang out with the pups and then back to it with constellation and all the rest so time to go thank you all out there for your love kindness and support appreciate you remember patreon.com slash last day media for early ad free access to all these shows and other uh perks we couldn't do without your support over there so thank you so much and pay, um, i'm sorry last day media store for merch we appreciate that as well we'll see you next time for more until then goodbye see ya take care guys Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.